So first off, if you don't already have Godot, you can pick up Godot at godotengine.org slash download. And you can see there's versions for Windows, Mac, and Linux. So just go ahead and download and install the version you need like you would any other program. Uh, also, if you have Steam, that is another place that you can get it like you would download a game on Steam. You can also install Godot from there. So just to point out, in this course, we're going to be working with Godot 3.3.3. And I am personally using the universal 64-bit uh, version of Godot on Apple Silicon. So aside from that, we're going to need some art for the project. So a great option we can use for creating a simple platformer like we're going to be doing is uh, Pixel Adventure. So you can get this on itch.io if you search for Pixel Adventure or if you go to pixelfrog assets dot itch dot io slash pixel dash adventure dash one in addition to that there's also 20 enemy characters you can download with pixel adventure 2 uh, which is a second and you can pick up both of those on itch.io so i'm going to be importing both of those into the project it's just so you know where we're getting the art assets from but in the end this is just what i'm using to demo for the course you can use whatever art assets you want in the end maybe you prototype with us and then put in your own art later so when you launch Godot for the first time, you may see some projects, but we're going to be creating a new project. So over here on the right, you have a new project button. I'm going to click that and then I'm going to navigate where on my computer I'd like to create that project. So I'll hit this little browse button over here and I'll be using and I'll be using this path for my project, but you can basically store it wherever you want. Now note that here I have my reference project, Pixel Adventure Project. So I'm just going to be calling it the same thing and throwing a dash tutorial at the end since this is going to be the follow along version of that same project. So let's go ahead and select the current folder. And now we need to give it a project name and create a folder inside of this directory um, for the project. So let's call it Pixel Adventure Project dash tutorial. I'm going to do create folder. You can call it whatever you want. And I'm using OpenGL ES 3.0 as the renderer. Haven't had any problems with it so far. So let's go ahead and hit create and edit. And here's what Godot is going to look like the first time you boot up your project. You'll notice that this is obviously a 3D view. So at the top, we can actually switch to 2D, which is what we're going to be using for basically the rest of the project. So before we import all of the art into the game, we should set the default settings for any art that we do import into the game so that it displays correctly. So if I was to click on this icon.png in every uh, Godot project, that's the Godot logo, we can go over to the import tab and we can see that this is importing as a texture. So we want to set the defaults for texture to be a pixel art default setting. So if we click on preset here, you'll notice 2D pixel is one of the options. So if you click there, you'll see that certain options like filter are going to turn off. So filter would normally make your images uh, blur around the edges so that you wouldn't see the pixels as crisp and everything would kind of just blur together. So we don't want that for the game. In pixel art, you want each of the pixels to be clearly recognizable as the color it was colored. And so we want 2D pixel as the default for all of the images we bring into the game. So we don't need to hit re-import for this particular icon. Probably not going to be using it as an actual art asset here. Uh, but we do want to change preset up at the top and then set as default for texture. So this is going to mean that these settings we have right here just got copied to the defaults that are going to load for every image we bring into the game by default. And note that even in a pixel art game, there might be some images that you actually don't want to have these presets. So I would just set the preset as whatever is going to be the majority of your art. In this case, that's going to be 2D pixel for pixel art characters and tile sets and all of that. So let's go ahead and bring our files in now. We might want to add a folder in this project to store all of the art assets. So we can create one in the bottom left file system by right clicking on uh, this resource folder, which is basically where we created our project, another path to that. So let's right click there and do new folder. And I'm just going to call this art and hit OK. So now we can navigate to wherever we have our art assets we want to use for the game. I've already gone ahead and extracted the Pixel Adventure 1 and Pixel Adventure 2 packs. Note that when you extract Pixel Adventure 1, the folder might be called free. I renamed that to Pixel Adventure 1 and Pixel Adventure 2 is called this by default. So now I want to basically copy these into the project so that we can use them. One way would just be to drag and drop from your file explorer into Godot and you can just drag it onto that folder there. 
but it's possible to put it in the wrong place on accident. And whenever you move folders around in Godot, it's going to have to re-import all of those art assets, which can take a little while. So it's better to get it in the correct place in the first attempt. So I'm going to select these and I'm going to copy them. Uh, you can just drag a box and then right click and copy, or you can select them and hit control C if you need. And let's go over to the Godot project folder. So I have that stored in uh, this tutorials folder, and then we have the project here. So we could see the art folder we just created over there. I'm gonna go into there, and then I'm gonna paste the new assets in here. So now, as soon as I click back into Godot, we can see that it's gonna re-import these art assets, um, applying the defaults for how it should display in Godot, for instance. So if we open up art and pixel adventure now, we can go into main characters. I'm going to be using Ninja Frog as the main character for this course. So if we drag one of these sprite sheets onto the screen now, uh, we should be able to see it with the proper settings for pixel art. So let's drag this idle. I'm going to control middle mouse wheel and zoom in a whole lot and make sure that these pixels are displaying crisp. So when you're very zoomed in like this, you shouldn't see any blurriness. You should be able to clearly tell every color that these pixels are and where the placement of each pixel is. That's the look you generally want when you're doing pixel art style games. So I'll zoom out and we can also confirm uh, that the settings are correct because if we click on idle and if you go over to the import tab in the top left, you can see that this idle 32 by 32 PNG is in being imported with filter off. Now, when you create the project in Godot, that's on by default. So that's one way we know that we have set the default or 2D pixel for importing images. So before we start working on the levels of our game, we're gonna to need to change a couple settings about the game window uh, so that when we're testing the game, it displays a little bit more appropriately. So first off, we're gonna to need to create a scene so that we can load that scene as the starting point for the game. So right now I have the sprite image that we just brought into this main window here. And you'll notice that in the scene top left, that contains the sprite. So a scene is going to be any node in Godot uh, plus any nodes nested below that. So a character can be a scene, a level can be a scene, and scenes can have instances of other scenes. So you could put a bunch of enemy scenes and a bunch of character scenes into a level scene to make it all come together. And uh, once you start using it, it gets pretty intuitive. So we're just going to take this sprite and save it as a scene so that we can load that as the starting point for our game. So I'm going to hit Control S or Command S. And we're going to put this as uh, level one and I'm going to create it in a new folder. So let's hit create folder in the top right. And this new folder is going to be maps or levels, whatever you prefer. I'll hit OK and let's save this scene inside of there. So for right now, this doesn't really make sense as a level scene. Don't worry about it. We'll change that later. And let's go up to the play button in the top right. So you can, so right up here, we can go ahead and hit play the project. But if we haven't defined a scene, we can select a scene as the starting point for our game. So let's select the player one scene. So this is in the maps directory and I'm just loading this in. You can also go up one level if you need to select the right folder. So let's just double click that. Okay, and now the game should start with that scene. And our sprite sheet is displaying here pretty nicely um, in the sense that there's no blurriness of the pixels. So that's still what we want to see. But uh, it's pretty small, the sizes of this character. So we actually want to make it appear bigger on the screen. Now that we've tested it, we know the problem. Let's go to the project menu in the top left and project settings. And we can go ahead and find the settings for this. So as you can see, I'm already here in display window. But if you don't see it immediately, you can click on the search uh, box over here in the top left and type in window that will filter the categories down so you have less to choose from. Alternatively, if you're up here at application, just scroll down to display window. And here we're going to have the settings we need to change. Uh, so for right now, I'm going to be taking the width and height and setting that to 320 width by 180 pixels wide. So that might seem really low because I think most people are going to have displays that are at least 1920 by 1080 pixels these days, uh, maybe bigger than that. So uh, that is a really low resolution. So what you do is you actually have the test width and height, a higher resolution, and then you take this width and height and scale it up to the test width and height. 
Uh, and because we have the 2D pixel settings for our imported sprites, although we're scaling it up, it shouldn't be blurry or distorted or anything like that. So let's take the test width and height and make it 1280 and then 720 pixels. So this should be a decent testing size for our window. Then one last setting we need to change down here at the bottom is stretch. Aspect is set to ignore. It is down here under stretch. So mode is set to disabled. We want to change that to 2D. So it's going to be doing default 2D stretching of our small size up to the big size. So if we close this now, hit Control S to save everything. And let's go back to the play button again. Click that. And when we load the game this time, you'll see that the characters are much bigger. I, I think we basically took the image and scaled it up four times on the screen. So this is a 1280 by 720 pixel window but it's basically displaying the actual game at four times the size. So on a big monitor, this makes a lot more sense so you can actually see the characters. So when you're going to use a image as a repeating background texture, there is a flag that you need to turn on for that artwork. So if we go into the art directory in Pixel Adventure 1 or wherever you have that saved, and then we go into background, you'll see a few different textures we can use for background. I can bring one in here and you can kind of see that this tile is just going to repeat over and over again. So uh, what we want to do for this image and all of the different color versions of that image going down to yellow is go over to the import tab. And uh, over here, we can see right above filter, there is a checkbox for repeat. We want to turn that on to enabled. And when we do that, this flag is automatically checked so we can re-import these assets. So now these will work as repeatable textures. So in order to get a texture to repeat across the screen, you got to click on the texture. Then you go to region and then we're going to want to enable region here. So this is now basically going to take the texture tile and stretch it across a region. And because the repeat flag is turned on for these textures, it's going to tile it rather than just stretching. So now we just need to set a size for the background. So width and height here on the right, W and H, let's just give that a size that should be good enough for our level. Uh, really as big as you want it is fine. We could just do a thousand by a thousand pixels. And uh, there, basically, you have a repeating background base that you can use for your level. So now we just drag this into whatever position we need and we'll pretty much be good to go. One thing to note about creating the background this way is that you do not want to use these scale tools if you need to expand the uh, background further. If you grab on the scale on the edge of the sprite and you stretch it, it's going to still stretch the image. So if you need it longer, you should come in here to region and add some extra pixels here. So 1200 width, you could see that expanded it without having any stretching. It just adds more tiles in, which is what we want. So let's clean up the level a little bit more. So next I'm going to right click on the initial sprite, which we'll be removing in a minute and adding a child node. And this child node is just gonna be a simple node 2D. So uh, this is basically a generic node and we can use that as the root of our scene. So everything that actually goes into the scene would just be nested below it. Let's create that. And now we can take this node and actually make it the root of this level scene. So I'm going to right click here and I'm going to make scene root. So now this idle sprite image is nested below the node 2D and uh, the blue background is nested below that. So I'm going to take the blue background. I'm going to left click, hold and drag it and put that above the node 2D. So now there's no children of this uh, idle sprite sheet. And we can remove that by right clicking on it and doing cut or delete nodes. So let's just go ahead and get rid of that. And now finally, we can take the node 2D and I'm just going to rename this to level one to match the name of the saved file. And maybe the background, I'll just rename this background. So that pretty much gets us set up to the point where we can start adding in um, some actual ground for a character to stand on and platforms and all that stuff. So let's go ahead and hit Control or Command S. So inside of our level one scene up at the top left, I'm going to right click here and add a new child node. This one is going to be called a tile map. So you can just type in tile map to find that and hit create. So this tile map, as we can see on the right side, is going to need a tile set. So the tile set is going to be created from images in our project, and that's going to be specifically the tile set images. So there's the tile set uh, file that exists here in Godot. And then there's the actual image where that tile set is pulling all of its tiles from. 
So let's click on the empty section for tile set and hit new tile set. So this we can click on. And when we do, there is a new window down here at the bottom called tile set. So we need to add a image here in order to start picking out the tiles from that tile set image. So we can find the proper images for creating the tiles from the terrain category inside of our pixel adventure one pack. So we can see here from the thumbnail, there's actually a whole bunch of different terrains we can use here. And they all exist in one single image. So let's go ahead and left click hold and drag this into the list for our tile set. When we do that, we'll see the image kind of expands a little bit more down here. And you can hold control and scroll on your middle mouse wheel to zoom in and out. Of course, you can also zoom in and out over there on the right. So we want this to be uh, big enough on the screen that we can kind of clearly identify the tiles that we're working with. So there's three types of tiles we can create for our tile set. There is the new single tile, which is going to basically define one region in here, which is a tile that you can left click on uh, over on the right here when you're painting your tiles and then just left click and put it on the map. So that's the simplest option. There's also a new auto tile. We'll be working with that in this video. So the auto tile, you can basically define a, a set of tiles, and then you can create a bit mask for those tiles. And the bit mask determines which tiles should border the other tiles. So in a sense, uh, you can make it so that this one over here on the left, uh, you can see that this is obviously a left end tile. So you can make it so that this will be the one that's always on the end by setting up bit masks, which is basically creating the rules for how those tiles should be next to each other. And then there's also a new atlas, which you can define a whole bunch of tiles, and then you'll get a list over here on the right, which you can just select the one you want from. Before we start doing that, though, let's click on the tile map. So on the left here, scene, and we want to go to cell and make sure that the cell size is set to 16 by 16, since that is the size of our tiles in the game. So we set the 16 by 16 here to match the designed tile size uh, of the artwork so that everything matches up correctly. So we can click back on tile set. And we can actually see that um, it kind of lost its reference to the terrain here uh, since we didn't exactly save it. So a decent idea might actually be to uh, click on tile map here. And then with this tile set over on the right, we can click on this little drop down and save the tile set to a file. So this will make it so that you can reference it in any tile map and the data will be basically hard saved inside of the project. So I'm going to go ahead and save that here. And I, I guess I will put it in the maps category and I'll go ahead and call this pixel adventure terrain. So we'll see that the name of this changed to the name of the file saved as a, a .tres extension. So we can still open this up and edit it. And I think if you go into the maps folder, you can also just double click on it here uh, to open up the same thing. So basically the tile set is saved to its own location now and it's no longer embedded in the tile map directly. So we can uh, add the terrain in here. I'm just going to drag that in again. And this time let's go ahead and hit new auto tile. So we're going to have to define a region for this. Uh, one of the really helpful features is this enable snap here. So we can see that this will allow us to snap into the grid. So if we left click in here once, it's going to define a region. And then we can change the settings so that we can actually get the desired sizes. So over on the right, we have snap options here. So uh, this is the number of pixels that you want it to snap to in terms of steps. You can make this 16 by 16. I think I'm going to try going with, let's say, 4 by 4 this time. So you can see that uh, the tile is basically broken up in this little pixel grid. And whenever we need to make adjustments, like, for instance, uh, creating the collision shapes later on, it can snap to any of those intersections on this 4x4 four four pixel grid. So I think that'll work pretty nicely. And then we have selected tile. We want to change the subtile size to 16 by 16 here. Uh, you also notice auto tile bit mask mode. So the auto tile bit mask mode is going to be important when you're determining um, basically when you break down your tile, how many corners are there uh, that you can assign a bit mask on or off value to. So if you have two by two, then that means every tile is broken into four potential bit masks. And there's also three by three and three by three minimal, which you would imagine gives you nine bit mask subtiles per actual tile. 
So uh, for these, we're going to be working with uh, two by two. These are simpler tiles over here. And I believe these are as well. But when we get over here to the right, these are going to need, I think, three by three minimal. But we'll double check on that later. So now we need to redefine the region for our first. So now we need to redefine the region for our first auto tile. So uh, we can see here that uh, we have four squares here, and they are the right size, 16 by 16, thanks to the subtile size. But we're actually going to need to left click up here at the top and then drag this over our entire stone block region. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit, make sure that uh, all of the corners match up so you can see what's defined as the region because that's this green line that outlines everything. Um, your tiles are basically wherever these green lines intersect. And that should be how it looks for right now. So we're doing a two by two bit mask. So it's going to be really simple. So I'm going to go into bit mask mode and this will set up the auto tiling. So for this tile, uh, we're going to need it to look like this. So you can just left click and hold and drag the red box where you need it to be. So my understanding of the bit masks in Godot is that where you have a bit mask enabled with the red square is going to be determining uh, where this tile looks to other tiles to see if it matches the bit mask in order to determine if this should be the tile that gets chosen. So in this case, being a top left corner, it has one to the bottom right. So it's going to be looking to both the right and down to see if there are tiles there. So in that case, if it matches both down and to the right, then it can be a corner tile on this piece. So in this case, if it finds a tile down and to the right, then it can be registered as the correct tile to automatically be selected. But there's also the areas where the bit mask is off that needs to be taken into consideration. So in this case, it would only be selected if down and to the right have a tile, but also in this case that there is nothing to the left, as you see the bit mask in the top left and the bottom left are disabled, and also nothing above. So if we have two bit masks enabled in one direction for a two by two bit mask, then that's going to mean it's going to look directly down uh, rather than to the right and down. And if you have all four bit masks enabled, then this square where you basically have a black background is only going to be selected if it's surrounded in all directions by other tiles from this specific auto tile. So only tiles that are selected from this auto tile are going to count for uh, selecting which tile gets selected. So if later you put, let's say one of these pieces next to it, which is a totally different auto tile, it's not going to have any influence on these tiles being selected, only these tiles influence the other tiles from this auto tile. So for these tiles, to the right, you can see that three out of four of the bit mask points are marked on, and only one is off. So in this case, you would be looking for there to be adjacent tiles from this auto tile on the left and above. And I think also the top left, if you're going uh, corners diagonally like this, but there would not be one to the down and to the right in this case, because this tile is off. So to put it simply, when your auto tile draws onto your game map, it's going to select the best fit from this auto tile setup. So ideally, when you're working with bit masks, you would only have one bit mask setup for each possibility inside of your bit mask. You'll notice that although four of these tiles have one out of four of the bit masks on, that they're in all different directions. So you'll never get any overlap with this simple auto tile. So lastly, if you go to the auto tile bit mask mode, you'll notice that there's three by three minimal and three by three as another option. So both of those are going to have nine bit mask points per tile. Since it's three by three, you multiply that, you get nine bit masks. So you can have one in the middle. And uh, we'll be using those later on uh, for these terrain pieces over here. And actually, as well as these little platforms. So if we click on the tile map now, we'll see our terrain tile is here and able to be placed on uh, this grid. So we can just kind of go ahead and place some tiles. But what you'll notice is that unless you have at least a two by two, the two by two bit mask can't work. So if you're just going straight down in a line like this, you're just going to get one tile selected. So for the two by two bit mask to work, you actually need to have at least a two by two square. So we can see as I start building this out, it just kind of works perfectly and the center gets filled in. So with auto tiling, it becomes 
really easy to create different shapes without having to worry about exactly which tile goes where. So if you can manage to set it up for yourself, it's uh, pretty handy to work with. And to kind of show those other tiles, I'll just remove a couple from these inner points here, and you can just see it, it just kind of works. So let's go back to the tile sat and create some extra tiles. So uh, we basically need to repeat the same thing for the one down here, this one, this one, this one, and this one. So we can just copy and paste kind of six times. So back in the tile set, uh, go to region mode. In order to see the names of each of these auto tiles, I'm going to click on this little info button on the right side. So you can see this is terrain 16 by 16 tile. So what we need to do is create a new auto tile and we're gonna be defining the same box as the region. So hit new auto tile, click on the top left, hold it down and drag a box around this area for our second auto tile. Now uh, we could go to bitmask mode and define everything once again. It wouldn't be hard for this one, but even quicker, we can just click over here on uh, this auto tile and hit the copy button for the bitmask and then click over here for this one and just hit the paste button. Uh, okay, but it does need to be uh, 16 by 16 subtile size first. So to find that over here on the right for each of the regions you create. So let's do new auto tile. I'll have to zoom out a little bit so we can see it down here and drag a box around this one. Make sure the subtile size is set to 16 by 16. Now we can go to bitmask and paste it in since we already have the one from this one copied into the buffer. So uh, that's three auto tiles created. Let's auto tile. Keep repeating the process. So 16 by 16, bitmask mode, paste it in. Okay, new auto tile, 16 by 16, bitmask, paste it in. And you pretty much get the idea. So let's finish up this last one down here. So I'm going to paste that in and uh, yep, subtile 16 by 16. And uh, that should be good for those. Now the same uh, bit mask is not going to work for these. You can see that these are a little bit different and these little bar platforms as well. I think this one actually does have the same auto tiling. So let's create one more over here for that. Then we can kind of test that out and make sure it works still. So let's paste in the bit mask and there we go. So now if we click on the tile map, we can see that we have seven different terrains to select from. So let's just, you know, start drawing one. And you can see that each of these, um, because they're defined as their own auto tile, they work independently of each other. So having one auto tile next to another one is not going to affect anything. Um, yeah, we can just kind of put this brick out there. And so we can also draw some other terrains here. So let's just make a two by two. And uh, there we have some dirt ground. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, set up a couple more bit masks. So back in the tile set, we need to define the auto tile regions uh, for these areas. So let's drag a box around it, go to bit mask mode. And this time we're actually gonna be using a three by three bit mask, which will make sense when you actually look at it. So change the auto tile bit mask mode to three by three. I believe we want 16 by 16 as the subtile size for the bit mask. So if we zoom in a bit, we can start drawing this. So it's going to look like this for the top bit. So we can see that this uh, first tile has a square in the center and then one to the right. And of course, this gives us nine uh, bit mask squares total inside of a single tile. So if I recall the uh, center one, basically means that it's looking for itself to be a tile in the set. And then also the bit mask on the right means it's also going to be looking to the right for tile. So if it's on the end, it's going to count itself for that middle one. And then if there's a tile to the right, it's going to match that. And then that can basically let you create a row of uh, this type of tile um, by just having these pieces next to each other. And then this will be the end and this will be the end and this will be the middle because it's looking to the left for a tile and to the right for a tile as well. Then we have uh, this one down here, just a single dot. So this will be the tile when there's no other tiles around, uh, just like a single tile. And then we can drag 16 squares in the middle here. So the outside ones are not gonna have anything. So you can basically use this shape for creating what you see here, basically just creating a two by two tile block. And then for top down platforms, we have this. So kind of the reverse direction for this one over here. So if we go to tile map, we can kind of see this in play. If I drag over here, we can create a little platform. We can also create a two by two to have that kind of block. Individual ones will just be 
uh, these little squares. And then of course we can do top down as well. So for these purposes, basically you could see that in the uh, tile set image, it will work just fine for that. But creating things like this, I don't think those tiles are actually designed for that. But if you know differently, feel free to put a uh, comment and I can correct myself on that. Um, but basically, this is how I was able to get it set up for that specific portion of the tile map. But that's basically how I was able to get it set up for that specific portion of the tile set. So let's go back into here for the tile set terrain, and we can copy this bit mask down to the other tiles. So new auto tile is created down here, 16 by 16 in three by three bit mask mode. And we're going to go over here, copy this one and paste it into the one below it. And just repeat the process for the other two. Let's create that bit mask, paste it in, and uh, make sure three by three and sixteen by sixteen. The information should overlay correctly. New auto tile, drag the region, bit mask mode, paste it in, change the three by three, sixteen by sixteen subtile mode, and that basically sets all of that up. So now there's these last three platform tiles. We're going to need to draw a region around them. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, make sure that although the height of the platform here is only about uh, four or five pixels, they actually do the full uh, 16 pixels because it's uh, still going to be tiled 16 pixels by 16 pixels with the rest of the game, or at least that's how I'm going to do it anyway. So then we take the auto tile bit mask mode and put it in three by three minimal and the subtile size 16 by 16. And then the bit mask is going to look basically like this, I believe. So let's go ahead and test it on the tile map. Um, we can click on the platform and let's draw a row. So note that the ends stay in their place. If I add another piece, the end moves over to the right. So that's what we want. And uh, this will work as long as you don't uh, put another platform that's like right below it like this. As long as you're not doing that, it should work correctly. So I think that'll be sufficient for our purposes here. Now uh, let's go back to that tile map. I'm going to double click it in the maps folder terrain. And let's just copy over that bit mask to two more new auto tiles. So new auto tile, and we select a box around here, go to three by three minimal, 16 by 16. And then bit mask, we're going to copy it from here into here. So they're basically the same. And then lastly, the metal version. Let's create that three by three, 16, 16 bit mask. Paste. So that's going to be the auto tiling setup for all of these terrain tiles. Now you can get to the fun part where if you click on the tile map, you have all of these auto tiles that you can use for building your own game level with. So for instance, if I want some uh, platforms, and maybe this could be used for a platform you can kind of jump down off of if you wanted to, just thinking ahead. Or if you want to create some long blocks, you have that. Some uh, tall ones, you can do it that way. And then these other tiles can be used for uh, setting up the base ground for your character. These just have to be at least a two by two tile to auto tile correctly, like so, and you should be good to go. So uh, you can just kind of build up whatever you want to test out for right now. So the first thing we're gonna need to do here is to create a new scene and have it start with a kinematic body 2D. So I will add this to a new scene tab up here at the top, and I'm gonna click other node because I want the root to be a kinematic body 2D. So if you don't already know, a kinematic body 2D is basically a physics character that will move based on the rules that you program into the script code. In other words, a lot of how your character moves around is going to be manual. The other option would be to create a rigid body 2D and those work by having forces act on your body rather than directly controlling the movement of the character inside of its script. So for games and physics based puzzle games, like let's say Angry Birds, uh, the rigid body would make a lot of sense there since you want forces to act on the character. But if you're trying to create a platformer, kinematic body 2D is usually what you're going to want. So let's go ahead and start by creating with this kinematic body 2D. The first thing I'm going to do up here is rename it to player. And then let's create a folder for characters to sit in. So that would include the main player character, enemies, maybe NPCs, whatever you need. So I'm going to right click down here in the file system and create a folder called characters. And now I'm going to hit command or control S in order to save the player scene inside of that characters folder. So let's go ahead and save that in there. 
Now you'll notice that there is a exclamation mark over here, node configuration warning. This node has no shape, so it can't collide or interact with other objects. So we have to add a collision shape 2D to this player so that it can actually collide with, let's say, the ground or other enemies, so on and so forth within the game. So I'm going to right click here and add a child node. So we want a collision shape 2D. So I'll add that in. And you also notice here that the collision shape actually requires us to create a shape type uh, for that to work. We'll do that in a minute. So the next thing we're going to want is a sprite. So I'm going to right click here. I'm going to add a child node. And for this specific character, we'll go with a animated sprite. And the reason for that is how this pack sets up um, the sprite sheets. So I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. But for now, let's just go with animated sprite. And depending on how your specific sprites are, the sprite node may work better than an animated sprite. So let's start adding the animations to this animated sprite, and you'll see a little bit of what I'm talking about. So over here on the right, there is this section here called frames and empty. So we want to change empty to a new sprite frames. So that is something we can click on. When we click on that, the sprite frames window pops up here at the bottom, and we can create individual animations. So if we look at the art for the ninja frog, which is going to be in the pixel adventure one pack and then main character and then ninja frog, we can find, uh, let's say our idle animation over here. So when you create an animation for a animated sprite, you just give it a name and you can create new animations up here. So we're going to do add frames from sprite sheet. So if we go into art, pixel adventure one, main character, ninja frog, and then idle, we can grab that. And so you'll see that over here for horizontal, we'll be able to specify the number of columns and then vertical for rows. So 11 by one gives us 11 sprite frames. We can hit select or clear all frames here and add 11 frames. So that will work really nicely for this kind of setup where each of your different animations are broken into their own sprite sheet. So I mentioned why would you want to use animated sprite over the sprite component? Well, let's just go add a sprite component and I'll kind of show you what I mean. So we'll add in the sprite. And for right now, I'll just hide the animated sprite by clicking on that little eyeball. We'll go to texture. And then you can see that we can put exactly uh, one texture in here. So that could be a sprite sheet pack. So for instance, I can put idle in here. And you can see the frames load just fine. So if we expand the animation section, you can see horizontal and vertical frames. So we can set uh, rows and columns like before. So I think we need 11 horizontal frames. Okay, and that splits up the frames individually. So we can go through the frames here and just kind of play our, our animation. So we'd be able to animate using this frame setting. But the problem is that you can only have one sprite texture. So if we change this into, let's say, this jump, uh, you can see it's still using horizontal frames, 11 by one. This animation is completely different. It only has one frame. So I would need to change this value to one. And then whenever we're playing an animation, we would have to not only change the texture, but also the number of horizontal frames and vertical frames and specifying individual frames on an animation by animation basis uh, when we go ahead and create an animation player, which normally that would be okay if everything was condensed into one pack, uh, just like one single texture file. And then you could just go through all the frames here and it would be no problem. But uh, because they're separated, animated sprite just makes more sense here. Um, both will do the job, but if you have different animations that are separated, then it's much easier to just click add animation and let's just do run here. Put in, uh, well, don't drag and drop it. Yeah, you, you actually want to hit this button so you can split up the frames. Then you click on run. I think we have 12 by one here. Select clear all frames in the top right, add frames, and there's your animation. So we can check the playing box on the right um, to see what our animation looks like. This is way slower than it's supposed to be. So um, in the sprite frames box, we actually want to change the speed to 20 FPS. And there's the correct speed for playing back the animation. we got to set that on an animation by animation basis. So click on idle and uh, make sure that is also playing at 20 FPS. And you can see that runs much smoother there. So you basically just keep going down this list to create the rest of your animations. So I guess we can actually just add in everything right now. Why not? So let's add in a jump animation, single frame. So I'll just add that as jump and then we'll have fall 
So uh, the difference between jump and fall is fall is when your character is going down and then jump is going to be when your character is rising. So you use basically the vertical velocity in order to figure that out, but that's for later. Uh, so we can also have a double jump. So I'll add in a new animation. We'll change that to uh, double underscore jump, I guess. And let's add in that animation. I can see that that is six frames. So six horizontal, one vertical, select clear all frames, add them in. Okay, then we have our double jump animation. So 20 FPS, and that is the correct playback speed. So let's see, what else do we have here? Hit and wall jump. So hit, I believe, is going to be when your character takes damage. Let's add that in. So new animation, hit, and then new animation, wall underscore jump. Let's grab the frames for that from their separate texture files. That looks like seven frames. So seven by one, select clear all, put it at 20 FPS. Okay, and we can test it by changing to that animation. Uh, okay, well, this double jump and we want hit. So there's the hit animation, pretty slick there. So wall jump is the last one. So let's just fill that in real quickly. Add animation, wall jump, five frames. So five times one, select clear all frames, add them in, and make sure that this FPS is 20 FPS. So we can check all of the animations and just make sure that they're all 20 FPS. Okay, so that's basically our animations for the character setup. Nice and easy with an animated sprite. So now that we kind of know where our character is, uh, in terms of the sprite with reference to the kinematic character object, we can basically go to the animation, put it in idle, and we can figure out where the collision shape should be um, using the idle state as a reference point. So in collision shape 2D, I'm going to click on shape on the right, and we can do a capsule shape. So if you do a capsule shape, there is the ability for a character to kind of slip off edge if you are just approaching the edge. If you don't want your character to be able to slide accidentally off the edge, you want it to be either purely on the ground or slightly off the ground and therefore falling, then you could use a rectangular shape instead. I'm going to go with capsule shape for now. We might change that later. So new capsule shape, and we want this to roughly fit where the character sits on the ground. So I'm going to shrink this. And uh, actually, I want to see the collision shape above the sprite. So I'm going to reorganize the order. So animated sprite is going to be on top. You just drag and drop. And now we can see the collision shape. So let's change the transform, um, move it a little bit down. I think I had it at 9.5 pixels or so. And now we just need to adjust things a little bit further. Just get the shape you want uh, for collisions with other objects, such as the ceiling or the ground. Maybe we actually do want the character to uh, have a relatively high hitbox. So if you're bumping your head into the ceiling, that should happen up here, not way down here. So let's take the transform and move that up a little bit. So let's see, five. Okay, and that probably is pretty good right there. So. Currently, the settings are at five for the pixel position. And if we click on capsule shape, we have a radius of 7.1. I'll just round that to seven and the height I will make 10. And that should do for our initial capsule shape. So our character should be able to collide uh, once we set up the movement, which is gonna require some scripting. So first off, let's take the level. Uh, so back on the level tab, I'm going to close the art and the file system, go to characters, and let's just drag this player character onto the scene. I'll put him a little bit up here so that when we actually start running the game, uh, gravity should make him fall to the ground. And then we can check if he's on the ground for things like being able to move left and right normally. So it's pretty easy to actually check that in Godot as well. One of the cool things about a 2D kinematic body movement in Godot. So let's dive into the player scene. We can hit open an editor that's gonna switch into the original scene. On level one, this is actually an instantiated copy of the scene. So you could just put in a whole bunch of players if you want. And these are all separate from each other, but they're all basing what you have, like the different nodes here and the code uh, based on this original player scene. So anyway, we need to add a script to the player. So I'm just gonna hit the new script button while clicking on the player kinematic body 2D node, which is the root. You'll see that uh, this will automatically give it the name player.gd for gd script, and it's going to put it in the characters folder. So I think that works just fine for us um, in terms of organization. So I'm going to click create. 
so what we're going to need to do in order to make sure our character can move uh, when we press keys is to check the input when the game is running. So we're going to do that in a function called physics process. You'll notice that function process is commented out here. But uh, since movement is basically part of the physics of the game, we would want to run that in the physics process. So anything that has to do with movement, collision, or physics, generally it's recommended that you run that in the physics process function uh, rather than the process function. So one of the differences with the physics process is that it will run a set number of times every second of real life, whereas the function underscore process delta uh, can run more or less times than that. So basically the physics process is consistent and then the normal process function runs an inconsistent number of times per second. So let's just delete all of that right here for now. So I'm gonna write in here func for function and then underscore physics process. You'll notice that this gives us the autocomplete. So I'm just gonna hit enter there, completes it. There is a uh, parameter here called delta. That is the time between frames. So we can use this as uh, information for our physics process. So what we're going to want to do in this is to get the input. So I'm actually gonna just create a variable here called var input. And then we're gonna create a function that will run here. And I'm going to call that get player input. And then we just need to create that function. So function get player input. Okay, no parameters. And then we add the two dots at the end. We hit enter and now we can start writing the function. So we can just kind of create a variable here. I'm gonna call it var input. I'm gonna put this colon and then I'm gonna type in the type vector two, uh, just to kind of inform anyone reading the code that this is intended to be a vector two, which is basically two float numbers. Uh, you have an X value, which in this case is gonna be used for horizontal input or horizontal movement. And then you can have a Y component for the vector, which would be up, down, vertical. So if you are doing a 3D game, you might have a vector three, which adds the third uh, direction, which would be kind of like your depth into the background, your Z axis. Okay, so we have the import and we need to start getting the values for the input. So we have X to set for horizontal input and Y to set for vertical input. So input.x, and we need to set that to input. Now, the first letter here is capital. This is something you can access in Godot by default. You don't have to write anything before this will appear. And then there are functions you can run on this input. So the function we want to run is get action strength. So this takes a parameter and the parameter is the name of the action. So you'll see by default, there are all of these UI actions that we can grab. So we could just be kind of lazy and use UI underscore left. Another option would be that you could define a custom action and call it a left, right, up, down, or play a move, up, down, left, right, uh, whatever you want to call it that's totally separate from the UI left. So maybe you have different controls for the UI and maybe you have different controls for the player. Up to you how you want to do it. Ultimately, we're just figuring out uh, the key we want the player to press in order to move the character left and right. So let's go up to the project menu at the top left. We're going to go to project settings, input map, and here we can set the actions for our game. You can see that uh, UI left, UI up, right, and down are already set. So if we wanted to, we could just check for those values and then use up, down, left, right arrows on our keyboard in order to move the character for the game. I generally prefer WASD movement. So I'm actually gonna add a new action. So this will be separate from the UI left, right, up, down. So I'm just gonna call it left up here at the top. If you're creating a multiplayer game, you could call it P1 for player one underscore left. You know, it's really up to you. So let's hit add. Okay, so we have the new action, but there's no keys for it. So we wanna hit the plus button over here on the right. You can see that you can add in joystick button controls, uh, mouse button controls or keyboard. So let's do keyboard and I'm gonna hit W on the keyboard to set the key and hit okay. So, oh wait, well that would actually be forward. So let's change that. Let's uh, hit the edit button, A for left. Okay, and then let's add the next action. So up, and then we can do down and right. So for each of these, we set a key. So up will be W, down will be S, and then right will be D. Okay, so there, WASD controllers. Uh, maybe we want to move this up there. So, you know, it actually says WASD, makes a little more sense. Let's close this. So now in order to get the X, import, uh, we're actually going to need to 
uh, do some math between two values. So if we're setting the horizontal movement, there's two keys that would control that. That would be the right movement and the left movement. So right on the screen is going to give you a positive value for the X, and then left on the screen is going to give you a negative value. So how we calculate it here is that for the X input, we're going to get the right value first here. So it's positive. I don't put a negative here, but it's just positive if we're going to the right. And then we can subtract the action strength from uh, the left. So get action strength. And now we do left. Make sure there's the quotation marks because it's a string. And this basically would mean with a keyboard, if we press on the right, then this is going to be one. And if we press left, the A key, then this is also going to be one. So if you press right and left at the same time, one minus one is going to cancel each other out and you're going to get a zero. If you're not pressing right, but you are pressing left, you're going to get a negative one. And if you're pressing right, but not left, then you're going to get a one. So we can use that in order to determine which direction the player should move. So for the Y direction, it can be very similar. So for this specific game, since it's got that classic uh, platformer style, the up and down keys might not actually be used in the end, but we can still get the input values for it. There might be you know, some kind of movement component later on, which would depend on the input Y. So we might as well just get it since we've already set it up. So let's do input Y and we're going to do get action strength. And this time we're looking for down. So uh, that may sound a little confusing, but down is actually positive when you are doing 2D games. So you go down on the screen means that your Y value is increasing. So we want get action strength down minus get action strength up. So there we go. And now we have the import vector set up properly. So we want to return that so that it can be used in the main physics process function. So return input and we're pretty much done with that. So maybe I'll just write a comment here. So now in order to move the character, we're going to need to determine its velocity. So I'll go up here to the top and declare a variable up here. I'll call it var velocity. And I'll just say that this is a vector two, just like we did in uh, the function down here. So the advantage of declaring it up here is that this is basically attached to the player script directly. And we can use this value in any of the functions that this script is going to be using. So it's just kind of publicly accessible, whether we're in physics process, get player input or any other function. So uh, that also means we can set the value and then the new value can be used in other functions as well. So we want to set the velocity and we're going to do that based on the direction times the player's movement speed, but we haven't set up how fast the player should move. So we need another variable. So I'm going to this time type in export and I'm going to give it a type either float or integer. So if you want to be able to use decimal points, you use a float. If you want it to be integers as in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, no decimal point, then you can write int for int. But I think there's really no downside here to using floats. It just allows you to be more specific with the exact speed. So I will make the variable a float and we have to put export float var here. And after that, we give it a name. So I'm going to call it move speed, move underscore speed more specifically. And let's just give it an arbitrary number like 200 for now. We can always change it later. Now, the difference between doing an export float var and a var is that this variable is not going to show up on the inspector for the character. But when you do export float, the float determines the type, basically how that should be set in the inspector. And then the export is going to make it publicly viewable. So if I click over here on the player, we can see the move speed variable is set here and we can change that to anything we want. Uh, it defaults to whatever we set in the code, but we can change this uh, on a instance basis. So if I have three players over here in the main scene, I can click on those. I can change the values over here. So 300, but we can still, you know, save that, go back over to the player scene and you can see here it's 200, but then on the instance copy, it's 300. So different characters, even though they're based on the same code, the same nodes can have different settings. So you could also use that for things like color. If you want to take a, I don't know, green frog and turn it blue, something like that. So we have our move speed value. Now we need to multiply that by the direction. So let's go into the script and I'm going to take the X input and I'm going to multiply that by the move speed in order to get the X direction movement. So 
uh, velocity. I'm just going to set that equal to vector 2 here. Maybe I'll kind of break this up into multiple lines. So this will be our x line and this will be our y line. I'll just set that to 0 for right now. Uh, later we'll add gravity and jumping. Um, but up here on the second line for x, we're going to do input.x. So that's the direction. And we're going to times that by move speed. So because right is 1.0 on the keyboard, left is 1.0 on the keyboard, we're going to get either 0 or plus 200 or minus 200. And we can use that velocity for movement. So moving a kinematic body in 2D itself, once you have the speed and the direction, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is type in move and slide. And then here we're going to put in that velocity variable. Boom, done. There's actually another way to move to, which is move and collide. And there you would also add in times delta. So really that would look like move and collide, velocity times delta. So that's the time between frames. Uh, move and slide automatically accounts for that, but move and slide does not. I'm not sure why, but that's just how it currently works. So the reason you would want to keep in mind the time between frames is if there's any inconsistencies between the time between your frames, you want to move the character the right amount based on the time since the last frame. So the character should move at a consistent speed, but if your frames aren't rendering at the same speed, then the amount of movement on each refresh should be different. Now, theoretically, in physics process, it's always going to be the same. Um, so generally, you wouldn't run into that problem. But just in case, uh, that is there. That's why delta exists. And move and slide just automatically factors that in. So you just need the velocity variable. You don't multiply it by delta in a nutshell. So uh, now that we have that, I think we could just go ahead and hit play and move the character left and right. OK, uh, first off, we should make sure that we're on the uh, level scene. And let's uh, zoom out a bit here. I guess we're going to need to put a camera in. So let's add a child node here. And I'm going to add in a camera, specifically a camera 2D. And then if you zoom out a bit, you can see the blue border for the camera. So I'm going to click on camera. I'm going to click down here. And we're going to move the camera 2D and just put it roughly on top of our player for right now. So now we can hit play. And OK, the other problem is that we have to make it the current camera. If you don't make it the current camera, then the camera is going to put it somewhere around 0, 0, I think. So if we check current on, then this is now the active camera. And this is going to be where the game starts looking at. So play once again. And let's test that out. OK, so our character is there. So now we can use A and D to move our character. So A, D, OK, cool. It's working, sort of. Uh, so obvious problems include being able to walk through the wall and not having any gravity to drop to the floor. So let's solve the gravity problem first. Uh, in Godot, if you go up to Project, Project Settings, uh, there are technically uh, default gravity values that you can set here. OK, and you search in the search bar. So gravity, and then you can see Physics 2D. We have default gravity and default gravity factor. Default gravity is measured in pixels. And these are just kind of arbitrary numbers that you could apply with your uh, 2D kinematic bodies. I, I think these might, I think these actually might have more of a direct impact when you are using rigid body 2D and that would automatically factor this in. But in kinematic bodies, you have to do everything manually. So we could either use these values and customize them up here. Or what I think I might prefer to do is uh, create a singleton uh, where we just have game settings, which we can load up either on like a per level basis or for the entire game. And anytime we need to change global game settings, we do that in a singleton, which loads up one time per game. So I'm going to close here. And then we can create a new scene and attach a script to it. So let's go to the menu in the top left, hit new scene. And here we're going to do other node. Uh, this isn't really a 2D object, so to speak. It's just a node that is going to contain a script with a bunch of variables that we can set in reference in other scripts. So other node, and I'm just going to do node here. So as basic as you can get, I'm going to hit Command or Control S. And let's save this in the root directory for now. Um, we could actually create a singleton folder. Might as well have more folders. So I'm going to right click and do new folder. And I'll put it in singleton here, hit OK. So this node is going to be called game settings. So doing the camel casing, uh, capital G, capital S, and hit save. So I'm also going to rename this node to game settings, make it consistent. And now we just add a script to this. 
So we do that, it's going to automatically default to that singleton directory, which we saved the G, which we saved the scene file to. So now it's going to store the Godot script file as well. So create that. Let's delete everything over here. And now we can just add in a couple export variables. So let's do export float var. And I guess what we're going to want here is gravity. And we can set that to an arbitrary default value. But, you know, once again, uh, we're going to save a instance of this game settings. So we can just click over here and customize it anytime we need. We don't actually have to use the script uh, because we have the export float here. So that's really handy. And we can do export float var, and I'm going to call this terminal velocity, uh, as in basically the max falling speed that you can reach. So gravity gets added on every second. Your character keeps speeding up, going downwards on the screen. And what do you want that cap speed to be at? So because it's a 2D cartoony game, it's kind of arbitrary. Real world physics not required. Just can play around with the numbers and figure out the feel that you want for your specific game. So I just will put 300 for right now. And we'll mess with that a bit later, I'm sure. So we have these values and we just want to have it load this game settings node every time we launch the game. So I'm going to go to project, project settings. There is a tab here called auto load and we want to add in that game settings scene. So let's go to singleton and then do the game settings dot TSCN, double click there, add it. Okay, so now um, this game settings is going to load every time we boot up the game. It's a singleton. A singleton basically just means there can only be one in existence at any given time. So if you reference the game settings, you should be relatively assured that that is going to be the same game settings uh, that you have across your game. So it shouldn't change. It should always be the specific scene uh, that we have saved in this singleton folder. So let's go ahead and hit close now. And now we can go over to the player script and we can reference that gravity and the terminal velocity. So we're going to set the velocity, uh, the y velocity specifically to its current y velocity. And then we are going to subtract and then we're going to subtract the gravity. So minus game settings dot gravity. So this is all you need to do to reference it. Just game settings dot whatever variable we have set up in that singleton. And we can just reference that across our game. And uh, we are going to also limit that. So as things are right now, the gravity value is going to change the velocity and it's going to keep going down faster and faster with no limit, basically infinite uh, downwards on the screen speed. So I can kind of show that real quick, uh, but let's also make a print statement here. So print and we'll just do velocity dot Y so that in the uh, console, we can see that the value just keeps going down. So let's try uh, playing the game. So level one. OK, and we can see in the output, we're going to get the value for the speed. So now we are approaching like negative 16,000 as the downward speed. And actually, I made a mistake. It should be uh, plus gravity uh, because down is positive when we are doing these 2D games. So we're going to want to cap the speed here. And the way that we cap the vertical movement speed is by using the min function. It's a math function. So it's going to return the lower of the two values. So we have our A over here on the left, which is the new velocity we're trying to set. And then over here on the right, we're going to have game settings dot terminal velocity. So now when we go ahead and hit play, we're going to see, or we should see a cap on the value. And we did not. So I think we actually want plus game settings dot gravity. Let's go ahead and hit plus here and see. Uh, okay. Yeah, right. That's correct. So down once again is a positive value on the screen. So this is positive. This is negative. If we hit refresh over here, we can see right when that starts, our character kind of falls through the floor, but uh, the velocity is actually capped there. So that's, that's what we want to see. No matter how long it goes, it never goes faster than that terminal velocity. Okay, so now we actually need uh, to have some collisions between the player and the ground. So we can check our tile map for that. Let's go click on the tile map object, the pixel adventure terrain .tres file, which we saved to the project. And now we can open up our terrain. We can zoom in. And the problem is that we haven't set any collision tiles. So it's not too hard to do it but it may be a little time consuming. So let's click on our region over here. 
Uh, once again, we already set up the bit mask so that we can draw it, but we have no collisions added. So the quickest, easiest way to just do collisions is to add in a new rectangle. You can see that this has hotkeys, so it's Shift R on the keyboard. So I found a good way to do this is to click on your tile, hit Shift R, click on the tile again, and then you have your collision square, which is basically the same shape and size of the tile itself. So we click on the second square, we hit Shift R, we click on it again, and now we have a collision shape. So if the character bumps into this from any direction, it should stop it in its tracks. So let's just keep doing that. Click, Shift R, click, click, Shift R, click. So you just keep going through and uh, if you run into an issue, you can just kind of manually click there. Just make sure you get one collision on each one. If you see that after it was yellow, it becomes even more yellow. That might mean you made two collision shapes on top of it. So you could just click them and delete them if that becomes a problem. Uh, so everything should have the same overlay of yellow. So let's just keep doing that. I'll just speed up the video. So if for some reason it's giving you a little issues, you can also manually click up here to create your next rectangle. So you can make it like click up there and then click down here, and then that'll give you the same results. But hopefully the hotkeys will work for you as well. So that is basically all of the collision shapes with exception of one. So if we zoom in here, uh, we can see that these platform tiles we created only have a four pixel high uh, platform. So it doesn't really make sense to have a character collide with it from underneath because that would mean it would bump its head right around here where there's clearly nothing there. So uh, when we add in the collision shape for these, you can see that uh, I set up the snapping to be four pixels by four pixels earlier. There was a reason for that. And that is so that we can adjust these collision shapes to match these platforms. So when you're creating your collision shapes, you can check the snap options, make sure step is four by four for uh, these particular tiles. And now you can click on each of the corners and drag them up. So if we do that for each one uh, there, now we have a collision shape that actually matches the artwork for uh, this tile set. So we can basically just uh, redo that for each of these. So just click on the four corners you need to adjust. And that's basically all there is to it. As long as you make the snapping four pixels by four pixels, it'll be really easy with this particular tile set. Okay, and for right now, that should be all the collisions we're going to need for our terrain tile set. So great. And now we can hit Control S. And if we go back into the game, uh, the collision should actually be working. So let's hit play. Our character is now going to be on the ground. So we can hit left and right for movement. And our character is just going to, you know, kind of fall off the edge and then stops when he gets here. And once again, when he lands down here. Now, uh, you can see a couple issues. One is that it's a couple pixels off the ground for the character. We just need to adjust the position of the collision shape in order for that to look correct. And then over here on the left, you can see that the Y velocity keeps saying it is 300. Uh, not technically correct. So let's hit stop here. Now we go into player. We will uh, open this up. And what we need to do is that after we have the move and slide velocity, this actually returns a velocity after making collisions with the ground. So basically it'll take the Y value here and set it to zero because there was a ground collision. So basically it can't move anymore. So if we set the velocity value stored in the script to that velocity value returned by here, then that will make it reset the Y velocity to zero. And then that will set up here so that the next time it comes in here, we're going to be adding the gravity to zero. So that should be correct. And also, we really want to see the velocity after the movement, not before. Uh, before, when this is zero, it's going to add the gravity, which will make it 50. But really, after the actual movement is calculated, it's going to be moving at a speed of zero. So that it makes more sense to print it here. So let's go ahead and hit play. And we can take a look at that. So you saw maybe that uh, at the initial a couple frames, it was 50, it was 100, and then it was 150 as it was accelerating towards the ground. But then after that, it is zero because we're on the ground. Keep an eye on the output and uh, you might see it change again. So right there for a split second, it was accelerating towards the ground. And that is what we want to see. So let's go into the 2D view for our player. I can see that the 
Uh, collision shape is a little too low here, so we just need to adjust that. So I'm going to go to collision shape 2D, and then let's try making the position uh, 3. It does depend on the direction that you are facing, so maybe 4 here. And now let's go ahead and make sure that it is pixel perfect with the ground. So taking a look here, we can see the, we have the ground pixels, and then right above it is the character's outline pixels. So that is what we're going to want to see here. Unless you want to actually cut off the outline here and just have the green bit being what's connecting with the ground, uh, that's more of a stylistic choice, I think. So let's go ahead and hit stop here. And actually, when I take a look at it, we've basically covered everything for this video. So we have a camera set on top of our player. Our character can move left and right based on our input that we set up, creating those custom actions and gravity is working as well as the terminal velocity. So a decently functional uh, platformer character, no jumping yet, but we will get to that. If the character's on the ground, he should be able to jump. But once your character is jumping, the movement is going to work a little differently. So depending on where the character is and what buttons are pressed in each of those different modes that the character has uh, for being able to interact with the game world is going to be called a state. So let's go ahead and dive into our player scene again. So here we can see we have the animated sprite, the collision shape, but we don't actually have a way for us to change the animation yet. So, so currently, even though we can move around left and right, when we go ahead and hit play and we try to move left and right, uh, we can see that the character still just stays in that idle and he doesn't even face the correct way yet. So we can correct that and then add in jumping as another option. But uh, first, before we dive into the scripting, let's add a animation players. So our animation player is one of the tools we can use for changing how the character's current animation is going to look like, which when we change the state and code, we can also update the animation player. So it's playing the right animation for the right state. So let's right click on the player and add a child node. So we're looking for animation player, which is right down here conveniently. Let's go ahead and create that. And uh, now when we click on animation player, we can see there's this animation window down here at the bottom. So we want to create one animation for each of the animated sprite animations here. So I think the way of doing this is a little bit cleaner when you use a sprite, not an animated sprite. But once again, because in our previous video, we discovered that all of these different animations are separated into different image texture files animated sprite works better for this particular project. So how it works for animation player and an animation sprite is that we are going to go into this animation button and hit new. So we need to create one for each animation. Let's start with idle, hit enter, and now we need to add a track. So when we have these animation player animation tracks, we can change different properties as the animation progresses. So I'm going to hit add track here, property. And now we can take any property from our scene and basically animate that. So uh, let's change animated sprite and we want to change the animation here. When we enter the idle animation on the animation player, we want to play the idle animation on the animated sprite. So I'm going to right click here, insert a key, a key just being a moment in time when you change the value of something such as which animation is playing. And then over on the right with that key selected, we can change the value to idle, which it's kind of conveniently already on. Now, because when it's in the animation state, we never want it to stop, although we may not technically need it. Now, because when a character is idling, it, we want it to keep continuing the animation. I think it makes sense to check animation looping here. Uh, technically might not be required in this case, since this is only telling the animated sprite which animation to play, but the animated sprite is probably going to be looping either way. Um, but if you were using a sprite rather than an animated sprite, you would have to have that looping checked. So I think it's just better to have it there just in case. So uh, let's also take the animation up here and create a new one. So let's also go up to the animation menu again and add in the run animation. And let's add one for jump as well. And we'll work on the others later, but let's just do those for now. So run, and we're going to add a track, property track, animated sprite animation. And then on that first frame, we want to insert the key, make sure it's in the right position all the way over here on the left. And we take the value and we change that to run. And of course, this is going to be the jump animation. So in the byte, we're going to change that keyframe to jump. 
So we can make this stuff go a little bit faster if we actually duplicate our animations instead. So I will go to animation, duplicate, and then we can rename this to whatever we need. So let's see another animation we probably are going to set up hit. Let's just rename this to hit. And now we don't need to check looping. We don't need to create a keyframe. We just need to change the value here to hit animation. And we're good there. So that should be enough for right now. Let's go ahead and dive into the code. So we're going to need an enum variable up here at the top. So I'm going to type in enum and we can give it an optional name. So I will call it enum state. And then in, I believe it's the curly brackets here, uh, we want to put in idle run and jump. So what the enum basically does is it translates a human readable word such as idle run or jump into a integer value that is going to be associated with that. So basically you could think of it like a position in an array. The idle is the first one here. So that is going to be represented as a zero uh, when the game is actually running and run is going to be a one and jump is going to be a two. But when we're typing out our code, we don't need to use that zero, one and two. We just can use state dot idle to reference that position within the states. So it makes it easier to understand what is trying to go where um, when you're kind of troubleshooting your code. So along with this, we're going to need a variable for the current state. So I will port var current underscore state, and we can just default this to state dot idle. So really, this is just going to be a zero, but that zero specifically is referencing the zero position within this enum. So just keep that in mind. So the next thing we're going to want to do is have a way for determining what the next state is going to be for our character as we press buttons or move off the edge or so on and so forth. We want to basically figure out where the character is in the game and what actions should be available to it. So we're going to create a new function after the move and slide runs, and we're going to call it pick next state. So we can just hit enter a few lines and create this function, function pick next state. And so one of the first conditions for determining the state is going to be whether the character is on the floor or not. So if the character is in the air, then it should be in some kind of jump or falling state. You can even make separate states for that if you have a reason to. Uh, for this character, I believe we're just going to have one air state, which is going to be that jump state. But on the ground, our character can be idling or it can also be running depending on if there is any horizontal movement or not. So let's check the main condition first, which is going to be, is it on the floor? So this is a kinematic body 2D script, which means we have access to a function that is called is on floor. So basically this script already knows how to check if there is ground directly underneath. Basically, if our kinematic body is colliding with another thing underneath it by checking our collision shape versus the collision shapes of other things like the ground terrain tiles. So if that's the case, if there is in fact ground directly beneath our character, we want to end being in any kind of jump state. And that's going to mean we're going to want to reset the jump so our character can jump again later on. So I'm going to set jumps equal to zero. So for our character, we'll have the ability to jump one or more times. And this will represent the number of times that the character has jumped since hitting the ground last. So let's actually create that variable up here in advance. So var jumps, and that's going to default to zero. Since presumably at the start of the game, we want to give our character the ability to jump. So jumps goes to zero anytime we're on the ground. We need to determine if we're going to enter a jump state, a run state, or an idle state. So we want to go into a jump state if we press the jump button while we're on the floor. So we can check if the jump input is pressed. So if input dot is action just pressed, and then we're going to look for jump, which I don't think we've actually created as an action yet. So I will go ahead and do that right after this line. And then we also need to check if jumps is equal to zero. So if jump is pressed while the character is on the ground. And so let's set up that jump action. So project project settings input map come down here to the bottom. Let's add the action jump. Keep in mind your uh, capitalization. It should be the same as the string that you're using inside of the script. So let's add a key. I'll just make this space bar nice and simple. Hit close. And now we have a jump action which can be checked with this input manager. So then we need to set the current state or more specifically state dot jump. 
So when we add this self bit to the current state, we can be sure that we're referencing the current state of this object up here. So when we add this self here, uh, we can be certain that this is going to refer to the current state that is specifically attached to this kinematic body up here. So that is going to mean self dot current state, which is right here, which is what we want. So uh, we're setting that to state dot jump. And we have other states we need to work on. So we can also put in else if as in if the first condition isn't met, then this is our alternative. And we want to see if the character is moving horizontally. So that can be either a positive or a negative x, basically, as long as it's not zero, uh, we could put in absolute velocity is greater than zero. Another way you could pretty much write the same thing would just be velocity does not equal zero. However, you want to write it kind of the same thing. And let's add self dot current state is equal to state dot run. So if the character is not jumping, but he is moving, then he should be in the run state. The last one that we're going to have for right now is just going to be state dot idle. So if those other conditions aren't met, but the characters on the ground, then it's going to be idling. So if you're not moving, you're idling. And we won't do this yet, but I'm going to add a little message to write this later. So if it's not on the floor, then we may want to have a double jump down here. So in the air, basically, we can also do a double jump kind of move. So I'm going to say to do double jump. And I'm just going to write pass here passes and basically just continue with the program. And uh, there's no code here. So we're just skipping over it. So next, I want to create a set function for our current state. So when we change the state from let's say, idle to jump, we want certain actions to take place. Namely, we want to add some upwards movement for our character when it enters the jump state uh, to represent the jumping in the game, the character should move up. So we can have a set function mean that when we change the current state, we can have certain state entrance actions occur. So up here at current state, I'm going to add onto the end set get and then we're going to call it set current state, uh, just standard naming convention. Another idea I had in mind, I'm not going to do it, but you could also call it enter state, I think that also could make sense. But we'll go down here and write our setter function down here at the bottom. I'm actually just going to put a hashtag setters kind of header here in case we have other variables with setters later on just kind of keep them contained in the same area. So let's do function set current state. And this is going to have a value, basically the new state we're entering. So I'm going to write new underscore state, just keeping it as straightforward as possible. So if when we set the current state, the new state is a jump state, then we want to have the character jump moving upwards on the screen. So I'm going to use the match function on the new state value and check if that state coming in is the jump state. So we can use down here as the second line state dot jump. So this is the value we're matching. So if the value passed is state dot jump, then we're going to want to jump. So this is a function we haven't written yet as well. And finally, we want to set the current state to the new value being passed in. So if you don't have a custom setter function created, basically, if you change the value, it would just be exactly like this current state equals new state and nothing else. But the setter allows you to add an extra code that will occur when that value is being changed. So now we need a jump function. So this will be really simple and straightforward. Gonna go here, write another function, function jump and uh, semicolon. Now what we need to do is change the y velocity uh, of this character and add in a jump impulse value, basically, the amount of movement we want to add upwards on the screen for the character to move. And this should be an immediate boost, uh, not so much an acceleration over time, or at least it will be like that for this character. If it was an acceleration, that would be more like a jetpack. So uh, let's do velocity dot y. And this is referencing the same velocity up here, since there's no velocity variable specified in this function, it's going to default to the one of this script. So the velocity y, and we're going to set that immediately to a new value we're going to create, and I'm just going to call it jump impulse. And we're setting that to a negative value because we want it to move up on the screen. So 
This is just going to be the amount, and this is going to be the direction. Negative value means move up on the screen. And when we jump, we're also going to want to increase the jump counter. So jump plus equals one. So this is important in case we want to add double jumps, which we will be doing later. So uh, let's create that jump impulse variable. And I'll put it up here at the top because this is something we might want to change. So it's going to be an export float var and jump impulse. So different characters are going to jump different amounts. So we can set this to a nice and high value like 600. So uh, keep in mind, after the initial speed, this is going to be decreasing uh, on every frame by this gravity until it reaches the terminal velocity or the character hits the floor. So it's only going to move this fast initially, and then it's going to slow down and then eventually go back towards the Earth. OK, this should be jumps down here, not jump. And now if we hit play, our character should be able to jump on the screen. The animations won't change yet. So when we go into the game and we try to hit space, nothing actually happens. Uh, even if we fall off the edge, we can clearly see the character is on the ground, but it's actually not registering the characters on the ground. And the reason for that is there is an extra um, argument we can pass to this move and slide, which is the direction of up. So in a 2D game, we can just easily do that by doing comma and then vector two dot up. So this is going to mean that upwards on the screen is going to be our up direction. And now that that's set, move and slide can uh, set the values for is on floor, is on ceiling, and is on walls, because it knows what direction the walls, the ceiling, and the floor is now. So let's go ahead and re-enter the game. And now we can hit space. Uh, the breakpoint hits for state jump. So let's continue that. And if we go back in there, we can see the jump is working nicely. We can also see that the character's jump is fast initially, but as it gets to that highest point, it slows down and then we accelerate back downwards. And that's what you want from a standard platformer jump. OK, the next thing we're going to want to take care of is setting uh, parameters in an animation tree so that we can actually have this animation player switch to the correct animations uh, depending on the values we set for that animation tree. So basically, we need to tell the tree uh, whether the character is moving left and right or jumping into the air, and then let that tree figure out what animation state to put the animation player in. So we have the actual code for controlling how the character can move, but we also need to have the animation player and animation tree side of things for controlling uh, how it represents those graphics to the player, basically changing the animation. So let's add a animation tree. I'm going to right click on the root node, add a child, animation tree, and this animation tree needs an animation player. So let's assign our animation player to the animation tree. And now we also need a tree root. So there's different ways of setting this up. But I think for our project, using a animation node blend tree as the root tree node is going to work out all right. So that's what I'm going to go with for now. So we can see in the blend tree that we have an output. So we need to determine how we're going to get to that output and which of the animations is going to be the current output for our animation player to use. So in our blend tree, the first node I'm going to add in is going to be, uh, and you right click, by the way, to add nodes. I'm going to go down to blend space 1D. So with a blend space 1D, we're basically working with one parameter as a input, and we're going to tell the animation tree about the parameter value in the player script. But we can see those parameters if we click on the animation tree again. And you come down here in the inspector, you can see parameters, blend space 1D. That's actually the name of our parameter right here and the values. So this is the blend position. And you can set that with parameters slash name of the uh, parameter and then slash blend position. So in our case, we're going to be setting it to negative 1, 0, and 1. Uh, it picks our game. You're not going to blend together animations like you would with a 3D model. So we only want those three values. and we can also give it a better name for this. So I could call this value x move or x sign, sign representing the direction, either a 1, a 0, or a negative 1 uh, for our character's movement. And by taking that into the editor here, we're able to determine whether it should show idle or run. So let's open the editor here. 
And then we're going to add in points in here. So I'm going to hit create points over here on the left, and then left click in the middle, add animation, idle. So if the value of X move is set to zero, that's going to make it idle. So let's click over here on the right, add animation, run. So we can see looking at the graph that this is set with a value of one over here on the right, the idle is zero, and then negative one, we also want to make run animation. So it's still going to be running, it's just going to be doing it in reverse direction. So we want it to play the run animation. So we can come out here to the root, and I'm going to connect this to the output. Now, all we need to do is set this parameter in the code and the animation tree will be able to tell the animation player whether to run or whether to idle for the animation. So let's click on the animation tree. Uh, the parameter we need to set once again is this X move. So if we hover over blend position, we can see the full path to it is parameter slash X underscore move slash blend underscore position. So if we go to the player script now, then after the velocity is set, from move and slide, we're going to want to set some animation parameters. So I'll create an appropriately named function set anim parameters. And we can kind of come down here, I'll just actually enter a couple lines and we'll write it right below this physics process. So function set anim parameters. So for this, we're going to need to reference the velocity. But once again, we can see that the velocity is always being set up here at the top. So we don't really need to make it a parameter inside of this function, we can just reference it directly. But what we do need right now still is a reference to the animation tree. So if you want to take one of the nodes that is inside of your scene hierarchy, and reference it really easily inside of your script, then what you can do is come up here, Let's go above the velocity. So now up here, we need to write in on ready. And what this means is that when the script starts, we need to do something. But we are putting the on ready with a variable. So when the script starts, we're doing something with this variable. And the variable is going to be animation underscore tree. So that's the variable name. But what we actually want here is a reference to the animation tree node. And the way we do that is we hit equals, and then we put dollar sign animation tree. So this is going to look in our scene hierarchy, and then try to find the node called animation tree. And then when the script starts, it's going to take that node and assign it here. And with the on ready, this gets assigned once the script starts. So now that we have the animation tree, we can set parameters on the animation tree in our set anim parameters function. So I'm going to do animation underscore tree dot set because we're setting a parameter. And now we need the path to the parameter inside of that node. So we want parameters slash uh, the name of the parameter, which I believe was called x move, and then slash blend position. And what we want to set there is going to be the sign of the velocity. So it's either going to be one, zero or negative one, and no other values. Uh, since we're not trying to actually blend that's the values we want to use. So it's 100% either idle or 100% run and not trying to do anything weird. So let's get the sign of the x velocity. And that's basically that value. And later we'll have more anim parameters, but I think that's all we need since we're just doing the x movement. So let's go ahead and hit play and we can move left and right. It's not quite working yet. And I think that's because the animation tree isn't actually active yet. So if we check uh, active the animation tree, now it's going to show the idle animation. Okay, we can also see it switches into the move animation, but only after a second has occurred. So what's going on there is that if we jump into the animation player and look at these animations, that they are only updating uh, once a second. So the full animation needs to occur currently in order for it to switch between animations. So for us, that's a pretty easy fix. We can just take the time of each of the animations and uh, set them to 0 0.05. Since all this is actually doing is making sure that it's in the right animation playing on the animation sprite. So the duration doesn't really matter here. 0 0.05 for the idle animation, the jump animation, 0 0.05. And let's make sure the run is there too. So 0, 0 0.05, now let's go ahead and hit play. So now we can move around in our game. And when we move, 
it instantly switches to that move state. And when we stop moving, it instantly moves back to the idle state. Almost instantly, anyway. It takes 0 0.05 seconds at most. So that pretty much will work just fine. Now, we also saw that the character can move left and right, but it doesn't adjust the direction it's facing based on if it's moving left and right. So we need one more function up here called adjust flip direction. And in that, we're going to take the import variable. So this is that import from right down here. Okay, we can actually stop the game so it doesn't hit breakpoints. So we need to write the code for adjust flip direction. I will add another function down here. So function adjust flip direction. It's going to take one parameter input, and I'm going to specify that that should be a vector two. So semicolon vector two, and then finish up that line with another semicolon. So what we're going to be checking in here is uh, basically the sign of the input. Now we could also check the sign of the character's current velocity. But I want the character to face the direction where the player is trying to move in, not necessarily the direction that the character's current velocity is headed in. Now, for this character, if we're just moving instantly, 200 to the left or 200 to the right, the move speed, and there's nothing else acting on it, there won't be any functional difference there. But some characters might have acceleration, where they'd be accelerating towards the right because you're holding right down it hasn't actually changed the velocity direction from left to right because it hasn't accelerated long enough for it to actually change directions on which way it's heading on the screen. So anyway, we are going to use if sign of input x is equal to one, basically meaning that uh, the value is positive towards the right direction, then the animated sprite is not going to flip its direction. So animated sprite dot flip h for horizontal is false. Our default direction is going to be false, and you can always change this. You could also have a default facing variable if you want it to be a little bit more flexible. So, we're, but we're just going to assume here that we're making our characters face right by default, so this looks correct. And our alternative is else if the sign import dot x is equal to negative one, as in the character is pressing to the left, then the animated sprite should flip to face the left direction. Now note, I don't have a else if the sign is zero here, because if there's zero, there's no input. And if there's no input, I don't want to change what direction it's facing. It should just face where it was facing uh, before the last time we let go of the keyboard. And we're actually missing this animated sprite variable. So we need another on ready var up here. So just like with the animation tree, the animated sprite is uh, nested in our hierarchy for the scene. So on ready var animated underscore sprite equals dollar sign animated sprite. And that's all we need to do to get reference to this. Uh, note that when you do things this way, you should keep the name the same, or else I think you can run into problems there. But if this is the name of the node, it's going to reference that just fine as long as that node is contained in this hierarchy. So now that should solve that problem. Let's go ahead and hit play. And uh, our character will now face the correct direction. We can also jump and while we're jumping, the character can face the right direction, but uh, it's not playing the animation for that yet. So next we need to set up the animation tree so that we can support changing into the jump animation. So let's dive back into the player scene. I'll click right up here and let's click on the player tree. So we can see currently that we only have one blend space, uh, one dimension, which is taking that X move parameter in order to go between idle and run. But we want to have a case where the character is in the air. And then if it's in the air, we should switch between rising and falling states depending on the direction of the Y velocity. So we can take the output from this one dimension. And then we can right click over here and create a blend three. So the blend three allows you to have three inputs. So we can have a negative blend value. We can have the standard input default, which in this case is going to be our X move. So. I'll just disconnect it there and connect it right in here. And then we have the positive blend value case. So I'll go ahead and call this something like y underscore sign. You could also call it y underscore velocity, but really we're going to have three values here, negative one, zero, and one. So if we have the negative blend value, that means that the character is going up on the screen since negative is up on the y axis. And that's going to mean we want the jump animation. So I can right click over here, add an animation. And we can just select jump from the list and feed that into the negative blend. Then 
the same thing if we have a positive blend characters moving down on the screen so we want to use the falling animation so right click animation switch to fall which apparently hasn't been created yet so let's go ahead and switch into animation player here and create another animation so i'll just take this idle and duplicate it so now we have idle copy i'm going to rename this to be fall as the animation and we'll just take this animation thing, change the value from idle to the fall animation. So because we duplicated the animation, we already have the time of the animation set to 0 0.05 seconds and on repeat. So that may be all we need there. So back in animation tree, we can select the fall animation. Maybe we actually need to recreate the animation box. So I'm going to right click add animation and hopefully this time it shows up here. So we have the fall animation and we want to connect this to positive blend value. So now our three possibilities are jump, allowing the blend space to pick our animation based on the X move or having fall as the other animation. So let's connect this to output here and let's move this uh, slider value around so we can see at plus one, it's a falling animation, negative one, we have the jump animation and at zero, it's going to default to whatever the output from blend space 1D is over here. So now we need to do one more thing, which is to set this Y sign value and code. So if we click on animation tree, we can expand the parameters and we can see the path to this Y sign. So it's going to be pretty much just like the X move. It's just parameters slash the name of the variable as you typed it in here. So Y underscore sign. And then finally slash blend amount. Note that for the blend space 1D, the final, uh, part of this parameter was blend position but for this blend three it's actually blend amount so you do have to be careful there okay so let's go back into the code and we have our set animation parameters uh function here let's just add another bit here so animation tree dot set parameters and we want y sign slash blend underscore amount and the value we're going to do for that is just sign velocity dot y and then i'll go ahead and save it for the sake of consistency, I guess I'll just take the X move and I'll rename that to be X sign as well. And then in the animation tree, let's just make sure that this parameter is called X sign. So if you change it in one place, make sure you change it in the other as well. And now we can go ahead and relaunch the game and see if the animations play correctly. So let's go ahead and hit play. Okay, and let's hit jump. Okay, so it switches to the jump animation and when it falls, it has the fall animation. So our character is moving left and right and jumping and falling just fine. Okay, the next thing I want to set up is a label that we can have display above our character for debugging purposes in order to know uh, kind of what state or animation the character is in at any given time. So on our character object, I'm going to right click and add a child node. And then this is going to be a label node, which is technically a control node, but you can put a control node on top of a 2D node like a kinematic body 2D if you want. Um, otherwise, generally control nodes would go on the canvas, which is kind of your UI. So I'm going to click on label here and I'm going to position this label somewhere above our player. So let's just kind of move this up here. And because it's a child of the player, it should move along with the player. So maybe for the label default, I can just write none here or something. And then we'll take the alignment for the text and center it just so it looks a little bit nicer there. So what we can do with this label in order to have it show the current state that the player is in is to create a signal. So inside of the player script, we'll create a signal here. So under set current state, whenever a new state is set, we're going to create a way to tell the label that the new state has been set. So one way would be to just directly uh, access the label up here like you did with this and then just do label.text equals whatever the new value is but another way is to create a signal so a signal basically sends out a message and anything that is attached to that signal will be able to respond to it in some way so rather than the label or the kinematic body player needing to directly know about each other the label just needs to have the label just needs to have a response function to the signal being emitted from the player, but it doesn't need to know anything about the player directly. So in a sense, it kind of decouples your code between your objects. And then the connection point is the signal itself, which you can connect to by code. And you can also connect to pretty easily by clicking on your object, going to node. And then you can see a bunch of signals here that you can respond to. 
Uh, so when we create a signal in the player script, it'll show up over here, and then we can double click in the node section and just tell any other object that we want to respond to the signal's emission to have a function to do something with the data when that signal is emitted. So let me go ahead and set it up and hopefully it'll make sense after that. So let me dive into the code here. So up here at the top, we'll create a signal for this player class to emit whenever we want to emit it inside of the script. So I'll add a couple spaces here. I'll type in signal and, and I guess I'll call it changed state. And then this is going to have a value for any other scripts like the label script to respond to. So I'm going to call it new state. And that's pretty much it for setting up this signal. Now we just need to emit this signal. So down here at the bottom, we're going to emit a new signal whenever the state changes. So emit signal, and then we put the name of the signal. So changed state, we can see that up here. And then there are some other um, default signals, I guess, for this class. But we're going to use the custom one we just created. And then we need the parameters. So I am going to put in the new state. And then we can save our script. That's pretty much it. Now, if we click on our player and we go to the node section in the top right next to inspector, we can see this player.gd has a new signal. And then we can double click on this in order to connect the signal. So clicking on the player, we can now go over to node and double click on where it says changed state here, the new signal we just created. Now we pick a script to connect it to, and it's going to create a receiver method. So, so the player emits the signal with some parameter values, and then the state label has a receiver method in order to respond to that. So let's click on state label, connect it, and now we have this function on player changed state. So whenever the player changes its state, we want to set the text of this label. So I could just do self.text. And so with the text of the label, we can set the new state there. So I'm going to do string of the new state. So whatever value gets passed here, we just want to convert it to a string if it's not a string already and set that as the text. So let's go back to our game and go ahead and hit play and see if that signal is working. Um, OK, got to get rid of that S. So let's try that again. So if we go ahead and hit play, we can see the enums being represented as their integer value. So zero for idle, one for running around, and then two for jumping. Uh, so technically it's working just fine, but here it might be more useful to show the name of the enum. So instead of saying zero for idle, we just have idle represented at the top there. So if we go back over to the player class, when we emit the signal rather than emitting uh, this new state as an integer, we can have the string value get pushed as well. So in order to do that, we're going to go up here at the top. And for this changed state, I'm actually going to have two parameters being passed. So the first one is new state string. And then the second one, which is the current one, can just be new state ID or new state integer, something along those lines. So now down here at the bottom, we're still going to pass the new state, which is the integer value. But uh, we're also going to access the string name of the state and pass that as well. So we can do that by accessing the name of the state. So this is a, a dictionary and we can just do state dot keys. And now we need to pass the array position, which is going to be wherever we find new state. So if we do that and we save, this should now pass with two arguments to the state label. So let's go in there. And we could reconnect this function if we wanted. Uh, I think we might just be able to get away with retyping the parameters. So new state ID and then new state string. And we're just going to take this value and set that to be the new text. So now our signal is going to give us two parameters to work with. And we only care about the string because that's what we want to show above the player for debugging purposes. So let's go ahead and see if that actually works. I'm going to hit play. And now we get into the game. Okay, we have idle. Okay, idle, run, and jump. So that should be a lot more helpful than just having a 0, a 1, or a 2 appear above the player. So now that our character can move for the most part, one of the things we're going to want to add is going to be a following camera. So currently, the camera we set up is just aimed at this one area, and it's static. So if we hit play, it's not going to follow our character at all. So our character can run off the screen. And that could be a problem if we get to this part 
where we can't see our player anymore. Now, in some cases, you may want to have a static camera depending on the style of your game or the specific scene. So you could actually switch between different static cameras if you just wanted to move from screen to screen, uh, kind of like as individual stages. But if you do want to have a follow camera, let me show you how to do it. So we have our level and then the player down here. And we need to add a remote transform to the player in order for the camera 2D to track. So if I right click on player and add a child node, we can look for that remote transform node. Just type in REM. And here we have remote transform 2D. So I'm going to add that in. And now this remote transform 2D node has a property called remote path. So basically the remote path tells a different object to look at this transform for tracking it. And in this case, that's going to be the camera. So let's assign the camera 2D. And uh, that will basically be all we have to do to make sure the camera follows this remote transform around. And by default, the smoothing isn't on. I'll toggle that off for right now and hit play. So if you don't have smoothing, then the camera is going to basically perfectly follow your character around. And there won't be any lag between your character's movement and the camera. So in some circumstances, you might want there to be a little bit of a following lag. So you can check enabled here. And the less lag you want, the more speed you're going to increase. So if you want it to be very slow at following the player around, then you would want a lower speed. This defaults to five. So let's go ahead and test it with 10. So let's hit play and move around. And you can see a lot of jankiness, right? So one setting that we can use that will help correct that a lot is the GPU pixel snapping. So if we go into the project menu, top left, and then project settings, we can search for pixel snapping. And I believe it's under rendering 2D. So we can just check this on and that will fix a lot of our display problems. So I'll close that. Let's go ahead and hit play again. And this time when we move around the screen, it looks much, much better. So you know, once again, if uh, that following is too fast, you can try lowering the speed down. So five is the default. Let's show what that looks like. And here you basically have that. So if I stop moving, you can definitely see the lag there. So it's kind of up to you what your personal preferences are going to be for uh, your game style. Let's go ahead and close that out there. And I guess for right now, I'm just going to put it back to 10. Um, so that's basically all you need, just a remote transform and tell the camera to look at it. And you'll basically be good to go for a follow camera in Godot. Okay, so currently our character can uh, move around the screen, it can jump. But uh, what we might want to do is add a little bit of extra functionality to our character. So in order to let him move around the level a little bit easier, let's go ahead and add in double jumping. So I'm going to exit the play mode and let's go into the script for our character. So inside of the script, we can set up a new state and have it switch to that with pick next state just like before. So what we're basically going to do is if the input is pressed, we're going to jump. But in this case, it's going to be a double jump because the character is already in the air. So that is going to. So for our pick next state, it's going to be similar to right here where if jump is pressed, we enter jump. But we're going to be checking when the character is in the air. And if the character is in the air and we press jump, then we're going to do uh, a double jump only as long as the character hasn't hit its max jumps. So if is on floor is set to false means it's going to come down here. So we can just set up the if input dot is action just pressed and then we look for jump. And now we're going to switch to the double jump state, which we haven't created yet. So state dot double jump, double underscore jump. And I'll scroll up here to the top and we'll just add that to our list of states. So double jump. So what do we want to happen when the jump is pressed? Well, we want it to jump just like we did with the regular jump state. We also want it to jump when we do a double jump. Now, this could be exactly like the first jump where we just do the negative jump impulse or you could have a separate function for a double jump and maybe that has a different jump impulse value. For right now, I'll just set it up down here to just do a normal jump in terms of its movement. So how we can add double jump to this little match statement here is we just put a comma and then we do state dot double jump. And I think we can have a space there as well. Hit save. So now if the state is jump or double jump, we're going to run the jump function. So you could just have like a list of different states you want to match certain actions to.
Now, of course, this only matches the movement of it. We'll still need to set up the animation tree for the uh, switching to the double jump animation. But one other condition I want to add to this is action just pressed is to see if the jumps are above the maximum number of jumps because our character probably can jump two times, but usually not more than that. So we can have a max jumps variable, could set it to two or three, however many you want. But if we don't have that set, the character will just be able to keep jumping forever. So we can actually just show that in play. I'll go ahead and hit the play button and let's start jumping. So I can just keep spamming the jump button and just go way above the level. Generally speaking, um, that would be game breaking. So let's go ahead and close out of that and have a max jumps variable up here. So I'm going to do export integer var max jumps, and I'm going to default that to two. And then whenever we run into the situation where we could do a jump, we make sure that it hasn't already reached this amount of max jumps. So that's going to be down here when we're considering doing a double jump. We want the and condition that uh, jumps is less than or equal to max jumps. And as we know, whenever we run the jump function, that's going to increment. So we hit jump once to get into the air and it should go to one. We do the double jump and it should get to two and we shouldn't be able to make any more jumps until we hit the ground and then is on floor is true and jumps get set to zero. So let's go ahead and hit play and while on the ground so I can jump once and I can hit spacebar twice to double jump. Okay, looks like we can still jump forever. So let's take a look at that. So I think I'll just debug it by printing the number of jumps to the console log down here, the output. And let's see what happens when we hit play and then we uh, keep hitting the jump button. So two, three, Okay, it looks like we can go to three, but not higher than that. So yeah, this should actually be less than the number of max jumps. And now the character should only be able to jump twice. So let's replay the game. One, two. Okay, one, two, three. Nope, doesn't work. Okay, so we can only do two jumps. We have double jumping, but it doesn't go more than that. So the next thing we need to do is to set up the double jump animation to work with the animation tree. So if we take a look at the animated sprite in the player scene, we can see uh, taking a look at these animations that the double jump animation here is a somersault so i'm going to say that the character should only do one somersault whenever we hit the spacebar to do a double jump so therefore this is going to be uh kind of more what we would call a one shot animation and we can set that up quite easily in the animation tree as well so a one shot is going to play once and then it's going to resume other animations uh, depending on other parameters that we have set. So this one shot is going to take priority over the standard jump, fall, uh, idle, and run animations. So if we right click on the node graph here, we can add a one shot. So you'll see that it has two inputs, one for the one shot and one for your standard input. So I'm going to take this connector between uh, the blend three and our output, and I'm going to redirect that into the input. And then the one shot is going to connect to the output. So this is going to mean that the one shot takes priority over anything else over here if the one shot is active and we know it's active because of this little boolean parameter that we can set when this is on we want it to play the double jump animation so i'm going to right click in the node graph go to animation and then here let's select the double jump animation connect that into the one shot and let's just rename the parameter that uh, this one shot is going to use so if we click on animation tree we can see the one shot parameter here let's give it a name that is more specific so i'll just call it double underscore jump I think that's about as clear as I can make it. And if we hover over active, we can see that the full path to this parameter is parameters slash double underscore jump slash active. So we're going to need to set that in code in a minute. But before we do that, when we have a one shot node, there's two properties that we should change. So that's fade in time and fade out time. So for our pixel art animation, we don't want there to be a time delay between entering a animation and actually starting to play it. So we want to take these and set it to zero for both of them. So when the one shot is active, switching over should be immediate. Okay, so now we can jump over to the code. So let's take a look at this. Uh, we are going to, like before, need to use the animation tree and set a parameter. But this set anim parameters function is being run every uh, physics process update. So that would be a set number of times per second. But the thing is, we only actually need to set that animation parameter to true specifically when we are doing double jump. So it would be very redundant to put it in here and do some kind of check and then set it to active or false on every single second. So let's actually come down here to the bottom and a much better place would be to put it in the setter. So when we enter a new state with set current state, 
uh, we can have that parameter be set when we enter the double jump state. So if you haven't already separated your state.jump and state.doublejump matching, you can do that now. So I'm going to put a colon here. I'm going to take state double jump, and I'm going to move that down below. So this is now going to be its own separate thing, state.doublejump, colon. And of course, we're still going to want it to do the jump, the function of the jump. But we're also going to want to take the animation tree and set the parameter. So the parameter's name was parameters slash double underscore jump slash active. And because we just entered double jump, we want to set that to true. So this basically tells the animation tree, hey, play the one shot. We're going to do the double jump somersault because we're now in the double jump state. So the last thing we need to do is to figure out how to exit this one shot. So the script is going to set this to true, but uh, we also need to set it to off so it can go play the other animations after it's done. So we can do that in the animation player. And if you find the double jump animation, it should be set to 0.3 seconds. So it's playing six frames at 20 frames per second. So we make the animation 0.3 seconds long. And uh, we also want to turn off animation looping if that's on over here on the right, uh, because this is only supposed to play once and then finish. Now we can zoom in a bit here and we're going to want to add another track. We're going to set the parameter on the animation tree for the one shot to false when this animation is finished. And of course, there's multiple ways you could do that. You could do that in the code here as well, but this seems more convenient to me. So I'm going to add track, property track, animation tree, choose the parameter, parameters double jump active. And now we need to set a keyframe for that. So over here at 0.3 seconds, when this animation is done, right click, insert key, and it's already going to default to off. So basically, at this point in time, it's taking the parameter, the double jump active, and setting that to false, indicating that the animation is done. So after that, this one shot will be false, and it will resume going back to the blend three to pick what should be the output. So if all goes well, that should be all we actually need to do to set up this one shot. Let's hit play and see where we're at. Okay, animation still working. We have jump, and there's our double jump. Working really nicely. Um, one thing to note, the way the current code is written, a uh, player can jump up to two times before it touches the ground. So if you actually fall off here, that doesn't count as a jump. So if I fall off and do a double jump, we can actually do two double jumps in the air. Of course, it's only going to play once if the first double jump is still running. Let's see. Okay, but yeah, if the animation's finished and you do that second aerial jump, then it will do that second animation there. So just something to think about. You may want your character to be able to do that, where uh, regardless of how it got in the air, you jump twice, or you might want it to be limited that a character can only do one double jump in the air, period, regardless of if it fell off the edge or jumped into the air. Um, in which case, you could set up a variable like has double jump occurred, and if that's false, then allow the double jump, and once you enter double jump, set it to true, and only reset that when, it, when the character hits the ground. Otherwise, you might actually like it, when uh, your character can jump twice regardless, it might make sense for some games. So just something to think about. Next, let's create a enemy for our platformer game. So we're going to use the art for Angry Pig for this. And I'm going to open up Art Pixel Adventure 2 enemies. And there we have our different character sprites. So we can click on any of those and see basically a preview of the different animations over on the top right. So to create our new enemy, it's going to be kind of similar to creating our player objects. So we need to create a new scene. And the root of that scene is, of course, going to be a kinematic body 2D, meaning that how it moves is going to be something we have to write and set up for ourselves in a script. So let's go to scene and new scene. And then for here, let's other node and then kinematic body 2D. So for this kinematic body, let's double click it. And we can see it's basically centered at the scene root at position 0x and 0y. That's what we want. And let's add a animated sprite to it. So add child node and then animated sprite. And once again, the reason we're using animated sprites is because for this art pack, all of the animations are broken into their own individual sprite textures. So animated sprites allow us to use separate textures for different animations, much easier than it would be with a sprite node. So let's take the animated sprite and I will uh, create some animations for it. Let's go to the right side. So frames will hit on the empty button and click new sprite frames. Let's open that up. And then we have our animations window down here at the bottom. Going to default everything to 20 FPS. 
and let's rename the first animation to idle. So we'll click on this button over here that looks like a grid to add frames from a sprite sheet. And we'll go into Art, Pixel Adventure 2, Enemies, Angry Pig, and then Idle. So we can just kind of quickly count how many frames are in here. Got nine. So nine for horizontal, one for vertical. And then on the right side, select Clear All Frames, Add Frames. And if we hit Playing, we should be able to see our little idle animation there. So now we just need to repeat that for the other animations. So let's add a run animation. Okay, and run will take, of course, the run frames. So let's see, three, six, nine, twelve. So twelve horizontal, one vertical. Select all, add, and make the speed twenty FPS. So let's add that from the character. Uh, this looks like about sixteen by one. We'll select all, add them, and we can just test that it's working by um, having it auto play on that animation. Just making sure that everything seems centered correctly. So it should be pretty obvious. Okay, next let's add. Hit one and hit two for when the enemy takes damage. Okay, and that looks like five frames. Select clear all. And then we need to do 20 FPS. Ah, okay. It looks like I messed up adding it. So let's delete all the frames and make sure it's hit one, five horizontal, one vertical, and add those in. Okay, that's what we should be seeing. Now let's add in hit two. So I'm going to add the same thing, five frames. So five horizontal, one vertical, add them in and make sure the FPS is 20. So we can go between our different animations and everything should be playing smoothly. So the next thing we're going to need to do is determine how this character is going to move. So my idea for this angry pig, and let's actually rename it there and save it as a new scene. So angry pig, we'll save it into characters because we can create an enemies folder here just in case we end up with a lot. And then angry pig scene, we'll save it in there. So my concept for this pig character is going to be that by default, it's going to walk between two different waypoints we set. So it can only move left and right, no vertical movement, at least without gravity. And if a player is detected, then instead of walking, it's going to change to a angry run. So we put that on run later on increase the character's movement speed. And if the enemy here runs into the player, then the player will take some damage. And that'll basically be the habits for the angry pigs. So a really simple enemy here. So I'm going to put the default state back in idle. And we can add a script to this character. So I'll just right click attach script. And this will be called angry pig.gd. So for right now, this will just extend kinematic body 2D in the future we might want to use inheritance to have a base enemy script and then other enemies can inherit from that and basically gain some of the basic functionality so we don't need to write it on every enemy. But for right now, we'll just put everything in the angry pig. And then if we need to uh, take it into a higher level enemy class later, then we'll do that separately in a different video. So right now for the movement I talked about, we're going to have to set up some kind of waypoint for our character. So if you haven't already, let's go ahead and save the uh, scene as a scene in the enemies folder. So I'm gonna go up here, save scene as, and I'm putting it in characters enemies as you can see here. Also make sure that you have your script saved to the same folder for organization reasons. And now let's go to level one and I'm just gonna drop a copy of the enemy into here. So in order to have our character move, we're gonna have to give it some waypoints in order to move towards. So there's a few ways we could do this. I think what might make sense is to set up some waypoints within this level that our enemies can use as a point to move towards and then assign it as a list. Whenever we create an instance of our object, we just be able to assign them over here in an array for what positions should it move towards. So in the level, I'm going to right click up here and I'm gonna add a a uh, new node. So we'll start with the node 2D as a parent uh, because we do want this list of waypoints to move along with the level if we ever move to the level's position for any reason. So I'm going to call this waypoints. And then under waypoints, we're going to add some position 2Ds. So for these, I guess I could just rename them waypoint one and then duplicate them a few times and we'll just get waypoint one, two, three, so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, just make sure as you're dragging them around that they aren't children of each other. So they should be their own thing. And then we can set up the location for these waypoints. 
when we're looking at this stack of objects and we want to make sure that we're moving the one we have selected, you can hold Alt down and then that'll make sure that waypoint one gets selected and moved because we have waypoint one up here. So if we hold Alt down, we grab the right one. Let's add a waypoint. Let's just say right about there. And then let's go waypoint two and we'll just drag this out of the stack to right there. So our character will be able to pace back and forth between there and there. And then let's get waypoint three. No need for this yet, but maybe for the future, it'll be more relevant and we'll just pop it over there. So now our angry pig is going to need a list of position 2Ds to be its waypoints. So let's open up the script and let's create a export var. So this is going to be a array of position 2D and we'll call it var waypoints. Let's try saving that. Okay, so it doesn't actually look like using an array of the position 2D node type is going to work for us. So another alternative in my head is to use node path here. So uh, node paths is going to be the relative path to the node. And then when the game's actually running, we can get the node from that node path and then get the position of those nodes in the game world while the game's running. So with this type, we should be able to increase the size of our array over here on the right and then assign the different nodes. So we want waypoint one and then waypoint two. And then that'll be it for this character. So now in the Angry Pig script, we need to make sure that when the game's running, that our character is moving back and forth between those two points. And it's going to start with the first waypoint. So we should have a variable here to keep track of which waypoint it's at. So let's do our waypoint index. And this is going to start at zero, which is going to mean the first waypoint in the list. And so in addition to that, we can have a waypoint position. So this will be the X, Y coordinates for where this uh, waypoint is at. So we only need to get it once. And then every time the physics process function is running, it can just move towards this position until it gets to that position. So speaking of which, we're not going to use process.delta. We're going to want function physics process.delta. So let's pass that for right now. So when the game starts, let's actually go ahead and get the position of the first waypoint. So we're going to do on ready to specify that when the game starts, something's going to happen here, or more specifically when the script starts, uh, which is presumably when this character is loaded into the level. So the waypoint position, we're going to be doing a get node, and we're going to have the waypoints array. So up there, and we're going to need to put in the index we're trying to get. So waypoint index at the start of this game, assuming this waypoint index is zero, this should get the node at that location. So then after we get the node, we're just going to need the position of that node. So let's put that in here. And we could go ahead and test that by doing a print on the waypoint position. Then we can launch this level with that angry pig in it. So currently the angry pig has no collision shapes, but that should be fine for right now. So let's go ahead and hit play. Okay, and we can see uh, we're actually getting the position of that waypoint, which is good. So we can actually turn this into a function that we can use every time we need to get and set the new waypoint position. We could actually make it a uh, setter function. So let's do set waypoint, I guess we'll say index. And then we'll make that function down here. So function set waypoint index. Okay. And of course, we would be passing the value of the new index. So uh, waypoint index is going to be equal to that value. But then uh, we're going to also say the waypoint position. Well, basically just this line up here. So let's pop that in there and then replace value with the waypoint index. At this point, uh, saying this or that would be the same here, but we'll just use the value that was passed into this function just in case. So now whenever we set the waypoint index, we also set the waypoint position. So I guess we would actually be able to erase that, make this an on ready var. So when uh, the game loads, it's going to set the value to zero and we can get rid of this bit since that's going to be assigned already. Theoretically, this should be a vector two, I believe. And let's go ahead and see if that works. So we'll see if we get to this point when the game launches. So now that this function is there, we can actually just have uh, this bit get uh, removed and we don't need this to be on ready. But what we can actually do, and we'll actually remove that as well. We'll just have when the game starts here, we'll just set the waypoint index to the starting value. So let's say starting waypoint. And we could actually make this a 
export var. So I'm going to make this export int var starting waypoint. And we're going to default that to zero. So now when the script starts, it's going to start the waypoint index off at whatever the starting waypoint is. And as a result of setting that, it's also going to set the waypoint position. Okay, so we actually need to put self.waypointindex here to make sure that runs correctly. Okay, and now it gets down here. So it's saying invalid get index, of course, because I set this to five for testing. Now we can control it with the starting waypoint and that value can be set over here. So if you want the angry pig to not move to the first waypoint, but the second waypoint, you could just specify the array position here. And aside from that, basically anytime we change the waypoint index, we're also going to change the waypoint position as well. So now we just need to set up a move speed and make sure that the character is moving between those two points. So let's go up here and create a move speed variable. So I'll do export float bar move speed. And I'll just arbitrarily set this to 200 for now. Uh, for the future, let's also, while we're at it, add a run speed. So this will be the fast speed when the angry pig is actually angry. So let's do run speed and 300. And now during physics process, we want the character to move between those two points. So we're going to need to look at the direction between the character and the current waypoint. So of course, as with many things, there's a few different ways we could do this. So let's start by getting the direction between the current character, the angry pig, and the waypoint. So I'm going to make a var direction, and then let's do the self.position. And then for that vector, we're going to do direction 2, and then we need to give it another vector. So of course, we need the uh, waypoint position. OK, and now that we have a direction, we can also get the distance. So let's actually make it distance x, because we only really care about the horizontal distance, not including how far it is vertically, because our character is never going to be jumping up. So let's use the absolute value of the self position x, and then minus the absolute value of not self position x, but uh, waypoint position dot x. So this should be the distance between the two points, uh, not counting for direction, and then this will be the direction. So what we're going to do is if the distance to the waypoint is above a certain threshold, then we're going to keep moving towards that waypoint. And if it's below that threshold, we're going to switch to the next waypoint as something to move towards. So if the distance x is greater, and we could say greater or equal then, um, and we could call this something like waypoint threshold, or actually waypoint arrived distance, I think makes a little bit more sense in my head. So if the distance is greater than the waypoint arrived distance, then we're going to move towards waypoint else. We're going to switch waypoints. So let's put that waypoint arrived distance up here. So export float var waypoint arrived distance. And I'll just create that as 10 for right now. So to move towards the waypoint, first, we got to get a velocity. And we could actually make this a variable up here, in case we need to reference it in other functions. So the velocity is going to be equal to a vector two. And the x value is going to be the move speed times the sine of direction dot x. So regardless of what this exact direction value is, we only care about whether it's positive, negative, or zero. So basically, sine will kind of convert that to either positive one, negative one, or zero, which means that the move speed is going to be consistently either positive 200, negative 200, or zero. And then let's add a comma in there. So the second value will be a gravity, but I guess for right now, we're just going to... Actually, we could just basically look into the player script. So we'll use this same kind of thing. Let's see. I'll just copy this whole line here. So the current velocity and we add the gravity, but we cap it at the terminal velocity. And this will just be consistent between our player and the other enemies in the game. So we just basically slap that right in there. And now our character has gravity based on the game settings. Okay, so let's move and slide our kinematic body. And we're going to move it with the velocity. And we do want to say vector two dot up uh, probably won't be too relevant for an enemy like this. But if we ever need to check if 
the kinematic body is on the ground, then having the up direction set will be important. So better to have that than not to have it, I think. So otherwise, we want to switch waypoints. So we got to figure out which waypoint we're switching to. And to know that, we have to know the size of the array, uh, basically how many waypoints are currently in it. So just in case this is something that would change during the game, I guess we'll get it once every time it gets to this point. So let's find the size of that array. So num waypoints equals waypoints dot size. And and then we'll check the current index. So if waypoint index is less than the number of waypoints, then we're going to increase it. So waypoint index equals, or rather, plus equals one. Else, uh, if the waypoint index is actually equal or above the number of waypoints, then we need to reset it back to zero. So waypoint index equals zero. And then this bit will allow us to loop through the waypoints. One thing we're going to need is to initialize this velocity uh, variable to a vector 2.0. Okay, so that means this is going to start with the value 0, 0. And also, our character is actually going to need to have a collision shape in order for any of these physics functions like move and slide to work on it. So let's go ahead and add a collision shape to the uh, angry pig. So collision shape 2D. Okay, and let's give it a, let's do a rectangular shape. Keep it nice and simple. And then let's increase the size of this collision shape so that it can uh, interact with the ground. And I'm going to hold it out, stretch it out a little bit. And I'm going to go into the transform and adjust its position down a few pixels. I'm um, going to be pretty important that this collision shape equals the ground feet position. So let's actually hit play here. And we can see our angry pig was able to move to this left position. So it's correctly moving and sliding along the ground. The collision shape seems to be roughly good. It's got the right pixel right above the ground there. So that's all good. And now we just have to figure out why didn't it switch to the second position. This angry pig has two positions here. So I'm going to set a couple breakpoints whenever the waypoint index changes. Let's hit play and let's see what happened. OK, so we do get here to where the waypoint index increases by one. So let's dive into this next function. OK, we're not using self.waypointindex. So we need to do that for the setter function to actually trigger there. So now we can hit play and see if this is going to work. OK, invalid get index 2 on array. So it should not have gotten here with 2. If the waypoint index is less than the number of waypoints, ah, OK. So it should be number of waypoints minus 1. OK. Because this is a count, and then this is an array position. And remember that arrays start from 0, and counting starts from 1. So we need to put a minus 1 there to adjust for that. So now if we hit play, our character should be able to... OK, so looking at the code, our pig gets stuck over here. And then, as we can see, it's constantly switching between the first and the second waypoint. OK, so here we can see in the code that um, this bit right here isn't working. So we can see down here that when... Uh, the first waypoint is reached, it switches to the second waypoint, and then this distance x is a negative 173. So we don't want this to ever be negative. So I guess a better way of doing this would actually be to get two vectors and compare them with the distance 2 function. So let's do a vector 2 of the self.position.x, and we'll say 0 for the y, and we're going to do that for both of the vectors. So I'll say distance 2, and then parameter vector 2 waypoint position dot x and then zero. OK, so we actually need uh, waypoint underscore position dot x. So uh, when we do it this way, basically we're creating two new vectors and the y value is the same. So the only thing to compare on is going to be the x positions of those two vectors. And a distance two is going to be direction nonspecific. So when we do it this way, we should get a plus 173 value instead of a negative. And we could actually, well, we don't really need to. We can just kind of hit play and see if it works. So let's hit play. OK, and now we can see our characters actually moving between the two points. Um, so that's uh, basically what we want. I mean, that's moving pretty fast. So I might want to tone that down quite significantly. So let's go to the move speed, make it 100, the run speed 200. And also, uh, we do want to flip the direction of that angry pig. So. When it's moving to the left, we flip 
to the left and when it's moving to the right we flip to the right so we can do that in the code pretty easily like we were doing that before so i guess we could say down here if we're going to make a move then we can uh, flip the direction so let's get access to the sprite up here we'll do var animated sprite equals dollar sign animated sprite so that's referencing this right here ah it does need the on ready in front of it so animated sprite dot flip h is going to be true in one condition and that condition is going to be if the ah the sign of the direction x so we should make a variable for that so var uh, direction x sign equals sign of direction dot x now we can pop that in right here and right down here if this is if this is negative one then we will flip it so if it's negative one then that means we're going left which means we want to flip the sprite horizontally else if the sign is one then that means we're moving to the right which means we want to have it turn off the flipping and we're assuming currently that uh, the sprite face is right by default um, otherwise this would be in reverse so if the character is moving to the left then it's flipping to the left and if it's moving to the right then it's going back to the default of no flipping and if it's not moving at all where the direction x sign would be zero then we're not controlling the flipping because if it's not moving then we shouldn't really be changing the direction so uh, now we can go ahead and restart the game let's see okay yeah. so the flipping's working except it's in reverse so let me take a look there i guess this is a left by default facing character so uh, what we could actually do is um put an export boolean just in case we were making a new character or the sprites changed we would want to be able to set the default flip direction so down here we can say faces right and and the reverse of faces right down here and let's uh stop the game from running so if the sprite face is right by default then we want to turn off the flipping while it's facing to the right and if it doesn't face the right by default so if this is set to false so it faces left by default uh, then that's going to be false and we don't want to flip it so basically as long as we set this boolean to the right value the character should face the right direction when it's moving so we're turning off faces right let's hit play we can see that our instance of the pig is able to go between the two waypoints it's uh kind of working in general what there are obviously some problems like running into the player and you know being stuck there we probably don't actually want there to be a, a hard collision with the player but rather just maybe dealing damage to the player and then passing right through it and also we need to add in the angry run state and also make sure that it's animating correctly so at this point, there's a few adjustments I'd like to make to the angry pig. First off, it needs to have some kind of detection zone so that when the angry pig actually sees the player, that it can switch to its angry run mode and move faster. Uh, secondly, as you can see, currently none of the animations are playing, so we'll have to set up an animation tree for the angry pig. And we'll also need to start setting up physics layers so that when the angry pig runs into the player, it won't actually stop the physics body from moving. So for this game, we're going to make it so that the player and enemies can move through each other. Of course, they'll still be able to do damage to each other, but we'll need to set that up by starting to use physics layers. So we might not let the pig collide with the player layer, but there might be a damage box on the pig, which will detect if it can do damage to the player and then do damage to the player when the player enters that specific zone. And so once we have the angry pig set up with the animation tree, we'll also need to script out the states and code for that to correspond with. And that's pretty much what we're going to take care of in this video. So let's jump into the scene for our angry pig. And I am going to add a new area to it. So I'm going to add a child node and we're looking for a area 2D. So we could just type that into the search, add it in. And this area 2D is going to need a collision shape of its own. So I'm going to right click on it, add a collision shape 2D. So this can be whatever you want it to be. And uh, this zone is going to basically detect when the player is nearby so that the angry pig can go into its angry enraged state. So I'm going to rename the area 2D uh, angry detection zone 
because I think that just makes a little bit more sense here. We'll make it so that the character will enter that state, even if the player is directly above the head. So I'm actually going to use an oval shape. So on the right, where we have inspector, let's change the shape to uh, capsule shape. And then I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees because I want it to be more wide than tall. So let's go to the transform 90 for the rotation degrees. Okay, and then let's uh, expand this to a reasonable amount. So it can be basically as big or as small as you want it to be. And as you play test, of course, you'll want to adjust that. You could even have uh, custom zone sizes for different variations of the enemy. Okay, and for this angry detection zone, the area 2D, I'm going to I'm going to turn monitorable off because I don't actually need this zone to be detected by anything else in the game. We only need monitoring on because this zone is going to check for the player, but nothing needs to check or care about this zone. So it seems pointless to actually have it on. And in fact, why use extra resources when we don't have to? So that's why I'm leaving that off. And now we can set up a node graph for a animation tree on this angry pig. So like the player, we're going to have to right click and add some nodes. So let's add a animation tree. And then let's also add in an animation player. So this animation player is going to have all the animations set up that correspond with our animations on the animated sprite. So let's create hit one. So let's create hit one, hit two, idle, run, and walk. So in the animation setup, let's do new, hit one. And uh, then we can add a property track. So the property is going to be animated sprite animation. And on frame zero, we want it to play hit one as the animation. And we will default these animations to be 0 0.05 seconds long and on repeat. So now we can uh, duplicate this. And of course, next will be hit two. So let's change this animation to the hit two animation. Duplicate it again, rename it. So we'll do idle, run, and walk animation. Okay, so that's the animation setup. Now we need to connect the logic in a tree. So for the animation tree, let's create a animation node blend tree, just like the player. So in order to make the angry detection zone work, we can set up a blend space 1D, which will give us a variable that we can set to control whether the character should be walking or running. So let's change the variable here to player detected. And this will kind of be like a Boolean. I'll either set it to one or zero. And if we open the editor, we can add in the points. So at zero, we want it to be a walk animation, meaning the player isn't detected. And then at one, we want it to be run. And just in case, let's also make negative one a run as well. But I think we're just going to have two values, either zero or one. So now that we have the simple blend space set up, we can connect that to the output. If we make it one, uh, we get the run animation. And if we have zero, we get the walk animation. So now we just need to check if the player is detected in code and then set the parameter at the correct times. So one way that we can have the angry detection zone tell the angry pig when there is the player inside of the zone is to use signals. So we can set up a receiver method by going to node over here on the right. And then we can use body shape entered and body shape exited. So I'll double click on each of them and we'll add a on angry detection zone body shape entered to the angry pig script. And let's do that for both of them. So double click, connect it to the script. Okay, and uh, that's basically all we're going to need from the zone in order for things to work in here. So when a body shape has entered, it should be a player. And we're going to set that up with layers in a minute. And as a single player game, there should be only one character in that layer at any given time, one or zero. So we can just set animation parameters on the animation tree in order to take care of this. So if you don't already have the on ready for animation tree equals animation tree up here at the top, you can go ahead and set that up. And then down here, we can do animation tree dot set the parameter. So we're going to do parameters slash uh, player detected slash blend position. OK, and we're going to want to set that to one. And then when the player leaves that area, we want to set the parameter to zero. So we select all this, we paste it in here, and uh, we set that to zero. Now, if we were doing a multiplayer game, we might need a little bit more elaborate code because there might be multiple players. But in this case, it will work perfectly fine because there's only one player in the game at any given time. So this just simplifies it for us. Now, if we go to the angry detection zone and the inspector, we can set up its collision layers. But before we set up the collision layers, we should actually define what those are. So in project, project settings, we can go down to, I think it's under physics. So 2D physics down here under layer names. 
let's write some layer names. So layer one, we can make world. And then for now, let's go down here to, let's say layer four and write uh, player and enemy. So we have a few layers set up. And for each of these layers, we can have an object collide on a certain layer and we can also allow it to be found by other objects looking to that layer so let's close out the layers here um, so we have the layer option under collision so the layer is where other objects can detect this object in and collide with it or do whatever they need to so for the angry detection zone we actually aren't going to want a layer right here because nothing really needs to collide with it we're just using this to trigger events, which is basically making the pig run. But the mask is going to be where we're checking uh, for these events to happen. So for us, that's not going to be the world layer, which we just set up as one, but it's actually going to be layer, was it four? Which is going to be the um, player layer. If we click away and click back, it should update down here. So yeah, layer four is the player layer. So with this angry detection zone, we're only looking to the player layer, and there should only be one player in the game. Therefore, that's going to be the only object that can trigger the receiver methods down here to set the animation tree to one or zero, depending on if we, if we need it to run or if we need it to walk. So if we save that, now we just need to define the player as a uh, player layer object. And we should also just update the enemy to be an enemy layer object while we're at it. So uh, under angry pig, the kinematic body, go to collision, uh, whoops, physics body collision. And then we're going to change the layer here to enemy. Uh, we're still going to use world as the mask. So I guess what we're going to define the world layer as is all of the ground, the platforms, the tiles, things that the normal physics interaction should occur in. So the kinematic bodies are going to keep looking to the world so that those collisions can still happen. As a enemy, the player won't be able to directly collide with this kinematic body. And this kinematic body won't be able to directly collide with the player because we're not checking the player mask. We're only checking the world mask. So let's go dive into the player again. So the player scene, we click on the player kinematic body, uh, physics body 2D. And we change this from a world object to a player object. And it is going to be looking to the world layer in order for collisions to happen. So now when we run the game, if I've set everything up right, the pig should not collide with the player and the player should not collide with the pig, but the 2D detection zone should be able to detect the player so that it can tell the angry pig script if it should be running or if it should be walking. So let's go ahead and hit play and see if all of that works. So currently uh, the player isn't in the zone, so it's just walking. So at least our animation there is playing correctly. Let's move. Uh, kind of right above it and we can see that the animation is changing so that is actually good for us uh, now the last thing we need to do is to basically control the movement speed so that it, it does a little bit more than just change colors here so let's stop the game from running there and let's open up the angry pig script so when these properties get set up for the animation tree we can also set something up for the angry pig so just like the player let's create a enum representing the state that the pig is in so up here at the top, I'll do enum state, and currently we'll just have walk and run. So up here at the top, we can create another enum uh, for our angry pig, just like we did for the player. So our states are going to be our walk, and for the run state, we could just call it run, and that would be more consistent with everything in the game. I guess I guess we can do that. I mean, I was also thinking we could call it like mad or angry, but uh, maybe if we just call it run. That'll make more sense when we actually look at the animation player and the animation tree as well. So let's set that state down here. And of course, we need a variable to store the current state. So variable state is, or rather, variable current state. And we'll default that to state.walk, uh, since the character is going to be walking as soon as the game starts. And let's also make these states capital, since they're constant throughout the game. And state.walk down there. Okay. So now we can take the current state and set that to state.run if it's uh, getting that one value parameter. So it's going to be running down there in the animation tree. And then current state equals state.walk if it's uh, set to zero. So now those are going to be consistent. And now we just need to kind of control the move speed based on what that state is. So we can change the move speed actually up here to a walk speed. Okay, and then... 
this will still be move speed, but the actual move speed that we're going to be updating on every frame is going to be a new variable that we create here. So this is going to be a vector 2. And then we can run a match on the current state. So if we match the current state for state.walk, then the move speed is going to be equal to the walk speed. And actually, uh, this, this should be a float because we only care about the x movement. Okay, and this should be an underscore. Then we just need state.run down here. And of course, we're going to set the move speed equals to the run speed. So now it should be a lot more obvious if the uh, character is walking and, you know, kind of casual about things or running and trying to chase the player down. So let's go ahead and hit play and see if that all works up to this point. So uh, as we get closer to the enemy, we can see he moves ridiculously fast. Um, and as we step away, then he just goes back to his green state. So there's this kind of arbitrary zone that as soon as the player enters, it triggers the pig to move really fast. So we might want to churn down the numbers on the movement, but as far as the detection goes, this is working correctly. So I'll go up here and uh, make the character move a little bit slower so it's a little bit more fair to the player. So in this part, we're going to be creating the ability for the player to attack the enemy, in this case, the angry pig. But really, I think we're going to set it up so that we have a enemy based script that characters like the angry pig and other enemies can be based on so that we don't have to keep retyping the same code over and over again, basically inheritance. So the attack we're just going to give this character is the ability to bounce on top of enemies, deal damage to them and then bounce off. Not the most original, but it'll work for now. So let's dive into the angry pig character again. And we're going to be creating a new area 2D. This area 2D is basically going to be a hurt box, an area where when the character lands on top of, if it enters that zone, it can check to see if the player is on top. And if that is the case, deal damage and do the little bounce animation. So in the process of setting that up, since we can see that there's already a few collision shapes on our character that might get in the way, it might be a good idea to lock them into place. So if we click on a layer, we can click on this little lock symbol to make it so that we can't accidentally move them. And I'm just going to do that with uh, all three of these, the area 2D, the collision shape 2D, and the angry pigs um, kinematic body collision shape 2D. So now let's add in another area 2D. So I'm going to right click on the angry pig, add a child node, area 2D, and then let's give this a shape as well. So collision shape 2D. And to make this simple, we're going to use a rectangle shape. So this rectangle shape is going to be very small and it's going to be positioned right here at the top of the pig's head. So I might take the area 2D and move that up, and which will also move the collision shapes location as well. Or you could just move the collision shape directly. Uh, however you want to get it up there is fine. So let's see if we make that 12. Uh, maybe we want negative 12 there. And let's adjust that negative 10 seems good. So now let's take the collision shape and adjust its extents. So the y extents, I'm just going to want that to be one. Uh, so we can see that this is a very, very small collision shape. And this area 2D, I will call a uh, jump hurt box. And I might rename this collision shape, uh, jump collision shape. Just so that like when we hover over it, we can actually see a name that makes a little bit more sense. So I think that might be a little bit helpful. Okay, so now uh, for this hurt box to work, we're going to need a collision layer for the hurt box. And if don't believe I have set those up. So let's go into the project, project settings. And we will go down to where it says 2D physics. So we have layers for world, player, enemy. And to be more specific about enemy and player, these are the kinematic body layers but we might also want a layer for areas where certain events can be triggered, but not necessarily for move and slide collision uh, type mechanics. So maybe we can say over in about layer 11, we'll have enemy hitbox, which we may or may not use, uh, which would be the enemies trying to hit the player or another character. And then beyond that, I could create a jump hurtbox layer. So you could also just create a generic enemy hitbox. So you could also just create a generic enemy hurt box layer, which would work fine currently. The thing is, if your character ends up having multiple attacks, you might only want certain attacks like a jump bounce to actually be able to hit very specific areas and not all of the potential um, attack areas on the character. So for right now, I'll just have jump hurt box and this layer will be exclusively used for those jump attacks. So up here, I'm not sure if we'll use it or not, but just to be a little bit consistent with down there, I'll also create a player hitbox in case we need it later on. 
So let's close that. And this jump hurt box is going to be in, of course, the jump hurt box layer. Of course, it won't show the correct names until we switch out to a different tab and back. And now if we go over here, okay, I guess it's on the second row, we should be able to find enemy hit box and then jump hurt box. So let's take it off all the other layers. And then this area 2D isn't going to be checking for anything. It's only going to be receiving information. So we just need to have it on the jump hurt box layer. We don't need to use a mask for it to check for any entering or leaving from other layers, at least for now. Okay, so now let's go into the player character and let's create that uh, jump hit box. So I'm going to right click on the player and add a area 2D. Okay, and we're going to rename this jump hit box. And of course, we're going to need a collision shape. So the collision shape, we will make that a rectangle. Okay, and I'm going to make sure that the height of this is one. And then we're just going to pull it down here to the bottom of the character. And we can adjust the transform on the jump hit box area, I suppose. So let's bump that down with transform position. And I guess 15 is about what we're looking for right there. We probably also want to shrink the width of it because uh, the character's feet only go to about here. So let's change that eight to maybe a six. Okay, I guess that can work for now. And this jump hit box area 2D is going to be looking for the jump hurt box layer in order to see if it can hit the enemy at that point and deal damage to it. And currently I don't need anything to check for the hitbox, so I'm just taking it off of layer one. So it won't be used in any collisions, only to check for um, things entering it on this layer, the jump hurt box. Okay, so now what we need to do is connect this jump hitbox inside of the player script. So we can do that using signals pretty easily. If you click on the jump hitbox, we can go over to node, and then we're going to want to use area shape entered because we're checking for the hurt box, which is an area 2D. If we were checking for a kinematic body, you would use body shape entered and body shape exited. So let's do area shape entered. And I think that's the only one we're going to need to know. So the receiver method default name on jump hitbox area shape entered works perfectly fine. Let's connect that into the player script. And now we're going to have this down at the bottom. I'll move it up here so it's not in the setters section. So when something enters the hitbox, theoretically, it should only be the enemy jump hurt boxes. But I do want to make sure that the area that's entering is actually attached to a enemy. So uh, what we could do is we can check this area and then we can see if its owner is in fact of the enemy type. So I'm going to do var enemy and then area dot owner. And for an instantiated scene, this should give us the root node. So if I was to check what the owner would be for like this jump hitbox, if I had a script attached here, it would go to the owner, which in this case is the player. So in the angry pig, the owner of this jump hitbox is the angry pig, which is going to be of type enemy. Actually, let's see, did I create the enemy type yet? No, I have not. So we'll do that in a minute. So back in the player script, we need to check is the enemy actually an enemy. So going to say is enemy enemy and we haven't created that type yet so uh, that's not going to work and uh, we just need to basically create the script for that so in the characters folder enemies I'll just create a new script here so I'm going to right click here do a new script and uh, we're just going to call it enemy.gd and inside of enemy.gd this is going to extend kinematic body 2d so the base type of this is the same as angry pig which is going to mean that Angry Pig can just inherit from enemy.gd, which is going to inherit from kinematic body 2D. So it gets all the functionality of both the kinematic body and also the enemy. So for GD script to declare this as a type, which we can reference without a path, I think we need class name here and then enemy. So it's just basically giving a, if you were doing C++, kind of like a namespace to this script. And now in angry pig.gd, we can just write enemy. So it extends enemy. It knows what enemy is because we defined it uh, for our project with this class name. So now anything we want all of the enemies to have can just go in here. So for instance, um, angry pig, I guess we haven't set a health variable, but this would be a perfect place to actually put that. So let's do export, I guess we'll make it a float var health, and we'll default this to three. So now if we click on angry pig, go to the inspector, we can see the health variable is here. But this health variable, it's not coming from angry pig, it's coming from the nested enemy script. 
So now back in the receiver method for the jump hitbox. If we've gotten to the point where we've figured out that the enemy is in fact an enemy, then we also want to make sure that it can currently be hit because we don't accidentally want to double hit the enemy for any reason. So there might be an invulnerability time, such as like when the hit animation is currently playing, maybe the enemy should be invulnerable for a minute. So we can add another variable to the enemy, uh, which could be something like can be hit. So enemy dot can be hit, and this will be a Boolean, and we can just declare that over in our enemy script. So we could say export bool bar can be hit. And presumably this would generally default to true, since at the start of the game you'd want to be able to hit the enemy, but you can customize this, of course, for each enemy, um, since that property will just show up here inside of each of the characters. So now at this point, we want to check if the character is actually above the enemy. If we're jumping from down below and then the areas overlap, that's not really the same as falling down on top of an enemy. So we can check when the area shape enters, if it's entering from above wherever the enemy is. So basically for this, we can uh, grab the jump hitbox. And, you know, it might actually make more sense to have this as a variable up at the top to be more consistent. So we'll have unready var jump hitbox equals dollar sign jump hitbox. So we make sure that's there at the start of the script running. So we check the jump hitbox dot, uh, let's do global position dot y. So in the game world, this is going to be its like absolute position, not relative to anything. So if we compare this to another global position, then we can be pretty sure that it is actually above the other position or not above the other position. Uh, so area.globalposition.y. So this is going to be that um, hurt box area in theory, since uh, the jump hit box can only detect on the jump hurt box layer. So we can be reasonably sure that this area is in fact the jump hurt box. So if we get to down here, then we're going to do the jump attack. So for that, we're going to take this character's velocity and we're going to increase it with a little enemy bounce. So I'm going to have a variable enemy bounce impulse, and then we're going to do damage to the enemy. So we'll have this function get hit with an amount of damage. So we need to create two variables up there at the top. So First off, export bloat var enemy jump. And I'm going to make this less than the main jump. Something like 400 sounds a little bit better. Then we can also have another bloat variable. So this will be jump damage. And I'm just going to default that to one. Nice and simple. Okay, so we still got an error down there. Enemy bounce impulse. Oh, enemy jump. I guess enemy bounce works better. Okay, that's what I called it in the original script. So that should clear up the problem there. We just got to make sure that in the enemy script, we have that get hit method. So get hit, let's make that function get hit. And this is going to take a amount of damage, presumably a float. And so when the enemy gets hit, we want to make it so that it can't be hit again until we have something else say that it can. In our case, it's going to be the end of the hit one or hit two animation being done. So while it's playing the hit animation, it's basically invulnerable in a sense. So we're going to take the health and we're going to minus equal the damage. And then we are going to set can be hit equals to false. Now in the angry pig script, we want to create a function that we can run when our hit animations are done. So let's create a function hit animation finished. Okay, so when it's finished, we want to set can be hit equals true. And I'm also going to want to return the state of the character to run or walk since once it's done being hit, it should basically resume its normal functionality. So we're going to say current state equals state dot run for now. Okay. And let's also move these functions up here. Okay. And one thing about these, uh, when we're in the hit state, we don't want the character to be able to switch its state to run or walk. The only way we're going to let the character go back to a run state is if this function finishes. So in a sense, we want to kind of lock that up. So I'm going to put in here, if the current state is state.walk, then it can go to a run state. Or down here, if it's running, it can go to a walk state. When this parameter gets set and the player isn't in there anymore, it should start walking. And when the player enters, it should start running, but only when it's not in another state like hit. Okay, and this needs two equals sign. So now let's go into our animation player, angry pig 2d. Let's click on the animation player. 
And let's add in another track for hit one. So our track is going to be call method and we want to call methods from the angry pig. Okay, and we also need that to occur at the end of the hit animation. So we're going to need to extend this. I'm actually going to extend it to 0.5 seconds for now. And when we go to the animated sprite, I'm going to slow down the FPS on these by half so that it takes not 0.25 seconds, but 0.5 seconds for the whole animation to play. We'll see if that works for us. And now we can go back to the player. So it should take till here for the 10 FPS uh, animation to finish. So this is where we want to put in the forgot another equal sign there as well. Okay, so now um, for our functions track, we can insert the key hit animation finished. Okay, now that should run the animation there. Now we also need to do the same thing with hit two. So let's make this point five for the duration. And let's turn off looping as well, because it shouldn't loop, it should only play once and then go back to running. So call method on angry pig, and then we right click here at 0.5 seconds, insert the key, hit animation finished. And now our function is going to run here. So this should return it to the state and allow it to be hit again. So that should be what we want. Now let's just check hit one and turn off looping. And uh, one more thing we'll need in the animation tree is to actually set up a one shot variable so that we can enter those hit states. So let's right click on the node graph and do a one shot. So this one shot is going to be, uh, let's just call it hit, why not just keep it simple. So this one shot is when the hit animation is going to be played. So when this animation parameter hit gets set to active, it should show either hit one or hit two, and we can make that a random variable. But in order for that to actually work, we have to reconnect the outputs. So let's take this line here for the output and player detected. And now this blend space 1D should feed directly into the N as the default function. And then this goes to the output. And now we just need to create those hit one, hit two animations down here. So right click animation, right click animation. Okay, so on the first one, hit one, on the second one, hit two. And now we can go over here, right click, and I think we wanna blend two. Okay, right. So we're basically gonna have two values, uh, zero and one. If it's zero, then we play hit one. And if it is one, then we play hit two. So we can call the property here, hit variation, if I can spell right, hit uh, variation. And let's connect this to shot. Okay, so now we have two variables to hit. This will determine whether we play hit one or hit two, just for some variety. And then this will determine if we are playing the hit animation at all. So for the enemies in our game, after thinking about it, uh, we might actually want each enemy to have its own implementation of get hit. So we can still pass the same amount of damage into the function for each character, but maybe some characters don't actually take damage when they get hit. Maybe they just move a bit, or maybe some characters aren't invulnerable after being hit. So in any case, it might actually make sense to allow the player to tell the enemy about running this function, but have a different implementation for each character. So I'm going to put an underscore here to uh, make this a virtual function, and then we're just going to cut this for right now. So and then what we're going to do is take this over to Angry Pig and uh, we'll put this down here as a implementation for this. So we'll come back to this in a second. So for right now, if the get hit function gets run and it isn't a custom implementation, I'm just gonna push an error. So we'll just say that get hit has not been implemented. So if in angry pig or another enemy the get hit has been created it should use this version of the get hit but in case it doesn't we'll just have this error message so that we basically know that we have to go ahead and implement it so for this version of get hit for the angry pig i'm going to make it so that when it gets hit we enter the hit state and as part of that we can actually set these variables down here in the animation tree so i'm going to get the animation tree and we're going to set the parameters. So the first one is going to be parameters slash hit slash active. And then the other one, uh, let's go ahead and check that. So player detected. So that's going to be parameters slash player underscore detected slash. Oh, wait, not that one. Um, hit variation, actually. Uh, parameters slash hit variation slash blend amount. Okay, so so animation tree set for parameters slash 
hit underscore variation slash blend amount. So that's going to be either a zero or a one. And we'll have to figure that out in a second. And then this is going to be a true. So we can generate a random number here. And in order to create a random number, you need to create a random number generator object, which has its own constructor. So we could create one um, inside of this class, or we could create one every time we run this function. Or what we could do is we could put it in our singleton global script. And then anytime we need to run a random function, we just reference that uh, game settings global. So I like that idea better. So in our game settings.gd, we can create a uh, variable and this will load at the start of the game. So this will be our random number generator. And what we just need to do is random number generator and create a new instance of that. So at the start of uh, the game, whenever it loads, we're going to get this new random number generator and we only need one and we can use it everywhere. So uh, in Angry Pig now, we can add a new line. So let's do the far anim selection. And this is going to be equal to game settings, our singleton referenceable anywhere dot, let's see, we called it rand gen. And then we need to generate a new number. So we can do random int i for int underscore range between zero and one. So integers can only be non decimal numbers. So that's going to give us specifically either a zero or a one. And we can put that into the animation tree value. So let's uh, put that anim selection in here. So that'll give us our randomly selected either hit one animation or hit two animation. So one more thing in game settings.gd, when we use the random number generator to generate random values, uh, by default, it's actually going to use the same seed whenever the game loads. So it'll have the same sequence of, so to speak, random numbers. So if the random number generator was only used once to determine that the character got hit and which animation to play, then that character would, in theory, uh, be playing the same animation whenever the game loads and that same event happens. So to make it truly random, what we could do is uh, implement a ready function here. And then if should randomize a Boolean, then we'll randomize it. So rand gen dot randomize. Okay, so if we have this run, then this will create a new seed for the random number generator, and it should actually give us different variations every time we run the game. So let's make that a variable that we can set in the game settings uh, scene, that TSCN file. So should randomize, and we'll default this to true. So if we ever need to turn off the randomization because we want to test for the same uh, seed for the random number generator, then we can just go into the scene and turn it off on the inspector to the side. So let's just have that in there for right now. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit play here and see where we're actually at. So let's go ahead and hit play here and see where we are at. I'm going to jump into the character. Uh, so first off, it should not have got here because it was uh, below the area for starters, but we can also see non-existent function get hit. That's because we have the underscore there. So we can take that away since this is the final implementation of uh, get hit for this character. So let's go ahead and hit play. And now, okay, we can see the character is getting hit, but we haven't actually created the hit state. So up here at the top, let's add that state state hit. Okay, let's give it another shot. Okay, so we actually had the bounce on top of the character and you can see that um, after that first bounce hit, it's actually not possible to hit him again, or at least temporarily it wasn't. Another problem seems to be that the character doesn't actually die when the health is below zero. So let's solve that real quick. If uh, health is less than or equal to zero, we can just use Q free to remove the character. So of course, if you had like a death animation, you can play that on said first and then Q free, but this removes the scene from the hierarchy, in other words, removing the enemy from the game. Um, so let's hit play and see that again. So that's one hit, two hits, three hits. Okay, so that does actually do damage to the enemy. Okay, so it seems like what we actually needed was uh, the global position on the hitbox should be higher than the global position on the area. And you can kind of debug that just by printing out the global position for each whenever you'd have a collision and see if the numbers actually line up. So now 
if we jump onto the character, it should actually bounce, but only if it's on top. So let's see. Coming from underneath, nothing happens, but if we jump from up above, we get that bounce. Okay, and then there's that third hit. Okay, so that seems to be more or less working. Let's test that one more time. It seems like I missed the hitbox. Okay, there's that. Okay, jumping from underneath doesn't do anything, but we can jump and hit him again. Okay, so we can quickly check the hitbox for the character. Let's see. So we have that little line up here. Maybe we do want to make the jump collision hitbox a little wider. I think that's about the only problem there. So we'll be kind of generous with that so that if the character kind of hits the edge over there, you know, we can go a little further even. Maybe we make it 13, 14 even. Why not? Okay. So let's hit play. Test it one more time. Oh, okay. I guess I... Hmm. And it seems to be working overall. Uh, one other tool you can use to check collisions, if you go up to the debug menu, you can turn on visible collision shapes. So now if we hit play, we can see uh, directly where his collision shapes is. So where we should be hitting in order for the jump to occur. Okay. And let's jump on him again. Okay. Right. And one more time. Okay, that pretty much seems to be working correctly for our angry pig. So now that we're able to bounce on an enemy in order to deal damage to it, or at least with the angry pig we are, we should make a way for the enemies, like the angry pig, to be able to do damage to the player. So we can go ahead and set that up now. So previously we made an enemy class, which is a base script that the angry pig inherits from. And in this class, we create the ability for enemies to get hit. And also, every enemy has health, and the variable can be hit. So in order to make it so that our player can be hit by enemies, we're going to need to set up a few variables similar to how we did with the enemy script. The uh, angry pig inherits from enemy, which means that the angry pig has health and should implement the get hit function. So what we can do is pull everything up another level where any character in the game will have health and should implement a get hit function. So we can create a script for that. If we go to characters and then right click on the folder, do a new script. So I'm going to call this character.gd. And in this script, we're just going to pull that information from the enemy, such as the health variable. And let's uh, give it of everything, put it here. And then make sure that this is a kinematic body 2D, since every character is going to be a uh, kinematic body 2D type character. So now if we have enemy inherit from this, it'll get the health value again. Uh, now what I do notice sometimes is that if you have too many class names in the game and you have a bunch of inheritance going on, that sometimes it gets errors. So rather than putting class name character here and then extends character, what we can do is just cut away this text and then drag and drop the path to the character script. So if I just drag this up here, it's basically going to work the same as if we had used class name and character. Although doing it this way can avoid some errors that occur with using class names in Godot. Uh, one problem is that if you move your script files in your directory, it's going to obviously cause a lot of errors because this is a path to where it's stored. So if the character.gd script is no longer in the character's folder, uh, then it obviously when it tries to load it, it's going to give you some errors. So you could play around with it a bit and figure out which method works better for you. So our enemy is going to inherit from character.gd, and that means that it's going to have this health. But let's also take this get hit function and put it in character as well. So the idea is character is going to be our base custom script written on top of kinematic body 2D. So that's what this is inheriting from. And then enemy is a type of character and then angry pig is a type of enemy so the angry pig class is going to inherit from everything beneath it it'll have everything in enemy and we'll have everything in character as well so we can keep enemy as a separate script though because as the game gets a little bit more complex there may be certain things we want all enemies to have but not necessarily characters like the player so let's now make our player a character. So I'll click on player and let's cut away the extents here and just drag and drop the character.gd script. So it extends the path to the script. And that should work for us. So now the player is going to have a health and we're going to need to write this get hit function. So let's go down here and write the get hit function. So function get hit and we're going to take a damage value, which can be a float. And the things we're going to need to do with get hit is to obviously take the damage. So self dot 
health is going to be minus equals to the damage value. And we should also change the state of the character. So we can do self.current state equals state.hit, which we have not created yet. So let's just take that and pop it right up here, creating a fifth state. And then of course, uh, we have a setter method for this current state value. So when that runs, the set current state is going to happen down here. So I think this would be a good place to set the parameters on the animation tree. Of course, we haven't set the parameter for the new one shot where the character takes damage and has a little bit of a staggered knockback. Uh, but we can just go ahead and type that out in advance. So the state we're matching for is, of course, state.hit. And when that occurs, we're going to do animation tree dot set parameters slash hit slash active. So just like with the double jump, this is going to be a one shot. So that's why it says active here. It's going to be a Boolean and we're making it active or true. So now let's dive into the player scene. Let's go to the animation tree and let's set this up for hit. So in our game, when the player takes damage, that's going to take priority over any other animation. So this one shot should be in front of double jump in the hierarchy. So I'm going to right click here, do a one shot. The variable name, just like we wrote in the script, is hit. So I'm going to write that. And now we can redirect this output to here. And the one shot will go to here. And when this hit variable is active, we're going to play the one shot. So we want to get that hit animation. So let's put that in here and connect that to shot. Now, uh, we also need to make sure that our animation player has the hit animation set up correctly and that the hit animation in the animated sprite is also set up. So if we click on animated sprite, we can check hit and we can see this is an eight frame animation. We're running it at 20 frames per second. So that's important because we can figure out how long that the hit animation should play for 0 0.05 seconds per frame. So that's going to be a total of 0.4 seconds. Before we jump into the animation player, one more thing on the one shot, uh, like with the double jump one shot, we want to make the fade in time and fade out time zero. I forgot to do that a second ago, and that's going to be pretty important so that the animations actually look correct. Now let's go to the animation player. Let's look at our hit animation. We can see it's looping and that it is only 0 0.05 seconds. So we need to turn off looping and make it 0 0.4 seconds because that is how long it takes to get through all of the frames on the animation. And now when the character is done with the hit animation, we're going to want some kind of callback inside of our script where basically the animation is complete. So something should change in the player class. Namely, it should resume a normal state like idle or walk. We'll probably use state.idle. So let's go ahead and write that part of the script. And in fact, uh, what we could probably do is just put that into character. Since I imagine every character in the game, as long as you're not having NPCs of some kind that are totally immune to everything, are going to have a hit animation of some kind. So you could put this in player, or we could just write it here as something that should be implemented for every uh, character in the game. So we'll do on hit finished. And we can just push an error if it's not implemented, since we should have our own custom implementation of it. So in player, let's actually write that. So down here, we can do function on hit finished. And what we're going to do is take the self.current state and we're going to set that to state.idle. And if you recall, our script is already set up for going between idle and running states, depending on if the player is input. So putting it in idle should be just fine uh, for right here. And now we just need to make sure that this gets called so that we can resume the idle state. So in the animation track for the animation player, make sure you have animation player selected. Do add track, call method, select the player script and go to the end of the animation, which is 0.4 seconds in. Let's right click, insert a key, pick the method that you want it to run. In this case, it's going to be void on hit finished. So let's just double click that. Now when it gets to this point, this function is just going to run automatically. So the state will be switched to idle. So now that our character is basically set up for entering the hit animation state, we're going to need a way for the enemy to actually deal damage to the player. Similar to how we have the jump hitbox for this player, we can create a hitbox for the enemy that's going to look for the player. And if it finds the player, it'll run this get hit function. So we can jump into our angry pig scene. So now with the angry pig, we can set up a hitbox. Uh, this is going to be very similar to setting up the hurt box down here. So I'm going to right click on the angry pig, going to add a child node 
and we will make it a area 2D. I'm going to rename this enemy collision hitbox since this is uh, its ability to do damage when it just bumps into the player or it collides with the player. And now we need a shape 2D for the hitbox. So I'm going to right click on it, add a child node, and let's do collision shape 2D. All right. Um, just like with a bunch of other stuff, we can just keep it simple with a rectangle shape. Currently, I don't want to accidentally adjust the jump hurt box, so it would be good to lock that in place. And make sure we don't edit that in any way. And now we can take the shape for our hitbox and adjust it. So I'm going to say that this character can only really collide with the player if it bumps into it right when it's looking at it about here. OK, so let's take our collision shape and shrink it down a little bit. So. Uh, the big collision shape, that'll be for this pig colliding with other things, but we'll be kind of generous with the player and just say that the character kind of needs to be right around here, overlapping with the player in order to actually deal damage to it. So I'll take the rectangle shape and let's make it something like 7, 7, hit enter. Or maybe we can say 7 and 8, but then we take the um, collision hitbox and move it down a little bit. So let's move that down there. And we can temporarily hide the other hitboxes so that uh, we can see everything clearly if we need to. So I think that could be okay. Uh, maybe I'll move it down just one more pixel. And we'll call it good for there. We can always adjust it later. So now for this enemy collision hitbox, we need to set the layers where it's going to be looking to to deal damage to the player. So if we want, we could create a player hurtbox layer if we want to define a custom shape uh, for where the player can be hit. But I think that the main body collision shape uh, will work just fine. We can see this here uh, kind of fits the size of the character pretty good. So we'll just use this collision shape that we're going to look for. And since this is the collision shape for the kinematic body, then in the script, we're going to be using the body check, not the area check. So we don't need to create a player hurt box. But if you want to do that, you can go to the project menu go down to 2D physics, and then in layer eight, you can say player hurt box. Maybe we'll need that later on. So I'll just write that in as a layer right now. But instead of that, I'm gonna change the mask, which is what the area 2D is looking for, and just change that to the player mask. And I'm gonna turn off the layer for collision, since this is only gonna be looking for the player in order to deal damage to it. And in fact, we can just take monitorable and just turn that off entirely. Now, I might also want to rename the collision shape 2D on the left, um, just so we know which one's which. So I'm going to call this enemy collision shape, and I'll save that there. So now we need to take the signals of the hitbox and add that to the angry pig script. So with the enemy collision hitbox, I can go in here to body shape entered, and I'm going to connect that into the angry pig. So on enemy collision hitbox body shape entered, we're going to try to deal some damage to the player. But the thing is, a lot of enemies are going to be able to deal damage in this way, if not all of them in the game. So I might actually want to take this out of the angry pig script, and we can put it in enemy GD instead. So enemies are going to have the ability to do damage to the player whenever the player enters that area if the player is not in an invulnerable state. So in order for an enemy to deal damage, we're going to need another variable. So I'm going to do export, um, let's say float, collision, uh, not collision shape, collision damage. And I'm going to default that to one. So we're going to check if this body is a player type. So for our collision hitbox, the body should be attached to a player. And we can be pretty sure that that's going to occur because in our hitbox, the collision layer is only set up to have the player mask and players are going to be a type of character. So what we can do in our enemy script here is just assign the damage to this body, assuming that it is a player type. So body dot get hit collision damage should in theory be able to occur since the only bodies that are going to be on that layer in the game are going to be the player. And if it's not a player, then uh, we probably messed something up and we do want to get an error message out. So I think it'll be fine to make that assumption here. We'll either get an error or it'll run successfully. Maybe it hasn't been implemented in that specific character type, but let's give it a shot. Okay, so now get hit's going to run. The player's implementation of that is that it's going to take damage and that it's going to set the current state to hit. Let's make one extra change here, which is that in uh, the character class, let's add a set get method here. So set health 
And then we can say function set health and we're going to say health equals value. But if the health is less than or equal to zero, then we can queue free on this object. So basically, this will just mean that any character that drops to zero health is instantly removed from the game. Maybe we change that later on if we had some animations for removing it from the game. But if we write it here, then it's basically set up for all of the characters. So if we go to Angry Pig, for instance, we don't actually need to have this queue free here. We can just do self.health minus equals damage. And then that should run the character set health set a method. I'm going to pull this up here so that it's close to that variable. So let's go ahead and hit play and see where we're at. If we run into the enemy, the hit animation plays for 0.4 seconds. And I believe we would be taking damage. That's two hits. And then after three hits, health drops to zero. So the player is Q freed from the game. So that's all technically working, but a couple of things we probably want to add to the character. First off, if all of our enemies are colliding with our character in this way, using the hitbox to deal damage to it, each enemy can just keep doing it over and over again every time the shape gets entered, the body shape. So we want to make sure that the character can't just be overwhelmed. So there should be some kind of invulnerability timer for the player to protect itself Basically, it can only be hit once every second, and that will make the game a little bit more fair for the player as we add extra enemies. So if we go to the player, we can right click here at the top, add a child node, and let's make a timer. So this timer, we can just have it be one second wait time by default. So that will be the duration of the invulnerability. And let's check one shot so that when that timer drops to zero, it doesn't restart, it just stops. So we could call this the invincible timer or invulnerability timer, whatever you prefer. Let's go open the script and we will reference it with an on ready var. So on ready var invincible timer equals dollar sign invincible timer. So with this timer, we're going to want to start it whenever we get hit. So if you find the get hit method, then we can start the timer when we take the damage. So our invincible timer dot start, I'll put that in here. So now we want to prevent the character from taking damage while the timer is running. So we can put it if up here. So if invincible timer, and there's a way to get if it's currently running or not, but I forgot it for a second. So let's actually search the help. And you can use this in the top right, if you need to look up details about any of the nodes in the game. So if we just type timer here, we can find timer and we can see all of the properties and methods about that. So we want to check if it's stopped. If it's stopped, then it should be able to take damage, but otherwise not. So in player.gd, we want to do is stopped. This is a method, so we need the parentheses. And only if it's stopped are we going to do all this stuff. So otherwise, the invincibility timer means it doesn't matter that the character technically got hit by the enemy. It's not going to enter that state. The character is just going to keep operating as normal. OK, so now if we hit play, we should be able to kind of limit the amount of times we take damage. So I'm going to run into it a bunch and see how long it takes to actually uh, have the player die. So as you could see, I went through the enemy many times, but the player didn't die for at least three seconds there. I can hit play and just show that one more time. Okay, so going back and forth through the enemy, and it takes a while to die because the invincibility timer is limiting the amount of damage to the player. Now, one last thing is that uh, the character can just move around however it wants when it takes damage. So I don't think that feels that good in terms of emphasizing that the character should take damage and kind of be knocked back a little bit. So we should set up um, some custom movement when the character takes damage so that it staggers a little bit. So how we can do that is up here in our uh, physics process. This is our normal way of moving, but we want to have a different way of moving if the character is in the hit state. So we can take this code, move it into its own separate function down here. I'll call this function normal move. It's going to require an input. As you can see, this flip direction needs the input. And in that, we're going to run this code. And actually, we're not going to set the velocity here. Let's just return it. Uh, let's do a match up here. 
So basically, in any other state than the hit state, we're going to move normally. So let's do match current state, and let's get all those other state names. So state dot idle, comma, state dot run, comma, state dot jump, comma, state dot double jump. And in all of those cases, the velocity is going to be equal to whatever we get back from normal move, which takes the player input up here. Now, in the last case, or at least the last current case, which is state.hit, we want a special move function. So velocity equals hit move. And this isn't going to need any input because the player is going to have no control over how the character moves in this case. So let's create that function down here, function hit move. Write a little comment here. Okay, so in hit move, we're going to be returning a vector. Of course, the velocity. So we're going to need an amount and a direction. So for the direction, I want to check uh, which way the sprite is currently flipped. And then I want to go in the reverse direction. So if the character is facing to the right, I want the knockback to be in the left direction. Um, so let's make a variable for that variable knockback direction. And this will be an int, either positive or negative one. And if animated sprite dot flip h. So this is going to mean that the character is facing left. So in that case, we want the knockback to be to the right. So the knockback direction is just going to be one. So in the other cases, the character is facing the right. So that's going to be not flip h. And that means that we want to knock back to the left. So knockback direction. It's going to be equal to negative one. And now we can take this value of one and negative one and multiply it by a speed. So our speed for the knockback is going to be a uh, knockback speed, knockback collision speed. I don't know, whatever you want to call it, times knockback direction. And then for the Y, we could have gravity still work during the collision. Uh, that would be one option. Or we could just set it to zero, which means that if the character gets hit in midair, it's going to stop having gravity. So for the y part of this velocity vector, we could just have the standard gravity apply here. Or what we could do is set the y uh, speed. Or what we could do is set the y velocity to zero, which means that for that um, 0.4 seconds for the character is doing the hit move, it's just going to kind of float in the air and move backwards a little bit. That's how I want to do it for now. It's totally up to you on how you want to set up the character's movement. But yeah, if you don't want the character to move vertically during this hit move, then you can just set it to zero. So let's now create the variable up at the top for the knockback collision speed. So export float bar this and we could set it to something like 50. I don't want it to be too fast. Don't want the character to just easily fall off edges that it happens to be nearby. That would be pretty annoying. So we'll just keep it kind of small for right now. Okay, let's go ahead and hit play and see where we are at. Okay, so let's go down here to the enemy, get hit. So before we test the player, uh, first I'm going to go to level one, click on the player, and I'm going to give him, let's say, like 20 health so that uh, we can test without having to restart the game. So let's go ahead and hit play and see where we're at. Okay, so here's the enemy. I'm going to get attacked. Okay doesn't really have any movement but if we're facing the enemy then we do get that knockback and it is in the opposite direction that we were facing so that is basically what I want okay so I do see one bug at the moment which is that the character is entering the idle state a little bit too fast so let's check the player and the animation tree okay and let's make sure everything's working here so the one shot seems to be working right the animation hit goes here so maybe in the animation player we can check this 0 0.4 seconds and animation looping okay so here's what it is the pick next state function is running even though it's in state dot hit i believe that the pick next state function does run after everything else so we might be able to cut this down here and then just take the pick next state and have that run here as well um, let's see if that works. So picnic state is only going to be running normally if it is basically doing these kind of normal moves. So let's hit play and see if that will work all right. Okay, so our character can still move around. And when we do get hit, it is properly being knocked back. So that's what we're looking for. 
we don't want any way for the player to accidentally leave the hit state other than the animation being completely done. So that looks pretty nice there. I can just get rid of the print debug here just to check for the velocity. One final thing we might want to do is make the knockback direction a vector two rather than an integer. Technically this works fine, but what we can do to make it a little bit more clear is do uh, equals vector two dot right. And then instead of negative one on the X direction, we can say vector two dot left. There may be cases where you want the player to be knocked up a little bit. And in that case, vector twos would work better here since you'd be able to kind of define a Y component for the direction as well. So for this, uh, what we can do instead is take this out here and then just multiply this by the knockback direction. So this will be our magnitude and then this will be the direction. Uh, theoretically, we'd want to normalize that. So I guess this won't technically do anything here, but we would want to make sure that uh, the directions don't go above one because then it would have kind of a magnitude over here. So let's have it normalize. And then we'll set the knockback direction to that. So the normalized vector only having direction multiplied by the speed, and it should work effectively exactly the same as before. But I think this makes it a little bit easier to understand exactly what's going on. So our character can still move and everything. Let's get hit by the enemy, uh, gets knocked back in the correct direction. And yeah, it's working exactly like before in terms of uh, final functionality. So, so in this next part, we're going to be adding the wall sliding state for our character. So when we're bordering the wall, we should be able to slide up and down it. And it's also going to give a different feel to the movement. So one thing I'm going to add is reducing the rate you slide down the wall uh, as opposed to when you just fall due to gravity. And we'll also add the ability to do a little jump off of the wall, which is different from a normal jump because it's going to kind of propel us away from the wall automatically. So let's go ahead and dive into our player scene. And I guess one place we could start with would be the animation tree. So if we expand this, we can see that there is nothing here for a wall sliding animation. And I think what we're going to put it is between the one shot hit and the double jump. We do want the wall sliding to be a high priority animation, but getting hit and taking damage basically is still going to precede everything. So we'll have it right in here. And instead of a one shot, we'll make this a blend because being on the wall can be turned on and off. So let's right click here and I'm going to add a blend to and this blend two is going to be is on wall. So let's reconnect the output from our one shot double jump to be the input on is on wall. Let's connect is on wall to the one shot to finish the train. And uh, before we add in the animation, we actually need to correct it. So in the animated sprite, we can see that we have a wall jump animation here, but actually that's not accurate. This really is a wall sliding animation. The jump is going to just look like a standard jump animation. So let's rename this animation to be wall slide. And now let's go into our animation tree. So I can right click, add an animation, and let's choose that wall slide. Ah, well, we haven't actually created the animation in the animation player for it either. So in the animation player, let's go to idle animation and duplicate it. Okay, so we can rename this to be I think all we need to change here is going to be uh, the value for the animation. And we're, of course, going to change that to be wall slide. So now uh, we can go into the animation tree, delete that animation node and add a new one in so that it's updated with the wall slide animation. And now we connect that into the blend. So if our blend value is set to one, we're going to be wall sliding. And if it's set to zero, we're going to be playing one of these other animations. So now let's dive into the code. So with the kinematic body 2D, there is a function that is is on wall uh, with parentheses. So you can run that on any kinematic body 2D to check if the character is on the wall or not. But in my practice, I'm not 100% sure why, but I find that you get more consistent results in checking if there is a bordering wall if you just do a ray cast. So rather than use is on wall and using that to check if we should go into uh, the sliding state, we will use a ray cast to see if we're right up next against a wall. And then that wall object supposedly is also going to have to match for being on the world layer because we only want things like the bricks and the platforms to actually be able to count as a wall. If we bump into an enemy, that shouldn't count. 
Luckily, though, if you remember, our uh, player has the collision mask where we're only checking for the world. So basically anything we can collide with for a 2D physics operation is what we're going to use for the mask. So we'll just use this mask. So let's go ahead and create our function for testing if we're bordering up next against a wall. So I'm going to call this func is on wall raycast test. I want to make sure that it's clear that we're not just using the standard is on wall function, but doing our own thing here. And then we're going to need a variable. So this is going to be the space state. So in a Godot game, we can get this space state object, which has the ability to do raycast tests by using git world 2D and then checking that direct space state property. So with that, we can do a raycast, which is basically taking a starting point, going out towards another point in our 2D world, and seeing if there's any collisions between the starting and ending point. So we're going to have a result variable, which is going to be a dictionary of the collisions that occur. And this is going to be equal to our space state object doing the raycast, and we're going to do it as a intersect array. We're starting from the position of our player object. So that's global position. And we're going to put the end position on this ray, basically our starting position plus a certain number of pixels towards the direction our character is facing. Where our character is facing is going to be the wall that we care about. So we can start with our global position here and an arbitrary number of pixels. I found that 10 works really good. And you could put a property up at the top if you want to set it there instead. And we're going to times this by a new function we'll write, get facing direction. So let's go ahead and write that function now. So function get facing direction. So this is going to be pretty straightforward. We're just going to take a look at uh, which direction the sprite of the character is facing towards. And then that's going to be our facing direction. So we can just check if the animated sprite flip h is false. So if that's false, then our character is facing the right. So we want to return a vector two dot right. So in terms of values, this would just be one comma zero, zero for y, one for x, meaning we're facing the right. Otherwise, uh, basically, it's facing the left. So we can just return vector two dot left. So super easy. Okay, so now we can go back to our raycast test function. So there is a couple more parameters here. So you can see the third parameter right there is exclude and it takes an array. So we want to exclude the current object from that. Um, it's not really required here, but just in case for any reason, we don't want the player to show up as a wall uh, for the results. So might as well just do self here as the array. So note the square brackets. That's how we define it as an array. And this has to be an array because that's the uh, type for the parameter. So next, we can put a collision mask here to make it so that this intersect array, when it's going out and checking for collisions, it's only doing it on the world layer. So the easiest way to do that is just going to be to take the collision mask here. And we can just pull that right from the kinematic body 2D by doing self dot collision mask. So this is going to do the raycast check for the wall for us. And now we can just do some very simple checks. So if there's a result in the dictionary, that means that there was a collision. And presumably that collision happens on the world layer, meaning that it is a block or some other object that would count as a wall. And we just want to see if there's any of those. So we can do that quite easily with if result.size is greater than zero, uh, then obviously there's something there. So we return true. Otherwise, there's no collisions, so there shouldn't be a wall right in front of us. So we can return false. So depending on how we code it, we're probably going to need the result of this several times for each loop of our physics process. Uh, this is going to be a useful variable for determining what state it should be in and what actions and movements we should take. So if we run this up here in our physics process function, we could just kind of put it right here next to set animation parameters. So we'll run this function, and then we'll save the result of it to a Boolean variable. So we can just come up here and do var is bordering wall. Once again, just changing the name a little bit so that it's distinct from the kinematic body is on wall function. So is bordering wall. That's just the result of this git is on wall raycast test. And now we can just use this whenever we need to see if 
it left the wall or we jumped off the wall or whatever. So this will be very useful. Okay, so let's take this value and go down there to picking the next state. So after this else, we'll add another one. So here we're going to do something with this in a second here. Uh, but for right now, we're going to have another else if down here below. So we need to change this else into an else if. Since there's only this one condition here anyway, we might as well just pull this up here and uh, paste it in like that. And now in that case, we'd enter the double jump state. Should work exactly like it did before. And now we need another else if going further down. If all those other conditions haven't been met, then here's where we're going to use this is bordering the wall. So if we're on the wall, basically, then we want to enter the wall slide state. So let's do self.current state equals state dot wall slide. And then, of course, let's go up to the top and add this into our states list. We can also modify this bit a little bit as well. So if the character is in the air and does the jump button, then usually we do want the double jump to occur. But if we're on the wall, uh, we want the jumps to reset. So basically, it's going to be jumping from jump zero. So it should do a normal jump. So what we can do here is put that if is bordering wall. And then if that's the case, then instead of entering double jump, we'll just enter jump. So self.current state equals state dot jump. And then the else down here, double jump. So while we're on the wall slide, uh, we are going to want the movement to be a little bit different. But we're still going to run the pick next state function. So we'll set up another match for the current state. So if we get the wall slide, we're still going to pick the next state since we basically already set up the other conditions we need for that in the pick next state function. But for the movement itself, we're going to change how that works when we're on the wall. So I'm going to create a new function for wall slide move. And this is not going to take any input from the player uh, because Basically, we're not going to be using X input to determine X movement. It's going to be stuck on the wall until the character jumps away from the wall. So let's go ahead and create that function down here. So function wall slide move. OK, and just like the other functions for moving, we're going to be returning a vector. And for the X, we're going to take the current velocity and we're going to just keep that as it is. So if there's no X movement, we're not changing the X movement. And then in addition to that, we're going to still do men uh, taking the lower of two values. So velocity Y, the current Y velocity. And kind of similar to before, we're going to add the game settings gravity. But we're going to multiply this by a friction value. So I'm going to call this wall slide friction. And then just like the normal function, we still want that terminal velocity being kind of our absolute fastest speed we're going to fall down. So obviously, we need this wall slide friction value. So I'll just go up here to the top, make another float variable. And I'm going to want this to be below one because the character should slide slower when it's on the wall, kind of grappling the wall. Uh, then it would normally just free falling. So I can multiply this by 0 0.5 and then it will slide down the wall quite slowly. And so that will basically give us our wall slide move while we're in the uh, wall slide state. So we can't change our X velocity and the sliding down the wall is going to be slower than it would be falling. So in our code, when we're in the wall slide state and most states, we can press jump in order to jump. So if we're bordering the wall, we're going to get that state dot jump, otherwise state dot double jump. And if we remember, because of the setter function for this current state, if we come down here, that means it's going to run the jump function, which is going to add a upwards jump impulse and increase the jump value. So that generally is okay, but we want it to work a little bit differently when we are doing it uh, from the wall. So if we enter this jump state, from the wall, and we can check for that by checking the current state before we actually change it. So current state double equals state dot wall slide. And then just in case we switch to the jump state in any way uh, without pressing jump, that we don't jump from the wall. So for instance, if the character kind of slides off the wall, um, but not onto the ground, and we enter the jump state for the animation, uh, we don't actually want it to jump immediately. So input dot is action just pressed. 
we're checking for jump. Okay, that's uh, one extra set of parentheses. Okay, and then if that's the case, then we can do a wall jump. So this would be similar to jump, but not exactly the same. Else, we can do the normal jump in all other circumstances. So let's go up here to the basic jump and let's create a wall jump. So things that are going to be the same about the wall jump. So for the wall jump, we're going to be doing the same thing. Uh, the y velocity is going to be the same when we enter that wall jump. And because we entered from the wall, the jumps should always start at one since we're considering the wall kind of like the ground in the sense that it resets our jumps. The other thing that we're going to want to have here is basically locking up our base movement so that we can jump away from the wall with some x velocity in addition to the y velocity, but we don't want this to be something the player can control for just a second. So up here for our standard normal move, we can actually check here if the wall jump timer, which we're about to create, has started. And if it hasn't started, then we'll do the normal move. But if it is running, then we're going to forego this normal move, even though we're in the jump state, in order to do a special wall jump move temporarily. So let's create a wall jump timer in our player. So I'm going to create the timer, I'm going to make a wall jump timer here. And we're going to take away the normal movement from the player for about, let's say 0.15 seconds. So if you change the wait time to 0.15, uh, make sure one shot is checked because once the timer is done, we don't want it to run again until we restart a new wall jump at some point in the game. So now we need to reference that timer in the script, just like the invincible timer. So on ready var wall jump timer equals dollar sign wall jump timer. So we can check down here if the wall jump timer is stopped. And that's a function. So if it is stopped, then we'll do the normal move here. Otherwise, we're going to do a, another special move. So that special movement, let's make another function for that. We can call it wall jumping movement. And once again, we don't need the input because this is kind of forced control for the x axis. And let's come down here. So function wall jumping movement. And the reason we need this function is because unlike the jump which is kind of just a standard quick impulse. This is actually going to be over a few frames. So we want it to keep doing this until the timer on the wall jump is done. So that's why we need to run this each frame until that timer is up. So we can just return a vector two here. And this is going to do move speed. Another variable we'll need to set, which is wall jump direction, which is going to be in that wall jump function. So basically the direction that the character jumps away from the wall at is going to be the direction it keeps moving in until the timer is done. And then down here, the movement is going to be the same as a standard movement. Just pull away the wall slide friction. So it's just velocity y plus gravity. And now we need to create the wall jump direction. So let's go down to the wall jump function. Again, one thing we're going to need to do is to start the timer. Wall jump timer dot start. And we also need to get the wall jump direction. And this is going to be equal to the opposite current facing direction at the frame where we start the wall jump. So negative get facing direction. And that's a function. So let's also declare this variable up here at the top. And this should be a, a vector two. So this was a lot of code. Let's go to set current state. And we need to set up a little bit here for when we enter the wall state. So Let's do state dot wall slide. Okay, when we're on the wall, one thing we definitely want to set is the jumps equal to zero, uh, since we're resetting the jumps for the player. And we also want the animation tree It's going to set the parameter is is on wall slash blend amount. And this is going to be set to one. So that needs to be a one in order for the wall slide animation to play. Okay, and it looks like I wrote the name for that variable wrong up here. So let's just paste that in. Wall jump direction is what we want. Now, lastly, we also want the is on wall to update uh, on each frame. So we're just checking if the character is still on the wall or not, and then updating that. In fact, maybe we don't even need this here, because we're just going to be setting it every frame. So I'll just cut that. 
and we'll go up here to set anim parameters and that's what we're going to do it instead so we're going to take that is bordering wool and convert it into a one or zero depending on if it's true or false so let's write in is on wall int i guess i can declare that that's going to be an int obviously and we can do if is bordering wall and if it's bordering the wall we're saying it's on the wall so the variable should be a one so is on wall int equals one otherwise is on wall int is going to be equal to zero and now that it's an integer we can set the parameter so animation tree dot set parameters is on wall slash blend amount and that's going to be whatever our is on wall integer is set to so now our animation tree should be updated every frame to know whether we should be playing the wall sliding animation or not. Let's just make sure in the animation tree we have that parameter here. So we can see parameters is on wall, blend amount, and we can see that set up with the wall slide. Okay, so after all that code, let's go ahead and actually see where we're at. Let's hit play. Okay, let's see. We do have the wall sliding. Okay, and you can see uh, when we jump off the wall, the animation parameter sets correctly. So this is one of the reasons I'm not using is on wall check because when you use the raycast, I just get much better results. So as soon as we get up here, it's checking over here for the raycast, it doesn't find a wall. So we immediately switch to the jump or fall animation, which just looks a lot better. So one thing we can note here is that our character moves pretty fast currently. With the ability to double jump and do wall slides, um, this is quite over the top. So we're probably going to need to tone that down. Another thing I noticed is that it doesn't always feel good um, going up to the edge of one of these blocks and then sliding off with this capsule 2D shape. So we'll actually change the shape of the character to a rectangle as well. I believe I said towards the start of this course, it's kind of up to you what you prefer. And I think by this point, I prefer it to be a rectangle. So one thing that's not currently working super well is uh, when we do that wall jump, we get stuck in it. So I'm not sure if we are checking properly to see if the timer has stopped, because once the timer stopped, you should be able to regain control of your character. Okay, so let's do the low hanging fruit first. In the player, we can change the collision shape. So we'll change this to a rectangle shape. And I believe the sizes I wanted to put for this were 10 and 7, or 7 and 10, I guess it was. So roughly the shape of our character, but for now our collision shape will make it so that we shouldn't have any sliding off the edge and we'll either be clearly on or clearly off. I think another way to potentially get around that could be using the move and collide function instead of move and slide. Since the move and slide function is going to kind of move you along the ground, but the move and collide function, if there is something in the way, it's just going to stop your movement entirely, roughly speaking. Uh, but I think this will work pretty good for right now. Next, I want to kind of limit some of the movement in the game. So we can tone down the jump impulse. I'm going to pull this down to 500 by default. And then in the game settings, I'm going to lower the gravity to 40. Let's hit play and uh, see kind of how that affects things. Maybe we even want to lower the character's speed down by a little bit. So let's see, in the player, okay, it's still using 200. So I guess we could set it to 180. Okay, so he's still pretty fast, but I think with this amount of gravity, it's a little bit less ridiculous. This still would be a, a pretty fast-paced platformer, but maybe for a ninja frog, that kind of makes some sense. So we can leave it at these settings for right now. Okay, so we have the problem with the wall jumping movement is going on for way too long. So I'm actually going to take the wall jump timer and print the time remaining. So let's print the time remaining to the console log. And let's see how long this actually goes on for. It should be 0.15 seconds, which is pretty fast. Okay, so it took one frame there, essentially. And then after that, it's still going. Uh, okay, so you see what's going on here? When we leave the wall, it's still in the wall slide state. So that's why we can't control the movement. So what we could do down here is just add another way to enter the jump state, but make it so that we do that without actually jumping. So we already know at this point that is bordering wall is false. So we don't really need to check. 
So we could just do self dot current state here is equal to state dot jump. So when we enter the state like this, uh, since this is going to be basically when something causes the character to leave the wall um, that isn't pressing the jump button, then we want to make sure down here that we enter it without jumping. And that is why I wrote this bit here. <clears throat> okay, so this is basically just to distinguish that there's different ways to enter the jump state. And we're not always trying to actually do a jump function, even if we're playing that jump animation. So let's go ahead and hit play now. And hopefully the character should be able to Oh, God. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. And uh, clearly, that is not what we intended. So uh, I do think we need a condition here, actually. So we're going to do else if not bordering wall, I guess. So let's put in the else if and we're going to be checking that the current state is equal to state dot wall slide. So we should only be able to arbitrarily enter the jump state from the wall slide state like this. And just so it's a little bit more readable, understandable, I'll also put in and not is bordering wall. So if this bit has already run, then this should already be true. So it's not really going to be necessary. But I guess it gives a hint about what's going on right here. So let's go ahead and hit play. And we shouldn't be able to enter that jump from the start because we weren't on the wall. But now we're on the wall slide. Let's jump from the wall. And you can see it gives a way for us to enter the jump, but without actually adding another jump animation. So we only have that one jump away from the wall. And this is what we've been looking for. So we can see although the uh, wall jump is forced, we can press towards the wall and it does go back pretty quickly. Um, technically, that is working as intended. Maybe it moves a little bit too fast in the air. So we could slow down the character's default air movement or air horizontal acceleration if we wanted to. Um, but if you like the feel of the character now, then it should be pretty much good to go for all of the animations we're going to set this character up with. Maybe a little bit too slidey around the map, but a lot of that is just going to be tweaking the variables. So let's cut out that little bit that is printing to the console log a bunch. Just going to hit Control F and uh, check for prints. This one's OK, I guess. But let's get rid of this wall jump timer text. Now, uh, one more thing to show. Earlier, I said that when we're doing our raycast, we want to make sure that this only occurs when our character is on the wall like this. And maybe we don't even want to have the wall hugging if we're on the ground and the wall like this. So that is another thing we could turn off. Uh, maybe we like it. I don't know. But uh, we wanted to make sure that the pig can't count as the wall. And you can see that clearly the pig does not count as the wall because it's on a separate layer. It's on its enemy layer, which makes uh, physics layers really helpful. So we can still bounce on him. We can still let's see if we can get an attack and then a double jump. OK, nice. And then after that, we can go for some nice wall slides into a jump or wall slides into a jump, double jump, <laughs> whatever we want to do. So uh, our character is pretty much fully working here. So there'll be a couple more things we want to add to the game still, like a second enemy and actually building out some levels. It's been a while since we've touched the tile set, but it might be fun to transition between a few levels. When you beat level one, you can move to level two, so on and so forth. Okay, everyone, so as we get close to the end of this course, I want to have one quick video here for cleaning up some of the things that uh, were a little bit messy earlier on. So starting with that is increasing the double jump animation to 0 0.35 seconds. So if we take a short look at the double jump, I think it ends a little bit abruptly there. And I was finding that if we increase the animation duration a little bit, that it transitions back into its fall or jump animations a little bit smoother. So let's go into the player, the animation player. And if we find the double jump animation, we can increase the duration here to 0 0.35 seconds, change the snap to 0 0.05 seconds. And let's zoom in and just move this animation finished over to the 0.35 second mark. So now when we go back into the game, I think the animation just goes a little bit better there. The next thing I want to do is add a second pig to the game. So we're not really building our levels quite yet, but I figure this third waypoint has been sitting here for a long time. And since our angry pig is completely made, it's kind of a shame if we don't reuse some of the code. Let's just select our pig in the hierarchy and do a command or control D 
to duplicate it. If you hold Alt down while you're hovering over the pigs, it will select and move the currently selected one. So let's move this angry pig over here to the right. And now let's duplicate the waypoint three. So I'm going to Alt, so I'm going to Command D on Mac. And then I'm going to go over here to where it is in the game world. Hold Alt D to move that specific waypoint. And let's pull it over here. So since we have the code set up uh, pretty nicely, we've already created the pathing for the Angry Pig. Now we just need to define that the Angry Pig is going to use waypoints 3 and 4. So let's click on Angry Pig 2, go to the waypoints array, and let's select waypoint 3 instead of 1, and waypoint 4 instead of 3. Another small issue is that if we look at the collision shape for our angry pig and hitting the game world, we can see that it's actually bouncing a little bit above where the ground is. So that doesn't look quite right. So if we go into the angry pig, we can just take our collision shape, the main one for the actual world collisions. And then let's just take the position here and change it to a two from a three for the Y position. So this just moves it up a little bit. And now it will collide with the ground a lot better and it will look more correct. So let's just go ahead and preview where we're at so far. So our pigs are kind of a little bit more up against the ground. And we have this second angry pig. Note how its pathing distance is a lot further. But it still works just the same as the first angry pig. And that's really cool. It was so much easier to create the second enemy <laughs> than when we have to actually code everything from scratch. Reusability, yay. So um, one other issue, and this one's kind of a major thing, is that uh, with our jump mechanics, sometimes if we jump at an angle like this, we actually damage the pig, even though we're ascending, which doesn't really make sense. So what we can do is add not only a was the uh, player's jump hitbox colliding from above, but was the velocity as ascending or descending. So we should only damage the pigs if we're dropping down onto it, not when we're ascending at an angle like that. It's kind of weird. So it's a quick fix. Let's go into the player script. And then let's find where we're checking to deal damage to an enemy. So I think that might have been on jump hit box entered. And here we can see the line for if we deal damage to the enemy. Okay, so this line is just to check if we're hitting the enemy in the right way. So the position should be above. So we're going to go down here and add an extra condition, which is that the velocity dot y, I think we want that to be less than zero. We want to make sure that it's going downwards on the screen. So let's just hit play and take a look. It'll be immediately obvious. So if we jump onto the enemy, okay, whoops. <laughs> it's actually the other way. It's always a little confusing since uh, the Y direction is sort of inverted. So if we are going down, that's actually positive and negative would be going upwards on the screen and our character is going down to land on the enemy. So let's hit play, test that again one more time. Just make sure we can bounce. Yep, that's what we want. But now we can't do this weird incline damage move. In fact, what happens is we get damaged, which is kind of how it should be, I think. Okay, uh, the other thing with the angry pig, and if we go into its scene and take a look at this, let's disable the main collision shape 2D. We can see that when I made the enemy collision shape, it is actually really small, and that does favor the player a lot, but I think to the point where it doesn't make sense. So the player can be here and still not take any damage from the enemy. So I'm going to bump that width up just a bit. So let's take the enemy collision shape under the enemy collision hitbox and let's take the extents and make that 10. So now you can see that this still isn't really matching the uh, sprite frame. So you can see that this still is smaller than the sprite itself. And if we turn on the main collision shape, the one for if the pig collides with the world, you can see that's still larger. So this still so this still favors the player, but maybe it makes a little bit more sense now. Okay, so with those fixes, combat with the angry pigs should be a little bit more clean. So let's hit play and just test everything. So first off, making sure we can still do a bounce attack on the enemy. That's all good. And let's just try to be kind of sneaky and try to avoid damage. Well, uh, obviously we can see that the collision shapes are going to favor us, but not nearly as much as before. If the pig clearly collides with us, then we're still going to take damage. Okay, so another problem I notice uh, with our jumping to hit the enemy is that sometimes the check actually says that it doesn't qualify as a jump, even with the velocity uh, being going downwards. And that's because when 
it does the check. It actually looks at the numbers for our hitbox and the hurt box and compares them. And if this one is above this one at that exact frame for any reason, then it's going to say that it doesn't actually do the jump. So if you actually print out the numbers, it's only by a little bit. So we could try to adjust the collision shapes a little bit if we wanted to try to fix that. But another way would just be that when it does this check, we give it a little bit more leniency. So we can pretty much fix the problem by just adding minus one to the global position of the uh, enemy hurt box. So we just tilt it in the favor of the player again. So here we're basically saying if the player is slightly technically below the enemy, we're still gonna trigger it as a jump hit. So let's go ahead and hit play and test this out a bit. So jumping off of this platform, haven't had any problems with that before, but let's see from here, we get the jump. Okay, we hit this enemy, still works. Okay, and that jump collided. So if all your jumps are working, that's basically all we need it to do. Uh, one other thing you might consider is expanding the width of this jump hit box shape. So if we run into the enemy right about here on this pixel and this box isn't actually colliding there then it's going to make the player take damage as it kind of passes through the enemy so i'm going to take the extents here and bump that up to eight so basically we're saying that anywhere from here to here we can jump bounce on the enemy and i think that'll look a little bit more correct so if we hit play and jump there Basically, we're getting the desired result. If we're trying to go for an attack, we really don't want the player to accidentally take damage. It's only when we mess up and attack it from the sides. So that looks a lot better now. So that's basically going to cover the current cleanup for the project. One of the next things I'd like to add is for the ability for the character to fall off the edge and lose the game. But right now, we have a follow camera with no limits. So I can kind of show what will happen right now. If we go off the edge, you can see no matter where the player goes, it's just going to keep following. So it'd be kind of weird to just have a game over right here. So the next thing we're going to want to do is to take this camera and set some limits to it. So with any camera, you can manually set limits using uh, the limit category down here. So you can see left, top, right, and bottom. But I think a better way of doing that is using position 2D nodes in order to set where the top left limit is and the bottom right limit is, just like we set waypoint targets, and then to apply that to the camera 2D in a script uh, whenever the script loads. So let's go ahead and take this camera 2D. I'm going to rename it something like follow camera to be a little bit more specific. When we do that, it gives us a warning on our remote transform. So we've got to reset the path to the follow camera. Um, on this remote path thing over here. So now let's take this follow camera, right click on it and turn it into a reusable scene. It might be a little overkill, but I guess I'll create a category in here, a folder rather. So I'll right click new folder and I'll just call this camera. So if we have any other cameras, so it might be a bit redundant, but I created a folder here called camera, just right click new folder. And we go in here and we can save this scene as a reusable object there. So now let's dive into the camera scene. And in this scene, first off, we're going to want to reset the transform to 0, 0 by default. And secondly, we need to add in some position 2Ds. But we don't want the position 2Ds to move with the camera if the camera changes its position, but rather we want them to be more of a global position in our game. So we can make sure, even if it's a child, that it's not going to inherit the position by right-click, add a child node, and then using node as the base. So I could call this a bounds. And then inside of this bounds node, we'll create the position 2Ds, which are now going to have a totally separate position from the follow camera. So with the position 2D here, I'm going to call this top left. I'm going to command D duplicate it. And we'll call this bottom right. Now let's just set some default positions so that we know it's not sitting there at the origin. I'm going to select top left, hold alt down, and move the top left to right around here. And I'll do the same thing with bottom right, select it, hold alt down, move it to right about here. Now in script, when the script loads, we'll set the top left, we'll set the left and top position over here and the bottom and right positions for the camera by using this position. So let's take the follow camera, right click on it, add a script. Of course, we'll call this follow camera, save it in the camera folder. 
Now we're going to need a unready var for top left bound, or just top left rather. And let's set that equal to dollar sign top left. Now note, when you have nested children, you need the full path. So we're going to need bounds slash top left, but Godot kind of already knows what we're going for there. So it's pretty easy to have it autocomplete. So let's do unready var bottom right equals dollar sign bounds bottom right. So now in func ready, we can take the limits. Oh, let's do self dot limits. Okay, I guess you have to set each one individually, not as a whole category. So we'll do self limit. Let's start with top. And this is going to be a value. So we'll get the position, the absolute global world position of the top left. So that's going to be top left, top underscore left dot global position. And since we're dealing top, we're looking at the y value. So global position dot y. Now we need limit left equals top left global position dot x. Okay, and saving it should have no errors currently. And now we do the same thing with the bottom right. So that's going to be equals bottom right dot global position dot x because right is going left and right, which is x. So self bottom dot right equals bottom right global position dot y. And that's not bottom right here. That's hold on limit bottom. Okay. And up here, it should be limit right. So now that we have these set, all we need to do is make sure the follow camera is on level one, and then we can set the bounds. Uh, so right now, this follow camera isn't properly getting the scene. So I'll just add a new follow camera in. I'll just put it right around here. Let's delete the old one that doesn't have the bounds. And then this one, we can rename follow camera. Uh, since it has the same path as the remote transforms path, it kind of fixes itself. And now we have a camera with these bounds. So what we need to do is right click on follow camera, choose editable children. And now we can edit the top left and bottom right bounds. So the top left bounds, let's put it I don't know, somewhere over here for right now. So that'll be the top and the leftmost limits for our camera. And then down here, first let's uh, hide the game over screen, but we'll take the bottom right and let's move it to, we'll just have it set to right around there. It might be helpful to turn on a pixel grid for right now if we'd like to. Now to show that these limits are separate from the camera in terms of its position, let's select the follow camera, hold alt down and move it. So you see, even though we move the follow camera, the limits do not move their position, which is why we set up that bounds node. So now to get our limits perfect, we might want to set up a pixel grid. Maybe we want the bottom cutoff of the screen to be right here so that we can't see anything below that. So let's turn on grid snap and uh, smart snap, I guess. And now let's pull this to where it lines up here on the grid. So I'm going to pull this right around there. And we can check the transform here. We can see that this is kind of a multiple of twos. So I think that snapping is going to work out pretty well. We can always adjust it later. So now let's make sure our follow camera is actually working. I'll hit play. Okay, now note, no matter how far our character moves to the left, we can't actually go further than this left limit and the top limit as well. So you can see we're getting to the top of the screen there. So having constraints like this means we don't have to div <laughs> whoops, just died there right there. So having constraints like this means we don't have to design an endless level. So let's see when we fall off the edge here. Well, our character is gone. Technically he's still able to move. You can see we haven't game over it or anything. Uh that'll be next. We have to create kind of a dead zone where we end the game for our character. Also, uh re-enable the visibility of the game over screen if you want it to still be able to work. So next we need to create a zone which basically when the player enters we get a game over the player dies quote unquote whatever you want to call it. So um, that area will be right below our bounds. So the character goes off screen dropping below the screen and well you get the game over. Pretty standard platformer stuff. So let's start by creating such an area. I will right click on our level. Let's add a child node. It will be an area 2D. And we can call our area 2D whatever we want, maybe dead zone. I think we'll just take it and call it bottom of screen. And now we need to define 
the area for that. So I'm going to right click, add a child node, and let's add a rectangle shape, I think would work perfect for this. So we need collision shape 2D. And then I'm going to take shape, do a rectangle shape, and let's just kind of stretch the size of it. So we can say something like this. Now we just kind of need to move it into a position where it's at the right edge of the screen. So let's drag it right there, I think is about what we need it to be. We can just kind of position it as it doesn't really matter where it is left and right, since we're just going to have it be at least as big as the level size. So having it like this is okay. It just needs to be right there below the bottom of what we can visibly see. So now I can add a script to this. Let's actually make it a separate scene for right now. So I'll right click it and let's uh, save branch as a scene. So we could put this in maps or maybe another folder for something like zones or special areas uh, that we reuse across the game could be okay. So let's save it in there. I'm going to right click it and attach a script. So we could leave this as bottom of screen.gd or you might want to call it game over areas because there might be different areas in the game other than the bottom of the screen where you'd want to trigger an immediate game over. Uh, for right now, we can just call it this just so it matches our uh, scene name. I think that's the most straightforward. So let's create that. And now let's just get rid of this extra code we don't need. So as we have done a few times before, if we take area 2D, go to the inspector, then we have the ability to choose if it is monitoring and monitorable and to set what layers we're going to be colliding or checking on. So we can just turn off monitorable because nothing is really going to be needing to check on this zone. Unless you want to do it the other way around where the player checks for the zone, but I think kind of separating it out where the zones tell the player when it enters and something should happen, but the player figures that out rather than the player constantly checking for different zones. I think breaking it up this way just makes a little bit more sense to me. So I'm going to turn off monitorable. And as such, we don't need a layer down here for the collision, but we do need to check for the player layer. So let's take the mask and set that to the fourth bit for player or wherever you have it set up in your physics 2D settings. So this bottom of the screen will be able to pick up when a player enters the bottom of the screen. So we can go to node, we can do body shape entered and we can just create a receiver method for that inside of the bottom of screen script. So let's add that in. So let's uh, select bottom of screen down here, connecting from the object to itself. So for our body, when it enters, it should be a player. So it should have all the functionality that a player has. And if not, we would want to have an error thrown so that we can figure out how something entered it and was picked up without actually being a player. So we can just take our body and basically run whatever function we expect the body to have on that object. So, so maybe we can just call it body.die or something like that. And now we go into the player and we just need to create that function. So let's go down here towards the bottom. I will do put it right here, function die. And for this, we'll definitely want to trigger the game over state. So we'll want to emit this signal. Uh, just like we would if our health dropped to zero. So let's emit this signal. Player died and pass ourself as the player object to that game manager. Or rather, we're not directly passing it to the game manager. But if you recall in the game manager, we had the connection here made between the game manager whenever a player loads in the game to that player signal. So it's not directly telling the game manager, but rather it's emitting the signal so that anything connected to that signal can respond to the player dying, which means that there could definitely be other objects or depending on how our codes written, the game manager might not necessarily actually respond to that connect, but it does as written. So the other thing of course is to queue free. Now, if you had a animation for the character dying, this would be a great place to switch into that state, create a totally separate state for it run the animation when the animation is done then you queue free instead of queuing free immediately um but we don't have that animation so we're just going to do a simple queue free and move things along so so i think these are actually just going to be basically the two things we really need there so as long as we don't have any errors we might actually have everything good now so let's actually test the game and see if that works so we can still use the follow cam move to the edge but we can't see down past the bottom of the screen anymore so 
Let's just jump down there and see what happens. Well, looks like we get an immediate game over. Now, obviously, it's a little bit more fun if you do have an animation, you know, make a big deal out of it, maybe some music, that kind of thing. But that is at least a simple way to do it. Now, I do notice one other thing, which is that with our game over screen here, it's not 0% transparent. You can actually see a little bit of the background there, which isn't actually too bad. I mean, maybe I actually don't want this background to be 100% transparent, but as written, it's not supposed to do that. So let's just quickly take a look at that game over screen. And you know what the reason is? It's that in that final frame where the timer is stopped. And I think the reason for that is in that final frame where the timer's actually stopped, it's not going to do the final update here. So let's see if there's a way that we can actually update that. So if we jump into the game over screen, we can probably create a receiver method with the timer. So let's go into node. Let's see, timeout. Emitted when the timer reaches zero. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so let's connect that into the game over script. And now we have this little bit here. So all we need to do is set screen modulate color and turn this final value u to one. So there you go, more free practice with signal connections. And you can see how they get pretty useful and pretty easy to use when they be. So one of the things that's been sitting around the game since the start, but we haven't really done anything with are these thin platforms. So a really standard platforming mechanic is the ability to drop down. So a really standard platforming mechanic is to be above a platform that's thin like this and to be able to drop down below it also to be able to rise through it from jumping from down below. So as things are right now, if we jump at this platform from down below, we're just gonna bump our head on the platform, pretty much like so. So that's not what we're looking for. Also, we saw that we got a game over really quick. Let's change that health back to three, just so we don't accidentally get a game over from really simple tests like that. And uh, now we need to set up the tile map so that when we create these tiles, that they have a one-way collision so that we can pass through the bottom. So if we click on tile map and we go to our tile set over here, we can click on our terrain tiles. Let's zoom in a bit and let's look for those tiles which should have the one way collision, which are over here on the right. So if we look at the inspector now, we can see selected collision one way. So we just need to check that for all of these nine tiles and any other tiles that we'd like to be able to pass through from underneath. So let's just do those all. So now let's go ahead and hit play and we can try jumping through that. We can see uh, that we're able to jump through the ground, but when we are on the top side, we do not pass back through it. So let's just test that a little bit more and seems to basically be working. So in order for our character to pass back through down, we need to set up some kind of drop function. So in this game, how I'm going to set it up is that when you press down twice, whatever your down key is for us right now, that's S, then it will drop the character down below the platform. We wouldn't want to just automatically drop down through the platform because then it would basically be like a no collision tile. But we do want to be able to sit on top of it as well as drop down through it. So how we can set up a drop function would be with a drop timer. So let's go into the player and create another timer. The reason for this timer is that we want to check if down was pressed twice in a short period of time. And if so, then you run the drop function. So I will right click on the player, add a child node, and we will add in the timer. So let's call this timer drop timer. And I'm gonna set the wait time to 0.2 seconds. This should be at least the duration of one or two frames of animation. So I think 0.2 is working pretty well for me earlier. Let's go into the player script now. So you can kind of choose where you want to put it. I was thinking about putting it in player input, but this is more specifically just to get the left, right, up, down movement. So I guess I'll put it right beneath it. So what we're going to be doing is checking if the down button is pressed. So input.pressed and then we will see action just pressed. So that's the one we want. Then we need to choose the action down. And if this was just pressed, then we need to see if the timer is running or not. So if the timer is running already, that means we just pressed down previously, so we should drop. Otherwise, we should start the timer. So if, let's see, drop timer uh, is stopped. So it's basically just like any other timer, but we need to declare it up here on ready var drop timer equals dollar sign drop timer so if it's stopped then we want to start the timer so drop timer dot start otherwise the timer is running so we want to 
run a drop function on the player that we'll create in a second here. Now note that we don't want this timer to loop. We only want it to be running when we specifically start it up till the duration of that uh, drop down period. So click on the drop timer and then make sure one shot is checked. That's important. So now we just need to create a drop function. So I will put it kind of down here with the other movement functions, jump, wall jump. And then next we'll do function drop. Okay, so in order for our character to drop down through the platform when there's a collider there is to just adjust the position of our character. And we can just do that a single pixel. So if we take position.y and add one to it, then that will move through the collider on those platforms and our character will fall through the platform. So it's really as simple as that. So let's go ahead and hit play and test where we're at. If we come over here, we can press S twice. We fall through the platform and over there as well. Should follow through that one and this one over here. So any platform that we've set up with that one way collision should work for us. And we should also be able to jump straight through it. If you find it a little bit hard to pass through sometimes, you could consider bumping up the wait timer to 0.25 seconds. And if for some reason you find you're not able to pass through one of the platforms, uh, just go check the tile set and make sure that that one way collision is checked. So this is just for a bug fix, but one thing I've noticed is that for our character trying to do jump damage to an enemy, sometimes this global position isn't always consistent. So I think we might be able to just actually get rid of the collision check and then just check if the velocity is a falling velocity and leave it as that. So let's go ahead and hit play and see if this will work for us. So our character can bounce. Let's test from a higher position. We can do the falling wall jump. Okay, and then there as well. And then let's just retest. Shouldn't be able to deal damage from below. And yeah, that's still the case. So I guess in this case, simpler is better. So I'm just going to leave that position check out of it. Since sometimes the position of the hitbox can be a little bit below the hurt box. You could also have a bigger adjustment in favor of the player. But even if you do that, there may still be extreme examples where the character's hit box is, for some reason, 10 pixels below the enemy's hurt box. So this just seems to be a much more straightforward solution. Okay, and now we can just go do one final test, making sure all of our platforms work and that we can damage the enemies correctly. So that seems to be much, much more fluid and just better in general. So how you design your level is pretty much up to you. We already created all the tools for it. So if you wanna add some extra tiles of platforms, we can go into the tile map. And of course, creating additional angry pigs is just gonna be a matter of duplicating them or dragging the scene from our file system and creating new waypoints for them to go between. So first off, as a trick that you can use, you can use this select function when you have the tile map selected and we can just select all of these tiles. I'm gonna control X them away or command X on Mac. And you can see that you can paste it in, but really I'm just gonna get rid of all of this. So let's switch back to the pencil tool and I'm just gonna go ahead and draw what I need. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and create level two. I think the quickest way to get it started off is just gonna to be to duplicate level one. So I'm going to go into my maps folder and right click level one, duplicate that, and I'm just gonna call it level two. Now we can open it up. And obviously I'm gonna rename the root node to level two. So to make it obvious that it is a different level, the first thing I will change for it will be the background. So let's change this to, I suppose, uh, let's say the purple color background. So now level one and level two are distinctive from each other. Let me go ahead and create a level two.
so now you've basically gone ahead and created a level one a level two and we have a level three but that's really just so that level two can transition into level three so now let's go ahead and create our way for the character to move from level one to level two so i'm going to use the area 2d for this which will trigger that event where we jump levels so i'm going to right click on level one add a child node we want an area 2d at the bottom i'm going to rename this and we can call it map move we might not necessarily be calling them levels so we want to be a little generic here plus the folder is called maps so uh with map move i'm going to save this as a new scene right click save branch as scene and let's put it in zones since this is an area which triggers some kind of event kind of like the bottom of screen game over event so let's save this here and then let's dive into the scene so for our map move area we're going to need a triggering a collision shape so let's do a collision shape 2d i'm going to make the default for this a rectangle shape and then we can see it in our level one so i'm going to select the map move and let's hold alt and move it up around here so clearly this won't be a big enough collision shape to really uh, justify being the end of the level so we'll probably make this bigger but another thing we want to do is actually give the players a way to indicate that it is the end of the level so that they know what goal they're shooting for. So inside of the art for this game, we can check Art Pixel Adventure 1 and go down to Items and Checkpoint. And we can find a pretty cool flag that we can use for the end of this level. So I'm going to go into the map move scene. And let's add a sprite here. And so if I drag this checkpoint onto the screen, we can see there's a bunch of frames of animation for this. So I'm going to hit Control Z to undo adding that sprite. And a perfect node for us would be a animated sprite node. So I'm going to search for that. And then we're going to take this flag idle and pop it into frames. Well, first we've got to create a new sprite frames. So click on frames empty, new sprite frames. And now let's add in that flag idle animation. So I'll rename the animation add, and I'll click here, add frames from a sprite sheet. So let's go into items, checkpoints, checkpoint, flag idle. Okay, and let's get all of those frames. It looks like there is 10 of them. So we want 10 horizontal, one vertical, and then select clear all frames, add them in, and then make sure that this animation is playing and put the FPS at 20. Now we are also going to want to move this animated spray object up. So I'm going to hold alt down and move it up. Having snapping may help here. Then let's also take the collision shape and move it up as well. And if you need to at any point, you can also turn snapping off. It's not a requirement. And we want to resize the collision shape to be a little bit bigger than our flag. So this will be a good end of the level point for our character to reach. Now we can look at level one and we can position this map move goal. I guess I'll put it right around there. Now, if we go back into our map move, we can define the collision layers we need, which is basically going to be to pick up when the player enters it. So open collision on the right, like we did for every other area, uh, turn off world mask and world layer, and then put player as the mask. And you can also turn off monitorable because this is going to be because this is going to be a one way event. So we're only going to check for the player. Okay, so now we just need to add in a simple script to our map move. So I'm going to attach a script, let's create it. And in this script, we're going to need one receiver method, which is going to come from the area 2d, you probably know where I'm going with this body shape entered on the node section on the right, body shape entered, connect to the uh, map move script. And here it should only be players that enter. So when the player enters this area, we want to switch levels. So we can do get scene dot change scene two, and we're going to need a packed scene here. So how we can define our packed scene for the script is we create an export variable. So we're going to export a packed scene variable, and we can say destination scene. Uh, and now, of course, we need to use that variable as our parameter. So paste that down there. Now, if we click on our map move, we should be able to see that we can set a destination scene here. So on level one, I'm going to take our map move, and we're going to set the destination scene as level two. So you can click here, load a scene. And of course, we're going to go into maps level two, you can see a little preview for our scene there. 
let's go into level two and let's add a map move scene. We'll put it right over here for the end of this level. Uh, make sure it's not on the tile map, of course. But uh, in terms of hierarchy, you may want it above the player so that it shows um, behind the player rather than in front of it. So let's move that. OK, I'm going to turn off snapping here so we can get it just right. That looks about right. So let's take the destination scene here and make it level three maps level three. OK, now we can kind of play test our game here a little bit. I'm going to hit play. OK, going to just run through this level real quick. OK, got to get past this pig without taking too much damage. Just kind of ignore him and uh, do the drop down function to get down here. I required that intentionally and just a little bit of a precise jump there. Let's get to the second level. Ah, OK, and I did run into this issue earlier. So it turns out that um, checking if a object is not null is not good enough here. So what you actually want to use here, and this is back in that game manager script we set up, is is instance valid? And of course, this is going to be active player. So if you've created an object in your game and you want to make sure that it is still there before you run something, this is the right code. If you check if it does not equal null, then this can end up running instead, which obviously isn't going to work when the active player has already been removed from the scene. So now we can go ahead and rerun the level and it should run this time. So let's bounce on that guy. Note the uh, damage attack. This is a little tricky here in terms of game design. That might be a little unfair, but we're still just testing around. So let's get to that second level and then boom, we enter level two. Of course, uh, we might want a transition of some kind, kind of like we did with the game over screen. Here we got to jump down. OK, we got an angry pig to deal with. Going to jump up here. And here it's a little bit tricky because we have to stay away from the bottom of the screen. So that's going to require kind of doing a double jump. And then we got to keep jumping around. OK. Ah, well, it seems to be a little bit of a bug there with that one way collision. I think it's set up for the wrong direction. So I'll have to check that one out because you can see I can fall through there, but I can't go back up. And then for the rest of the level, ooh, well, I do got to fix the camera bounds, but you can see uh, I went to level three there. And once again, the one way collision is the wrong direction there. So let's fix the camera bounds on level two. I'm going to lock the tile map so that I accidentally don't mess around with that. Let's grab the top left and move it to around here. Actually, it should be lined up with the left side. So that's our bound. And then down here. And then down here, the bottom right bound. We'll set that up to be right there, I think. Oh, OK, so here is an issue when you are building your tile maps. Um, you got to make sure that you don't accidentally rotate your tiles. So you can see here that these platforms are obviously going down below. So if you press A, S, and possibly some other keys like Z and X on your keyboard, you can actually rotate the tiles that you're placing. So if you want a one way tile that is going to go uh, way basically from down below, you can jump up, then you want to make sure that that is facing the top like this. But if you accidentally hit the Z key, you're going to be flipping uh, the Y to the bottom, and then that's going to reverse the direction for your one way collisions. So likewise, I'll come up here and uh, fix this one because it shouldn't be on the top, but flipped to the bottom with the Z. But it should rather be just top facing. So this should prevent the character from accidentally falling through the floor here without actually doing the drop move. That would be pretty annoying. So let's just move this flag down a little bit. And now that platform should work as expected. And likewise, on level three, it's kind of silly if we drop the player right into the ocean here. So let's fix that one as well. So let's see. Auto tile. Let's put this platform and remove the one that is on top. So there we go. That should fix that issue. And we even learned something in the process. So uh, now we can just go ahead and play test the game one more time. Now that we've fixed the camera bounds and we've fixed the platform directions. Okay, so we got our hop there. Didn't take any damage getting this way. And we get to our level two. OK, 
Okay, took some damage there. Got to do the tricky jump. And... Ah, okay. There we go. Now that's working correctly. And let's just finish up the game. And boom. Okay, everything's working well. Okay, next let's create a simple health UI so that we can show the health of the player at any given times. So I'll go down to the canvas layer. So if we want to keep things simple, we can just add in a simple control. And then this control is going to be the health bar. Uh, so then below the health bar, we're going to need to add in a texture rect. So I'm going to right click here on the health bar, add a child node, and then choose texture rect. And then for the texture inside of this texture rect, I'm going to use the Kiwi health indicator. And so I basically took that image right out of this Kiwi fruit from the pixel adventure one you can see this image right here so i just extracted the first frame and it is 18 by 18 pixels now so i bring this into the texture and it's going to appear there and if we change stretch mode to tile we can keep repeating this as much as we need so if we control the size of our texture rect kind of like so but in code then we can show how many health points the player has left at any given point Let's get rid of that Kiwi texture and then let's hit play and kind of make sure it does appear there in the top left. Maybe we want a bit of a margin as well. So I can take the health bar and we can give it a top and left margin of five. Okay, that seems positioned a little bit better now. So now the health bar is going to need to know how many health points the player has at any given time. So it knows how many Kiwis to show. One health equals one Kiwi. So I'm going to add a script to our health bar. Right click on the health bar, attach script. And let's see, it's not going to be under maps. This should go under the UI folder. So health bar, let's open and create. So in our health bar, when the script loads, we can try to find the player, which should be in the game manager. So I'm going to put in a func ready. And we're going to basically set the active player equal to the active player from the game manager. So let's create a var active player and let's do active player equals game manager dot active player. So now let's create a signal for our player, but instead of putting it in player, let's actually put it in character dot GD. So any character can emit this signal, but we don't necessarily need to connect to it for every object like the angry pigs. So let's create a signal in character and this is going to be health changed and we're going to pass new health here so before we assign the value of the new health to the health variable we can see if they are the same and if not then we emit health changed because the number is different now so if health does not equal value then we'll emit the signal health changed and we'll pass the value as the new health total that we're going to be uh, sending out to anything connected to the script. So now with our health bar, we can connect to that active player.connect and we want to connect to the health changed. The receiving object is ourself, the health bar, and we're going to create a on health changed message. Uh, this way, by using a signal rather than checking the health on every single frame, it's just a little bit more efficient. So we're going to write func on health changed here. And uh, this is actually going to take the new health. And so uh, let's get reference to our texture rect. So up here, I'll do a on ready var texture rect equals dollar sign texture rect. And we'll multiply the width of that texture rect equal to the new health times 18 pixels because that is the width of this sprite image. So make sure that your uh, texture rect is equal to the number of health you have multiplied by the width of your image size. So let's do texture rect dot, let's see, would be width, or we can actually click on it and just check. So, so I guess that's rect dot size dot x. So let's find that rect dot size dot x, and we'll make that equal to sprite width times the new health. And we can make a variable up here so that we can set the sprite width in the inspector. So let's see, export int var sprite width. 
equals 18 since that's just the default I'm using. And we can see if that actually works. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play. Okay, we still have that there. Let's see what happens when you take damage. Nothing yet. Uh, because I forgot the underscore up here. So that's a method that doesn't exist. Now they have the same name. So let's go out and hit play and see if we can get this to work. Okay, we take the damage. Let's continue. Invalid kit index rect on texture rect. So it looks like what you actually want is rect underscore size, and then we can set the x value of that. So rect size is a vector two, and we only care about the x, so we're setting that there. So let's go ahead and hit play and see if that fixes it up. And yeah, okay, that seemed to basically work, yeah. Okay, we have one health left, and then, of course, after that, we uh, lose the game, but it's not updating with that last health. So it seems like with the default settings, it can't actually go less than that one texture image. Um, so there's probably a handful of ways we could solve this, but I think the quickest way that comes to mind would just be to disable the texture rect if the health is zero. So if new health is equal, Okay, well, let's say less than or equal to zero. Then we'll just take the texture rect visible and we'll set that to false. Else, I guess if we ever hit zero, but then for some reason it went higher, we'll just say that its visibility is equal to true. So now we can hit play and let's see what happens. Okay, well, first off, we set the health to two. So it expanded, it goes down and then now it gets disabled entirely because the health is set to zero. Now, seeing that at the start of the game, it actually only showed one, we need a little bit more code. So when this is set up, we should actually set the health bar to be equal to the starting health of the player. So we'll run this once as well. Um, we're going to want the health of the player. So we'll do active player dot health. And theoretically, we don't actually need to keep a reference to this anymore since we're really using the signal to respond to it. So let's do var active player, var active player connect. Actually, just one var active player connect. So we get the active player, we connect to the active player, we set the health bar up for the current player's health, and whenever the player takes damage, we respond to that. Okay, now everything should be working good. So at the start of the game, we have three health. So no, it expanded to that and we take one damage. Let's take another damage. And then now, well, we lose our third health and it's the end. So that's basically how we set up the health bar. Just make sure that you save it as a scene so that you can reuse it across your game. So I'm going to hit up. I'm going to put it in UI health bar dot scene. And we can make sure that it is on the future levels. But uh, to go one step beyond that, I think a good way to do this would be to set up a base canvas layer that we use for every game. So I will just call this game UI and let's create a scene from this. So say branch as a scene, and this will be our parent object, the game UI. So we can go to level two now, and I'm gonna cut this away and we'll cut it from level three as well. And then we're just gonna put in the game UI scene if we need to add something to every level of our game now, it'll all be in one single UI. And if you do need to see any of the children at any point in time, you can right click on your game UI and do editable children and you can still see the health bar and the game over screen. So uh, make sure all your levels are saved. And if you hit play, hopefully it still works and everything. So let's get hit. Okay. And let's actually just jump to the next level. Okay level reset, our health reset, because it's a new player. And well, that's basically up there. Now, uh, when the level ends and we don't take damage to actually cause the defeat, we might also want to add in just removing of that health bar as well. So I think what we can do with our health bar is just respond to the game over event from our game manager. Uh, since we have to reference the game manager at the on ready of our health bar anyway, we might as well just reference this signal and have a on player died or on game over. So let's go to our health bar. And when we get the game manager, we can also connect to that. So let's see, game manager dot connect game over self 
on game over. Okay, and I'll put the underscore there for receiver method, and we'll create that receiver method. So function underscore on game over. And we just need to take the visibility of the texture rect and set that to false. So let's copy this code, paste it in there. And now if we get a game over for any other reason than uh, the player taking damage, like for instance, just falling off the edge here, then that is going to show it invisible, which is kind of what we would expect. So in this part, which may be the last for the course, we're going to build out a second enemy, kind of more of a fun activity. And the enemy we're going to create is a bee that flies around with a projectile. We'll be able to reuse some of the same code from Angry Pig, possibly moving some of it into the enemy script so that it's reusable. And then we'll be adding extra stuff to it. Obviously, projectiles are something we haven't done yet uh, for this game prototype. So we need to add that in. So just like the angry pig, the bees are also going to move between waypoints, but they'll be able to move vertically as well. They won't just be going left and right. And they also won't respond to the position of the player in the same way that the angry pig would, where the player enters this area and then the angry pig moves faster. So we can move the waypoint code into the enemy class for enemies that are going to use the waypoint. And then we can have them each have their own move method where they figure out how fast they're moving and in what direction. So let's go ahead and open up the Angry Pig script. So basically, we're going to take everything here and move it into the enemy script as a function called waypoint move. So let's go ahead and write that here and we'll pass delta into it. So now in our enemy script, let's go up here and we can write function waypoint move, which is going to take delta and paste that in there. So when we do that, we can see that we don't have the waypoint position. So we need to take that out of Angry Pig as well. So the the B or other enemies are going to have all of this stuff over here. Waypoint arrived distance for switching waypoints, uh, an array of waypoints to go between, the starting waypoint, the position index, all of that, and probably also faces right as well. So let's just cut that into the enemy script. And we can kind of position that up here. So as long as enemy has it, that'll clear up any of the problems that we have for the angry pig as well. So obviously we have an error where we don't have the set waypoint index method. So we need to take that out of angry pig as well. So let's just cut and paste that into the enemy script. Another error we have is for our pig specific moving. So rather than all of this in the enemy script, we will create a function that we can implement on each specific enemy for their own custom move. And then we can call it get move velocity. And that's going to take the delta and also the direction which we're moving towards. So we calculate that by figuring out where the waypoint is going to. So if we're doing a waypoint move, we're moving towards those we're moving towards those waypoints. So now we just need to make sure we have a virtual function down here. So get move velocity. So this will take delta and direction. And if we run this, we're going to want to print an error because it hasn't been implemented. So you can just write an error message like that. So the idea is if when the script is actually running, it runs this enemy version of the method, we get an error and we should implement it in the top level character, the angry pig or the B. So this is just telling us, hey, we need to write more code so that this function can run properly on the final enemy. And this over here is going to return the velocity so that we can use it for our move and slide. So let's just put uh, our velocity equals get move velocity. Okay, so now for everything we cut out that should go here, we just take that into angry pig. So let's go into the angry pig and implement that function. So underscore get move velocity delta direction. And then just paste that in. And instead of setting the velocity, we're going to be returning that. We may also want to take the var velocity out of here because we don't really need it in this script anymore at the moment. Then just make sure those are a tab over to the left. So for the other bit of code, we were using this before to determine if it should move left and right. Um, since we're passing in the full direction into this function, we will put this in two different places. So back in, so back in the enemy script, I'm going to paste this in so that we can use it for checking if it should face right or face left. 
Then just lastly, we need to get that returned velocity, store it to a variable here. So var velocity equals uh, get move velocity. We pass that down here. And the animated sprite will move that up from the angry pig into our enemy class, as well as the animation tree as well. Pretty much every enemy is going to need both of those. So let's just paste those in there. Okay, so next we should go back into the angry pig and make sure all of the errors are taken care of here. Here we can see one of uh, velocity y is getting added to the game gravity. So the character basically still has its gravity. So for that reason, what we should really do here is set the new velocity equal to this move velocity and then have a variable up here, which all of the enemy types will be able to access. So if our velocity, and this will be a vector two, uh, we could even initialize it to a vector two dot zero by default. And then the movement slide, I believe that returns the velocity. So if we have any collisions, this should update the velocity for us as well. So now that velocity is declared here, if we go check at the angry pig in here, then this velocity y is going to be using the velocity y from the enemy. Another way we could do it, if you think it's a little less messy, is we could pass the current velocity in as a variable and then use that in the script and return it back outwards. This should work for now, so I'm not too concerned about it. So now what we should really do is make sure that the angry pig works the same as it did before, even though all we did is move stuff out of the angry pig into the enemy script. So let's go ahead and hit play and test that out. Yeah, it looks like our enemy is still moving. So now what we can do is take our angry pig scene and duplicate it in the file system and use that as the base for our B. So I'm gonna come down here where we have angry pig scene. I'm gonna do a alt D and duplicate that and we'll call this B.tscn. So that's our B scene. Now we can open uh, up that scene. And first I'm gonna rename the character to B up here at the top. So next we can go down each of these and remove and add what we need. So first off, we don't need an angry detection zone in this script. So I'm going to just completely get rid of that. And if you see errors pop up down here, it's not letting you see the inspector. Just switch to another scene and come back. And uh, now that should clear that up. So we can remove the angry detection scene. Um, for the animated sprite, we're going to want to redefine that to the sprites for our B character. So I know that the B has a hit animation, an idle animation and an attack. We're going to delete the ones that aren't relevant to us here. So let's just delete that one. And now we can add in an attack. And making sure that's 20 FPS. The hit animation will keep at 10 FPS. Add them in and do the same thing for a hit and attack. So let's delete all the current frames, go to hit five horizontal, one vertical, select all, add, attack animation, eight frames, so eight horizontal, one vertical, select all, add. Okay, and there's our little attack animation playing there. Next in the animation tree, we can uh, set this up for our new character as well. So first off, there's no hit variations. There's just gonna be one hit animation for this character, so we can get rid of all that. Next, there's not gonna be any player detection zone. There's only one idle animation, which we're going to be using for the bee flying around. So we don't need that either. But we are going to need one more one shot for an attack. So this will go before the hit one shot. Taking damage being hit takes priority over doing an attack. So one shot. And then this is the attack. Okay, so the output feeds into the input for that. And we need the hit animation to go into here. I'll actually delete that for a second. We need to update our animation player. So in the animation player, going to rename hit one to just hit. And then for the animation, make sure this is selected as hit. We can leave hit animation finished because we'll be creating a version of that for our B as well. Hit two, we're just going to delete that. And then idle, I think we can leave that one as is just make sure idle is the right animation playing on the animation sprite. And then run, we delete that. And then walk, uh, we can either delete that or you can just rename it to attack. So I'm going to rename this to attack. And I know that later on, this is going to be a one shot. So I'm going to change the duration to 0.4 and not looping 0.4 because it has eight frames at 20 frames per second. And then down here, we can add a track call method track on the B, but we haven't created the method, so we can't really add it in there yet. So our idle looks like that. Our hit will have the animation finished going on there. And then attack is over here. 
Okay, so now back in the animation tree. For the one shots, make sure that their fade in, fade out time is zero. We want them to play immediately after entering those animations. That's important. And then for, okay, first off, I'm going to change that default animation to idle because <laughs> having it flash white on the screen all the time is pretty annoying. So uh, down here, let's right click, add an animation, and let's do hit, connect that to the one shot. And then for the one shot over here, the attack, we want the attack animation. So animation, attack, connect that into the one shot. And then for all other cases, we just want it to do the idle animation. So connect that in here. So this is basically our simplest animation blend tree yet. Just make sure you have two one shots, hit goes before attack, and that both of them have the fade in, fade out time set to zero, and then connect the animations as you need. Okay, so this character is still gonna have a jump hurt box. Um, since we're not checking for the position anymore on the hurt boxes, I think just making a bigger shape might actually help a little bit uh, for the player hitting the character. I don't know, I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger there so that there's more area for the player to hit. So I'm just taking the Y value and setting it to 3. It's not really necessary, but but I don't think it hurts either. The enemy collision hitbox, uh, we'll still use that for our enemy. All of the enemies are going to be able to run into the player to deal damage to it. This character will also be able to launch a projectile. Okay, so now we need to detach the Angry Pig script from this B. So right click detach, and then I'm going to right click attach a script. So we're creating a new script in the characters enemies folder. It's going to be called b.gd. And this is actually going to inherit from enemy. So let's uh, just change up here and we'll type in enemy, hit create. So now when we create the script at the top, it extends enemy. That's what we want to see. Uh, let's cut that away. And now we can start working on this B script. So like other characters in the game, we're still going to have states in a sense. So I'm going to put enum state and the three states for this character are going to be idle, hit when it takes damage and attack when it's playing the attack animation. We're going to make sure that the enemy can't move while it's attacking. For this script, I think we'll make it so that the enemy doesn't move while it's attacking only while it's in the idle state, uh, though you could have it attack and move at the same time. It depends what you want. We're also going to need a speed for the character to move. So export float var fly speed. And I'll set that to 50 by default. So later we're going to set up a projectile, of course. So we can include that as something we can spawn an instance of for our B uh, by having an export packed scene variable. So export packed scene. And then we just tell the B with this variable what scene from our project, that's a TSCN file, that we want to create a copy of. And this would just be a var projectile. We're also going to need a current state variable and then a set current state function. So I think we can actually put that in enemy as well. So, so this character is also going to need a current state uh, variable and a set git for the set current state. So this character is also going to need a current state variable and a set current state setter function. So we might consider uh, pulling that line of code from Angry Pig into Enemy so that basically every character has a current state to set. And then we can define a custom set current state method for each one. So in Angry Pig, I'm just going to pull this out. So like the player, we're also going to need a current state variable. So variable current state, and we're going to set that equal to state.idle by default. We're going to write a setter function for it, set current state. So when we enter a state, we want certain things to happen for this character. And we're also going to need an attack direction and an attack target for launching projectiles. So the, so the attack direction is going to be the direction to launch the projectile in. And then down here, we're going to have the attack target. And then down here, we're going to have the attack target when a player enters the radius of the B for attacking it's going to be locking on to that player and it's going to keep launching projectiles at that player until the player leaves the attack zone. And we're going to want the projectiles to launch periodically, not on every single frame, but more like once every second, or you could even slow it down further than that. So we're going to want a timer. So I'm going to right click on our enemy, add a child node. Let's create a timer. And then this can be attack timer. Make sure that it is a one shot on the right and you can make the wait time however long you want between projectile launches. So a wait time of one second means it launches one attack per second. Now we can get reference to that attack timer. So unready var attack timer equals dollar sign 
attack timer. And there's a couple other nodes in our hierarchy that we need to get access to, like the enemy collision hitbox, so that we can turn it on and off depending on the state. So on ready var enemy collision hitbox equals dollar sign enemy collision hitbox. Okay, so next we can write our physics process function. So underscore physics process. We only want to have the character move in one state. So let's match the current state. And if the state is idle, then we're going to move. So state.idle. And then we're going to do waypoint move delta. So remember that uh, requires us to set up how the character moves. If we go back to enemy, we can see waypoint move has this function we need to implement. We'll do that in a second, but everything else about moving between waypoints is taken care of for us. So half of that is already written and it's just kind of a time saver. As the frames are running, if we're in the idle state, then we can start attacking the player if it is there. So I'll just put a comment here to let us know to add it later. So we'll set that up in a minute. Now let's work on our character's movement. It's going to be super simple for the B. So we're implementing get move velocity, which takes delta and and direction. And all we need to do is return the new velocity, which is going to be fly speed times direction. So the direction is basically the so the direction is going to be pointing towards the waypoint. So our character just moves towards the waypoint when it's in the idle state at the speed of the fly speed. And that's really all we need for that. We should also implement a function get hit. This will take damage and float. So every enemy needs to have some version of this. So self so self dot health minus equals damage. And we'll change the current state to state dot hit. We need to implement set current state new state. Now we need to write this function down here. So function set current state, and this would be new state. So we can make sure that the current state is equal to the new state. And of course, we'll add more into here for when our characters enter a certain state, we want stuff to happen. But let's see where we're at. But let's see where we're at right now. So let's go to level one. And let's add a copy of the B into here. So our B, we need new waypoints for it. So I'll duplicate the waypoints with command or control D. And let's just move these waypoints. I don't know, we'll put it over here for testing purposes, I guess. Okay, and then waypoint six. So the B will move here, and then it will transition over to moving this way. Uh, but that's only if we actually set up those as the waypoints. So click on B and create a and then set the waypoints array to size of two. And now let's choose waypoints five and waypoint six. Okay, now we can hit play and see how it's working so far. Okay, uh, looks like we got the error where the waypoint position hasn't been set yet. So let's close that. Let's go to the angry pig where I think we need this bit in the enemy. So the waypoint index needs to be set to the starting waypoint at the start of the script. Or really, rather than having this, we could just make it an on ready var. So the waypoint index will be the starting waypoint. Let's delete that. Go to enemy. Waypoint index is going to default to the starting waypoint. And we have to make this a on ready var. So that way we can have this set up without um, having a ready function and possibly overriding an old. So that way we can solve that problem without having to create a ready function inside of here for that. So let's go ahead and hit play and see where we're at again. Okay, so up here, uh, we also need to set the waypoint position by default. So I think we can do that with a on with a waypoint position. And We'll get the waypoints at the starting waypoint. And then. So in order to get this as an on ready bar, let's get the node at the um, let's get the node at the zero position of this node path, the starting waypoint. So we want waypoints at the array position starting waypoint, which is zero. And then we can get the position of that. Okay. And then, and then we can get the position of that, which should be a vector 2D. All right, let's go ahead and hit play and see if that helps. Okay, yeah, that seems to work. So our B is uh, going between the waypoints. Our angry pig goes between the waypoints. Let's see if we can damage the B currently. Yes, okay, currently you can, but it's not playing the hit animation. 
Okay, next in our set current state for the B, let's match the new state. And let's set up some things to happen depending on which state gets entered. So if we enter state.idle, we want to take the collision hitbox of the enemy and turn that on, meaning that this enemy can run into the player and deal damage to the player when it's in the idle state. So that's going to be enemy collision hitbox dot dot set deferred. Uh, since that when you are setting these properties on the area 2Ds, it has to be done with a set deferred method. And we're turning off and we're turning on monitoring. And we're turning on monitoring, which means we make that true. Okay, so that's going to mean that our character can deal damage to players again. And we also want to take the variable can be hit and set that to true as well. So this is what the player is currently checking for on any enemy to see if it can do a jump attack on it and deal damage to it. Next, we want um, state.attack. So we'll just set this up in advance. So in state attack, uh, just in case it, for some reason it's not, we do want the monitoring to be true here. So it can still collide with the player when it's doing a projectile attack. And we also want it to be able to hit the player still. So I'm going to, so I'm going to copy paste that. Um, the only difference here is that we want to turn on the animation tree parameter for attack active. So take the animation tree and let's set the parameters attack active and we're setting that to true. So as long as it's not currently playing the hit animation, it'll play the attack animation as a priority over idle, which is what we would want in the attack state. And then lastly, for state.hit, we want to take the monitoring and turn that off. So we're disabling the enemy's ability to deal damage to the player. We may also want to turn off can be hit so that the enemy can't be hurt while it's in the hit state. Otherwise, the character can just keep bouncing on top of it and kill it very quickly. And then we also want to set the animation tree parameter here. I'm just going to copy paste, except now we're changing it to the hit parameter instead of the attack parameter. So when the enemy gets hit, we don't want it to suddenly launch a projectile at the player. I think that would be a little bit unfair. So we can actually start our attack timer here as well. So I'm going to do attack timer dot start. Our timer is set to one second. So while that timer is running, no attacks will be made, which means this is saying that when the enemy gets hit, there'll be at least a one second delay before it starts attacking again. Now, so that we can clean up the animations a bit, let's also create a couple functions uh, when our one shots are done, we want to return to the idle state. So let's create function hit animation finished. So at this point, we just want to go back to idle state. So self.current state equals state.idle. And then we'll also set up attack animation finished. So like hit animation finished, we'll do self.current state equals state.idle. But if we take a look at the attack animation, uh, we can see that this is the buildup for the character launching its attack. So the timing we actually want to launch the projectile is going to be at the end of our attack animation. So this is a perfect place to put launch projectile, which we will set up in a bit. So launch projectile. And then let's go ahead and create that launch projectile function. For now, we'll just pass. Now let's go to the animation player and let's set up those callback functions. So I'm going to insert a key here. Um, Okay, let's see. That's the attack. So we want to do on attack finished, wherever we have that. Okay, attack animation finished. And just make sure that that's the right one being called here. Now let's go to hit. And then we want on hit finished. So I'm going to click there. It looks like it's already set up from the angry pig. So hopefully we should be able to go between hit and idle correctly now. So I'm going to hit play. And let's try jumping on the B. Okay, it looked like it hit the hit animation and it does return to idle after that 0.5 seconds is done just to test one more time okay seems to be working good okay next we need to create a projectile for our b to be able to launch so let's go create a new scene i'm going to create this as a kinematic body 2d since it is going to move and we're going to add of course a collision shape to it this collision shape so i'll rename the attack here b sting or the projectile rather and let's save this in a new folder. I'm going to call this projectiles. And we will save that in there. So our collision shape. To... Now we also need the sprite for our beasting. So I'm going to add in a sprite. 
And then let's go into our art and find that attack. So B, and then we have the bullet here. So I'm going to put that in the texture. So continuing on our B sting projectile, the main collision shape for the kinematic body 2D, we're only going to have it collide with the world for basically deleting the projectile. But then to deal damage to the player, we're going to have a separate area that checks basically by using collision layers if it's a player and then dealing damage to that player before deleting the projectile. So let's take the B sting object and set the default collision layers to basically just be world and world. So for our B sting kinematic body 2D, we're going to turn off layer world. Uh, this object is only going to try to collide on the world layer. So I think that's all we need there. And then uh, let's define the collision shape for that. So we'll just use a capsule shape. I think that fits this little uh, bee stinger, which kind of looks like a tooth to me. Let's adjust the size and shape of it. And uh, also I'm going to position the sprite above here so that we can see the collision shape layered on top of the sprite. And that looks pretty good to me right there. I might even just tone it down just a little bit more favor the player when it comes to collisions with this object. So now we need another area 2D for dealing damage to the player. So let's add a area 2D. And then I'm just going to duplicate this collision shape 2D. And we're just going to put it down here for that too. It's basically the same shape is for world collisions and for player collisions. But on the area 2D, we check for players. And on the kinematic body, we check for enemies. So here, uh, we're going to turn off monitorable. We're going to turn off the layer and the mask for world and we're going to turn on mask for player which i have set to the fourth option over here the fourth bit so now we can rename this something like attack area i suppose and we can put in a script for our b sting so for right now we're just going to have this inherit from kinematic body 2d and we'll go ahead and hit create okay so our b sting script is going to be relatively straightforward let's delete all of that up there for right now so our projectile is going to need to know how much damage it deals. So export float var damage equals one by default. We'll export a float for the move speed of this projectile as well. We'll make it a little faster than the B itself. Move speed of 100 by default. And now we're going to need a variable for the target direction. And we'll default this to vector2.0. Now we're going to need to update this object for every frame it's existing in the world. So we'll run physics process. And here we'll get the collision that occurs when we move and we'll do a move and collide. Uh, up to this point in the game, we've been doing move and slide, but we don't actually want the projectile to slide along the edge of anything. So we're just doing move and collide. And then if it collides with anything, which is currently only going to be on the world layer, for the kinematic body 2D itself, then we're just gonna delete it. So we're using move and collide instead of move and slide. So there won't be any slide functionality. And we need the move speed, which we declared up there at the top, times the target direction, which we will get uh, from the launching object when we go ahead and create this. And then we'll multiply that by delta. Remember that move and collide does not automatically account for delta, which is a time between frames. So you need to multiply by delta when you are using move and collide. You don't need to do that for move and slide, which we've been using for the rest of this course. So just keep that in mind. And if we have a collision, so I'll do if is instance valid on this collision, then we're going to queue free, which just removes this projectile from the game. So now we need to set up when we hit a player. So we'll use this attack area, go over to node and do body shape entered and connect that to our B sting. So now we have on attack area, body shape entered. This should always be a player. And when it's not a player, we probably want it to send an error of some kind. So just do body dot get hit damage. Any player should be able to do that. And I think we actually set it up for character, but that should work for right now. And then after dealing damage to the player, we queue free because we're removing the projectile from the game. And that is it for our B sting script. So now let's go to the B scene. Let's click on B inspector. And let's load the projectile in for our projectile packed scene. So over here, load, let's go to projectiles and choose beasting.tscn. Okay, so we should be able to see a little preview of our B there. We can see resources projectile slash beasting.tscn. So that should be able to create that. Uh, now we actually need to create the method for launching the projectile from the B. 
So we created launch projectile, but we haven't done anything with it. And we're actually going to need to pass a parameter into here, which is going to be the target direction, which we'll be passing along to the B sting as well. So target direction, vector 2D, and then that direction will come from an attack direction. And we'll be setting that up in a minute. So when we launch the projectile, first we have to create an instance of it. So I'll do var launched projectile over here. And that's going to be equal to projectile dot instance. So that packed scene, we're creating a copy of it inside of our level scene when we whenever we run this method. So with the new projectile, we need to set the position of it. So launch projectile dot global position. And we want that to be equal to the position of our B object. So we're creating the projectile at the B's location, and then it moves from there. So equals global position of this object. And then we need to set the rotation of the launched projectile to match our attack direction. Otherwise, it'll look a little funny. This will just make the animation look better. So launched projectile. And I'm going to do a plus equals on the angle because we might have to adjust that in the projectile uh, scene itself to set up the default direction for the projectile. And then this changes it, rotates it to where it should be facing based on its trajectory. So let's do target direction dot angle. So this basically converts this 2D vector to an angle that the rotation can actually understand. So launch projectile dot rotation should be on the left and then plus equals target direction dot angle. Next, let's add the launch projectile to our current scene. So get tree and then get current scene. And we add a child to that. So we're adding the child of this launched projectile. So this bit line basically means that when we're in our level one, it's going to find this level one uh, root object. And we're going to add it as a child down here to exist inside of our scene. And then the last line we need here is to set the target direction of the launched projectile. So launched projectile dot target direction equals target direction. Now, what is this target direction and how do we actually set up the launching of the projectiles up here? So in order to attack the player, first we have to identify that the player has entered an attack zone. We haven't set up an attack zone, so let's create another area 2D on our B. So I'm going to right click up here, add a child node, area 2D. We can call it projectile attack or area might make a little bit more sense than projectile attack area is what I'll go with. Let's right click, add a collision shape 2D just like every other time, and let's make it a circle shape. So this circle shape, I'll take the radius, expanding up there, and I'm going to make it 100. So it's a pretty big radius for where we will say that we're attacking the player if it happens to be inside of here. So if we click on projectile attack area, and go to node, you can see that there's not a signal for the player existing in there, but there is one for body shape entered and body shape exited. So on entered, we'll set the target player to be the player that just entered and on exit we will remove the target player from the currently referenced target so if there's no target it won't launch a projectile and if there is and other conditions are met then we will launch projectiles after every attack timer is done running so let's connect body shape entered into the b script and also uh, body shape exited into the b script i will take these a little bit up here Guess right around here. And now let's set up the attack target. So this is really simple. We just need to do attack target equals the body. So this is the thing, the kinematic body or the player in this case that entered our attack area and we're registering it as the target to try attacking. Now, uh, when that object leaves, we're just going to say the attack target is equal to null. Now up here on our physics process, which is going to keep running as the game progresses, we want to see in our idle state if we should transition into a attack state. So first we're going to see if the attack target is valid. So if is instance valid, and we'll do attack target here, but also that the attack timer is currently stopped, then we'll do and attack timer is stopped. So the cooldown from the last attack is over. We have a target to attack. So therefore we are going to attack it. So let's do self.current state equals state dot attack. And now let's set the attack direction to be equal to the direction to the attack to be equal to the direction to the attack target. 
So attack direction equals self dot position dot direction to the attack target dot position. And then let's start the timer uh, because we only want this to occur once every one second or however long you set the attack timer to be. So attack timer dot start. Okay, and this needs to be direction two. So this puts us in the attack state. When we're down in the attack state, our attack active animation is going to run thanks to this uh, parameter. So the attack animation charges up the attack and then we have attack animation finished, which is going to launch the projectile towards the player based on that attack direction. And we're going to return to the idle state until our script tells us otherwise. So let's go ahead and hit save and see where we are at. Okay, so the projectile is getting launched. You can see that while it's in the attack state, the B does not move, which I might actually not like. Maybe I do want it to uh, be able to move while it attacks because this just looks a little bit clunky, doesn't it? So let's set up another match state and we'll allow it to do waypoint move delta. So now only in the hit state, it won't be able to move. Let's hit play. Okay, and now our B is attacking while it moves. And we do have to rotate the base projectile so that this is actually pointing towards our player. So if I recall, if we go to the B sting, the correct way to have it face is straight up. So if I remember correctly, uh, taking the B sting and then setting the base rotation to either 270 or negative 90 to make it face to the right is going to be the correct way to make it face when you add in the angle from that projectile launch. Okay, so if we go ahead and hit play, uh, we can see that it's actually not attacking our player. Currently, what it's attacking is the world itself. So if we check our projectile attack area, you can see uh, monitoring is still turned on. Monitorable is still turned on. What we want to use as the mask here is player. Turn off mask as the world and layer as the world. And we're also going to turn off monitorable. So now it should pick up on the right target uh, to attack, which should only be the player. So when the player is not in this area, it's not attacking anything. But we can go in this area for it to attack. And it looks like the direction of the projectile is more accurate. So that looks mostly correct. Except one problem is that it's not actually entering the attack animation currently. So let's go ahead and take a look at our B scene and kind of debug why the animation's not running. If we check on here, you can see that the attack animation is not running. We can check hit for on and that works. So why isn't attack running? So let's check the animated sprite. Let's make sure everything is good here. And it seems to be. So we can go into animation player. And one thing we could do here is just recreate the attack animation that might resolve uh, the bug. So let's go ahead and remove the attack animation. And then let's add in a new one called attack. So once again, resetting up that we're going to take the animated sprite animation on frame zero. We insert the key to set the animation to attack. Then we also need the call method track on the B. So at, I think it's 0 0.4 seconds, we want to right click and insert on attack animation finished. And also we want to make the total duration of the attack 0 0.4 seconds. Snap down here 0 0.05 seconds as well. So now let's go to the animation tree and let's add in the animation one more time. Attack, connect it to the one shot and let's check the one shot. So now it's actually going. I can't exactly explain why that occurred. Now it seems to be working. So we can go ahead and hit play. And let's see if it actually plays the animation. So it does, okay. So it did play the animation, but I guess it didn't return it to any other state. So we've got to make sure this on animation attack finished actually occurs. And the problem here, if we zoom in, is that it's at 0.5 seconds. We want it at 0.4 seconds. So that's important. Let's go ahead and hit play. And we can see now it's going to work. We're going to get those projectiles to launch. And it's going to be kind of tracking the player around for launching those projectiles. So we can still jump to hit the B and note that when we hit the B, that there is definitely a delay before it starts to attack again, since we restart the timer when we hit the B. So now our B is basically working. We just need to create a few clones of it in the game and set waypoints for them to move between. So let's click on the B and maybe I will have him start a little bit up here 
only have him attack the player when he's kind of on that platform. And let's move waypoint 5 and 6 where we want it to be. This part is totally up to you. Just position things where you want them to go between and where you want the starting location to be. And maybe uh, let's duplicate the B again and put a B up here. And uh, maybe for testing purposes, let's actually not give this B any waypoints. So I'm going to reset the waypoints array here to zero. And let's go ahead and hit play and see if that gives us a bug. So it does. So basically, this can only really run if there's actually a waypoint in the array. So, so at this point, we could make a ready function. So func underscore ready. And then we'll just put this down here. So waypoint position equals this instead of making it an on ready var, since this might not always be able to uh, actually be set up. So we'll only set this up if waypoints.size is greater than zero. Greater than zero. There we go. Let's go ahead and hit play and see if that clears up all the errors. So here we have another one, uh, which is that basically if there's no waypoints, there's no waypoint position. And if there's no waypoint position, then we basically can't actually do a waypoint move. So, so we can put a check in here if the waypoints dot size is greater than zero. If it's not, then basically a waypoint move shouldn't do anything. So let's just tab everything over. And if there's no waypoints, we're just going to skip over all of this. Because there may be cases where we actually don't want the enemy to move. So now that seems to basically be resolved. Okay, for some reason, the bee is launching projectiles from a weird position. We can work on that in a minute. But let's go up here and see about this bee. Also launching projectiles from a weird position. But at least it works without the bee actually having a waypoint. So maybe using the position instead of the global position for launch projectile would work a little better. Let's go ahead and hit play and take a look at that. Okay, so now it's launching from the actual B. So I guess that works. And let's see up here, launching from the actual B. We could also um, add a specific point, such as a position 2D, where it's going to launch the projectile from. I actually like that better because since it's a B stinger, it shouldn't come from the center of the B. It should come down here. Let's add that in. Um, so let's dive into the B scene, go into 2D view. Let's add a position 2D, add child node, position 2D. I'm gonna call this launch position. I'm gonna hold alt down and we're gonna drag this down here to the stingers bottom, roughly right about there. Now we can reference that in our script. So we will do on ready var launch position equals dollar sign launch position. And then we'll get the position of this position 2D. And that is where we will create the launched projectile at. So let's go ahead and hit play now. Okay, that didn't quite work. Uh, maybe we need global position for the launched position. Okay, let's hit play. Nope, that causes that issue again. Ah, okay. So we can see that the launch position of this object is not actually, you know, conforming with the world very well right there. So as I found, I accidentally moved the position of the world away from zero, zero. So we could add the position of the world to the global position of the launched projectile, or we could just make sure that the level is always at zero, zero. So if we position it at zero, zero, where it should be, then let's take the level and let's lock it. So now we can't edit its position. We can only edit the children. So if we hit play now, that should solve that issue. And now our stingers are launching from the target position we set down there. And this looks much nicer. So we can kind of progress through our level. Okay, that pig's still kind of a pain. And here we have to be careful because that uh, bee is just going to keep shooting at us. So let's set up some bees in level two as well. So I'm going to search for level two. We're going to open up level two scene. So let's set up a couple bees here. B. Okay, we got the B scene. We could just drop it in. We can position it there and then let's duplicate a couple waypoints. Waypoint five, waypoint six. And let's move them into the position we need them. And then make sure that our B, position him up here with the other enemies, is going to be using 
waypoints of two, and we're going to assign waypoint six and waypoint five. Now we can add, let's just add two extra Bs, why not? Okay, so I'm going to drop in a B right here and a B right there. Let's actually make it kind of difficult. We'll have three Bs and each of these Bs don't parent them under the other bees. Let's see, they should have no waypoints. They're not gonna move. They're just gonna be kind of a pain for us. Now, if you wanna test the current scene rather than the starting scene for the game, you can use this option over here, play scene. On Mac, that's command R. I imagine that is control R on Windows. So we could just start from this scene and skip level one. So let's just come up here. We can see that our bee is gonna try to attack us when we're within the sphere. If you wanted to go a step further, you could use a raycast to see if there is a line of sight between here and the player. And then when that raycast collides with this world, it would stop it from doing the launching. But uh, we're going to just set it up like that. I do also see another bug, which is that uh, we're not moving in the Y. So I'll need to... Okay, and let's just continue. So we're going to do some wall jumping. And now we come over here to our B enemy. Oof. Yeah, that's a little bit of a rough platform, so we have to be kind of careful. Okay, <laughs> we can't double jump off of taking damage, which is working as intended, but we can go a little bit above the enemy. This is actually pretty tricky. Okay, so jump, jump. Okay, got that jump. And there, we can <laughs> beat the game as it is. And then we get to our stage three. So I think I'll take this B over here and maybe get rid of the B3 for the demo of this game, because that is a little bit rough. But let's quickly find out why that B wasn't moving on this level. So I'm going to actually move the player over here, and just so that we can get to that test a little bit faster. I'm going to command R to enter the scene at that area. And let's see, it doesn't look like it's actually running the move method at all. The next thing we can test is the current state. Let's print that out. It should be running the physics process. Okay, so the state, oh, whoops, wrong scene. Command R, and it looks like it's in state zero. So it is in the idle state. I can switch to the attack state, that's two. Let's click on the B. It does have waypoints. It does have a fly speed. So I guess the next thing to check is what's the direction. So let's print the direction here. Okay, well on that scene, they have a direction, but let's see right here, it does not print the direction. Ah, uh, okay, here is the problem. We're only checking for the distance X. We're not checking for the total distance to the waypoints. So maybe what we should be doing instead of here, we can still have this specifically for the pig, but we'll make another method for doing default distance to waypoints because right now the distance for X is zero on that B. There's only up and down. So it makes perfect sense why it's not moving. So let's create a var and we'll call it distance and this will be equal to get distance to get distance to waypoint i think that just needs the waypoint position so maybe we pass the waypoint position in okay and instead of distance x we'll just say distance here of some value okay so we're going to need to write the function here get distance to waypoint i'll put a underscore here for a virtual waypoint position okay so i'm going to pass that and in the angry pig i'm going to paste in the angry pig version so let's write function get underscore get distance to waypoint waypoint position vector two and then we're going to paste this in and we're going to return this since that is the angry pig x only distance now for a standard enemy We'll have a default implementation for it. And how we're going to do it is we're going to just do self.position dot distance to waypoint position. Okay. And we need to return that, of course. Put the underscore there. Okay, and that should clear up the errors. So let's go ahead back to our level two scene going to hit command R and we can run the scene as it is. And our B should be moving because the distance is now checking on both the X and the Y for characters like this. 
But note that um, our pigs are still moving with their own version of the function. Uh, to prove that, let's go to level one and let's actually move the waypoint one above the pig's head and the waypoint two above the pig's head as well. And although the distance is definitely greater than 10 pixels, I'll make that way more than 10 pixels there, the character is not going to move because it's only checking distance on the X axis. So we can see we don't have a moving pig, even though the distance to these waypoints is way up ahead. It doesn't switch between the waypoints. So let's uh, undo those positions. And that should clean up our problems for the B not moving. So let's go back to level two. I'm going to lock this uh, level two so we don't move the position. Make sure the transform is zero, zero. And let's move the player over here. And let's Command R or Control R, and we will run the current scene. So let's just test this one more time. And of course, I'll get rid of that debugging information. So let's just do a quick run through this level. And you can adjust the difficulty of it however you need to. Obviously, if the wall jumping is too tricky, that could be a little much for some people. Okay, we're going to... Man, that's pretty tough. You might actually want to make the platforms a little bigger than one square, at least some of them. Okay, but anyway, everything seems to be working. So just uh, let's go back into the script one last time. Let's just clean up the printing. So I'm going to search for print wherever we have it. And I'm just going to cut it out because we don't need it anymore. You may run into the problem where, especially after you add a second B, uh, that it just doesn't seem to play the animations consistently. So I found that a solution to this is to just recreate the animation player. So I'm going to cut this away and then we add it. So let's right click on the B and add a animation player. We just need to recreate those same animations again. So in here, we're gonna do new animation idle. I'm going to add the track animated sprite animation. And then at frame zero, this needs to play the idle animation. Make sure that loops. Snap set to 0 0.05. And let's add in the other animations. So attack, add track, animated sprite animation. And then this is going to be attack. And I believe uh, this had a 0 0.35 seconds time with 0 0.05 snap. And the idle should be looping. Add the set to 0 0.25. Now let's just go ahead and create the hit animation. So hit, property, animated sprite, animation. Okay, and insert the key here at frame zero. And let's get that hit animation there. So this was 0 0.05 for the snap and 0 0.45 for the animation, I believe. Now we just need to add in those call methods where our B uh, was basically saying hit finished. So on hit finished. Now let's make sure the snaps to 0 0.045. And now we go to attack add track call method b insert key attack animation finished and we can zoom in just make sure this snaps to the correct time okay so now we have hit idle attack so now we just need to take our animation tree and reset up our animations here so right click animation idle goes to the first n then we need attack to go into this first shot. And then for the second one, we have hit. So let's connect that in here. Now we can check active for our animation tree. We can test our animations by checking the on for the one shot and for the second one shot. Now let's go ahead and hit play and see if it actually works in game. So here we have our animation working magically. So I'm guessing what actually happened was just mistiming something by 0 0.05 seconds. Maybe it was the timing of the animation calls. But this seems to fix what we have going on. And let's just jump into level two and just make sure that that's still the case. So I'm going to do a command R on this level and we'll just test it very quickly. OK, so that B is working just fine. And now let's go up here for the last three Bs. I guess I dropped it down to two temporarily. So if that's the kind of issue you ran into, you can, of course, check the settings for your animations as they are. 
by recreating everything could be a slightly more time intensive way to fix your problem. So if you are having any trouble with animations for your bee, your player or the angry pig, I hope that helps solve some of your issues.